vill göra med mycket på Jag har läst den Should I take here though? Yeah, maybe this, maybe yeah, this okay. side. Yeah, so that, yeah. Yes, good morning uh, everyone. Um, we are a bit late, so uh, we should get started. Um, it's an honor to, to chair this uh, first panel of uh, this day. Uh, and I'm going to replace, of course, uh, someone who is not uh, who cannot be replaced, as those of you who know her will be uh, uh, will agree with me. Fernanda Gallo couldn't uh, make the trip, so I'm chairing this first panel, which will be on the quest for peace and freedom and ideas of a liberal Europe in the early 20th century. Our first speaker will be Alessandro Dividus, who is a doctoral researcher at the University of Pisa. He's already actually holding another PhD, if I understood correctly, in political sciences from the University of Genoa. His main areas of research include the history of political thought, political philosophy, epistemology, and ethics, uh, with a special, a special focus on British idealism. And his uh, current project focuses on Sir Henry Jones. Uh, but today he's uh, going to take a different approach, uh, I think, and uh, his uh, pa paper will be on L.T. Hophouse's ID of a European Federation. Alessandro, please. Thank you. Do you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> Hobbes was always a devoted and passionate admirer of the teachings of such philosophers and literary men as John Stuart Mill, Herbert Spencer, August Comte, Joseph Mazzini, T.H. Green, and politicians as Gladstone and Cobden. For them, from them, he borrowed the fundamental ideas that underpin all his thinking, like the philosophy of evolutionism, the conception of our religious humanitarianism, and a deep faith in the principles of liberalism. It was through the teachings and practices of Mill, Cobden, and Gladstone, in particular, that Hobbes learned what he called the heart of liberalism. Differing in much, as he claims, they agreed in one respect. They had the supreme virtue of keeping their minds fresh and open to new ideas. Gladstone, for instance, putting into practice the principles of Cobdenism, fully represents the idea that, according to Hobbes, underlies the action of the liberal man in domestic and foreign policies. As it states, I quote, the Gladstonian principle may be defined by antithesis to that of Machiavelli and that of Bismarck, and to the practice of every foreign office. As that practice proceeds on the principle that reasons of state justify everything, so Gladstone proceeded on the principle that reasons of state justify nothing that is not justified already by human conscience. The statesman is for him a man charged with maintaining not only material interests, but the owner of his country. He is a citizen of the world in that he represents his nation, which is a member of the community of the world. By praising Gladstone politics and criticizing the prevailing Machiavellianism, Hobbes emphasizes an important aspect of the liberalism he advocates, inherited largely by the teachings of Mill, mediated by those of Green. Indeed, the focus on the social aspect of liberalism and the importance of a humanitarian ethic that gives due consideration to the moral conduct of citizens is an element of the new liberalism, of which Mill and Green lay the main theoretical foundations, that aims to combine the claims of liberalism and socialism. Liberalism and socialism, Hobo states, move on converging lines, or, if the expression be preferred, that they represent a complementary and mutually necessary aspects of the social ideal. Liberty does not correspond to individual self-assertion, nor is it opposed to discipline and organization. Solidarity of society, on the other hand, does not imply limitation of individual freedoms, nor hinder the development of human faculties. The conflict stems from a perversion of their principles. Liberalism can be reduced to more commercial competition and mutual hate, degraded to a bare means of sustenance for those who are temperamentally inefficient. Thus, piety and benevolence are repressed, self-interest elevated as a virtue, and merit only measured by the ability to succeed. Socialism, or as Obos calls it, collectivism, may be subject to equally horrifying distortions. All interests of human beings can be centralized and organized as machines, the whole existence directed by experts who decide how men should be virtuous and happy. With a true Aristotelian spirit, Hobbes puts forward a theory of anisiclosis applied to the philosophy of politics. As with forms of government, 
theories of politics are capable of degeneration in exactly the same way and for the same reason. The main misunderstanding lies in the belief that a single idea can govern the world without being mediated by new ideas arising from changing circumstances. Socialism, in Obaus's mind, is principally based on the political victories achieved by liberalism and it serves to complete rather than to destroy the leading liberal ideas. Both these ideologies degenerate when they overturn the classic distinction between means and ends, sacrificing an intrinsic human values on the altar of efficiency. So Harbaugh states in relation to socialism, I quote, be that as it may, as the expert comes to the front and efficiency becomes the watchword of administration, all that was human in socialism vanishes out of it. Its tenderness for the losers in the race, its protests against class tyranny, its revolt against commercial materialism, all the sources of the inspiration under which socialist leaders have faced poverty and prison are gone like a dream. And instead of them, we have the conception of society as a perfect piece of machinery pulled by wires radiating from a single center. And all men and women are either experts or puppets. Humanity, liberty, justice are expunged from the banner and the single word efficiency replaces them." End quote. Socialism, like liberalism, degenerates when it sacrifices the value of humanity in order to achieve, for the means of humanity itself, the same values. Both liberalism and socialism, <coughs> in their own way, aspire to progress while leaving behind their core elements. Socialism arises because the old liberalism left something out that needs to be integrated. It is for this very reason that they must work together to overcome their differences, which means the ideological impediments that set them at odds with each other. The way to recover the common ground and restore a form of progress based on cooperation instead of conflict lies in re-establishing the right relationship between means and hands, namely setting up again that order of morality in full Kantian fashion in which humanity is always regarded as an end in itself. Every constructive social doctri doctrine rests on the conception of human progress, Hobbes claims, and the heart of liberalism is the understanding that progress is not a matter of mechanical contrivance but of the liberation of living spiritual energy. A mechanism, in order to function properly, must provide channels through which this energy can flow unhindered, vivifying the social structure and expanding the life of mind. In such a union, if such a union is to be created, which Obaus calls social liberalism, it must at least fulfill two conditions. On the one hand, it must secure justice and mutual hate. On the other, it must protect the individual's freedom in order to develop, to develop its personality. There is, however, a serious obstacle on the path to the realization of a form of social liberalism. This obstacle, which Hobbes identifies with a form of state theorized by Hegel and his both German and British followers, stopped the way of progress and led to war and instability throughout the world, especially in Europe. Hobbes strongly criticizes Hegel's and his Philosophie des Rechts. As he states, it was the Hegelian conception of the state which was designed to turn the edge of the principle of freedom by identifying freedom with law, of equality by substituting the conception of discipline, of personality itself by merging the individual in the state, of humanity by erecting the state as the supreme and final form of human association. The shadow of Hegelianism permeated the British intellectual and academic environment, becoming a kind of academic orthodoxy. As, as long as it remains at an academic level, its side effects may be restricted, its fees is refuted, and their followers left to dream in their metaphysical castles. But unfortunately, too many politicians are imbued with his teachings and spread them to every corner of domestic and foreign politics. As Obaus claims, I quote, Hegelianism justifies the negation of the individual which the modern practice of government is daily emphasizing. It sets the state above moral criticism, constitutes war a necessary incident in its existence, contempts humanity, and repudiates a federation or league of nations. In short, we see in it a theory admirably suited to the period of militancy and regimentation in which we find ourselves. <coughs> the state assumes in the modern world a position which early age might have given to the church or to the deity himself. Hegelianism, in particular its doctrine of the state, is responsible for the Machiavellian turns in international politics. 
For Hegel, as well as for Bosanquet, the British Hegelian so heavily criticized by Hobbes, the state as a separate individual organization was purposes to protect and preserve moral values within its national borders. The state itself has no moral responsibilities in its relation with other states, given that its individuality is exclusive and its existence independent. States, as Bosanquet understands Hegel's metaphysic, represents differentiation of the single human spirit, and they are characterized by individual missions. Conflicts between states only disappear when each of them provides the conditions of a good life within its territory. This implies, as Hobos argues, that in order to overcome conflicts between states, it is necessary to reform the states internally, since beyond their singularity, there are only external and mechanical relations. If larger units are needed and can be realized, says Bosanquet by following Hegel, they too must fulfill to the conditions of states. Here also, more of the state is needed, and not less. Leagues, alliances, United States, which have not the spirit of true community, carry the germs of disruption within them, and the probability, as Hegel explained, of antagonism without. As every state is characterized by its own individuality generated through a specific will, which is the product of a specific culture, no general will outside the borders of the state can be created, which implies the impossibility of establishing an organized moral world. Indeed, by extending Hegel's theory, Bosanquet claims, thus it seems clear to me that the organization of rights can, be, can only be complete in a community which satisfies the conditions necessary to the possession of a general will. That is to say, a very high degree of common experience, tradition and aspiration. Such communities are not now to be found except in the nation state. It is a state's function and responsibility to promote a sense of patriotism within its own borders, because outside them, the principles of force and mechanism reign. The existence of a mechanism-dominated world outside the state borders is what all those points to as the roof of all the evils that led to the devastation of war. Therefore, in order to achieve a higher degree of international morality, every state must possess a moral personality in the same way as, in, as an individual does. What has paralyzed the development of international rule and morality is, according to Obos, just that doctrine of state absolutism of which the idealistic theory of the state is the most subtle justification. In short, idealism has exaggerated the obligation of citizens to an absolute authority to the point of breaking with the very principle of obligation, which is first and foremost the obligation of man to man. It is therefore imperative to overcome the limit of a common experience, which in Bosanquet's idea corresponds to the limit of a country or nation beyond which the sense of patriotism may hardly venture. There is something we need in humanitarianism, Bosanquet argues, because it wants to set up against patriotism the common good of mankind. But there is not very much that it can set up on this basis. The quality of humanity, as he claims, is rather to be discovered in the life of great civilized nations than in what is common to the life of all men. Bosanquet's statement is the very opposite of Obaus's thinking and of his idea of liberalism. Indeed, for Obaus, the sentiment of nationality arises from human freedom, which is a principle that threatens the boundaries of the nation. The nation itself, in a wider sense, is the result of the notion of freedom, and just like that, it may have a twofold quality. It leads either towards freedom or aggression. The latter, moreover, is in, turn, is in turn a result of freedom itself, which is expressed through the will to conquer without any kind of external or internal limitation. Thus, a bad notion of freedom inevitably leads to a perverse idea of nationality, which, as the material expression of a metaphysical principle, can make those who possess it feel unique and afford the only holders of true freedom. So freedom can destroy itself by going against what is its very founding element, the tolerance of others' freedom. The rise of nationality, Obel's claims, is also a permanent menace to peace and order. A perfect example of the conflicting relationships between order and chaos is strikingly represented by the history of Europe. On the European continent, the concept of nationality is increasingly overlapped with that of state, giving rise to what are considered modern nation-states. As Obos points out, the national consciousness and the state consciousness have come to be one and the same thing. But at the same time, it has created in people, on the one hand, a sense of unity that did not exist before, 
and on the other, it has helped them draw a clear line between themselves and others. In Obaus's opinion, this heightening of national unity was responsible for the decline of the old liberalism and the peace projects of men like Cobden and Bright, which were later revived by Noam and Angel, whose faith in the potential of free trade led them to believe in the possibility of lasting peace. The older internationalism of Obaus Hergis, based on a belief in humanitarian ethics on the one end and in the peaceful tendencies of commerce on the other, is dead. The growth of national consciousness that inspired the struggles for freedom turned to an exclusive principle destroying the cosmopolitan idea that pervaded the minds of European intellectuals. Hobhaus's aim is then to reconcile afresh the feeling of nationality with that of freedom, which implies that freedom should not convert nationality into an exclusive and exclusionary principle. As Hobhaus states, it is out of the struggles of subject nationalities that the immediate occasion of the present war arose. As long as there is a single nationality in Europe left discontented with its position, there will always be a focus of possible disturbance. Hobhaus is aware that at present what is most urgently needed in Europe is the restoration of peace. But he wonders whether it is possible, given these circumstances, to create a sense of higher unity that keeps the bond between peoples alive without compromising the principles of freedom. They, there are, Hobos believes, three ways through which unity can be achieved between people on the European continents. Firstly, through the aggrandizement of a single power and the reduction of, of the rest to a subordinate position. Secondly, through a voluntary union and thus the creation of a united Europe. And lastly, through the development of a federative union. The realization of the first two ideas has already been a tempter of European history. The only way not yet explored is that of creating a kind of European federation. Europe built on federative foundations, according to Hobos, would accustom the component nations to a broader outlook, to the duty of subjecting their egoistic, their egoistic impulses to a common good. A federation is the means to subject democracies to international rules that overcome national borders and to make the values of democracy a common principle beside that of freedom. Applying common rules beyond state borders is equivalent to our advocating the creation of a moral order that, unlike Galen thesis, suggests a supranational union no longer based on the mechanism of more economic cooperation. Through the idea of expanding cooperation on a federative basis, Hobhaus is aiming to shift the democratic principle from a territorial to a vocational level, ensuring thus a more effective transnational cooperation with the purpose of a building a solid foundation for a world community. Thank you. Perfect timing. I was just about to interrupt you, but that worked out. Uh, thanks, uh, Alessandro. Um, our second speaker will be Ulrich uh, Tidau, um, who is a professor of European uh, history at University College uh, London and an associate director of UCL Center for Digital Humanities. Ulrich has specialized in Belgian, Dutch, and German history and published extensively on the Benelux region. But he's also working on European Confederation plans in the early 20th century and I just want to mention his uh, wonderful chapter on Sir Max Wächter and the European Unity League in um, the, the volume Visions and Ideas of Europe uh, in, in the, uh, during the First World War edited by Matthew and Jan Vermeiren. Ulrich, uh, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Florian. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers as well. It's great being here. It's actually my first uh, in-person conference in three years, so it's quite special, and uh, uh, thank you for that. So we've heard a lot about forgotten figures in the history of liberalism and the European idea yesterday, and I'm afraid I would like to add to that today. I uh, actually do need my slides. I forgot about those. Yeah, would you mind if you can I take the, 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 the one we need? more forgotten figures uh, I'm going to introduce today. So I'm going to speak about uh, the next is uh, the humanities project. Yeah, let me move the mic here. Yeah. This is the humanities, right? For the eyes. Yeah. <laughs> if you if you prefer. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, there you go. Right, so so I, um, I'm going to talk about uh, Sir Max Wächter um, that I've published about uh, before. 
his right hand or his fellow um, uh, campaigner for European Federation, Prince Di Cassano, and the first Congress for European Federation, which took place in Rome in May 1909. To recap uh, Wächter's initiative briefly, um, Wächt, um, Wächter, a German born but naturalized British industrialist, the sole representative of Britain in Britain of the Noble Brothers petroleum business in Russia, had from 1906 forward, uh, from 1906 onwards, put his energy and fortune behind a sustained campaign in favor of European Federation as a means to prevent war. Was that because of Russia? No. Okay. Well, I'll just take that. Yeah, okay. Um, his pre-war European Unity League, founded in 1913, um, although ultimately a failure, constituted far more than just another circle of pro-European enthusiasts, but a beginning mass movement with a wide popular basis and significant buy-in from the political classes that had its activities not been curtailed in August 1914, was on its best way to become a significant f uh, force in British uh, politics. While in practice his organization was largely confined to the UK, Wächter was focusing, you can see him here on this painting by Sir Lawrence Alma Tatema, uh, Wächter was focusing on building his organization in one country, the UK, before, as he wrote to Bertha von Suttner in February 1914, intending to expand and establish similar national branches across Europe from 1915 onwards. The European Unity's network, the European Unity League's network was international, originating from the first Congress for European Federation that Wächter had financed and co-organized in Rome in May 1909. Chaired by Prince Di Cassano, a like-minded campaigner for European Unity, the aim of the five-day convention in the Collegio Romano was to discuss questions of international organization and form an advisory body for Wächter's organization. While mentioned in passing in several studies of the European idea, this Congress never seems to have been the subject of any detailed studies, nor is much known about participants' format, topics discussed, resolutions made, and the public impact of it all. On the basis of a systematic review of surviving sources, uh, I'm hoping to redress the situation and reassess its importance as one of the very first collective manifestations of the European movement, as Karl Peck called it in his book on the history of the European idea. Right, the starting point for this piece of research was my interest in Wächter's collaborator and like-minded campaigner for European Federation, Orazio Zunica, Prince di Cassano. His name is mentioned in passing in some of the literature on international organization, but with even less detail than about Wächter. For example, by Warren Kühl, I quote Kühl, Naturally, a school existed which called for European Federation. One of the most vocal spokesmen was the German-born Englishman Sir Max Wächter. He led in founding a uni European Unity League and often labored with the Italian prince Orazio di Cassano Zunica. Karl Peck, in his history of the evolution of the European idea, mentions that uh, the second conference, oh, sorry, uh, that uh, in 1908, Wächter turned to Prince di Cassano of Italy, who was also writing and talking about the need for European Federation and the two men took the lead in organizing the Congress for European Federation. This Congress, which has been called the first of its kind, was held in Rome from the 16th to the 20th of May 1909, with Prince di Cassano presiding and presenting a paper on La Federazione Europea. Right, there are a few others which I leave out here for the purpose uh, of this talk. In any case, the name of Prince di Cassano seemed interesting enough um, as during my previous research on the European Unity League published in one of the books that uh, Matthew showed us yesterday uh, on the slides, I had come across a photograph of Cassano uh, accompanying Wächter on board of his uh, yacht Shamara in Stockholm Harbor, which you can see here on this slide, in which Cassano and Wächter are pointed out to the journal's audience, indicating their importance with these little crosses, as you can see, see here. So it seems justified to start this talk by briefly reconstructing uh, his biography. Right, Orazio Zunica, Prince of Cassano, Duke of Alessano, Duke of Castellina, was born in Naples uh, in 1855 to an ancient family that arrived in Italy around the year 1200. A branch of the House of Zuniga, a noble lineage in the services of the Spanish crown in Europe and the Americas, from which numerous viceroys, uh, governors, diplomats, and military brass were drawn, the Italian branch stood in the service of the Aragonese, who effectively ru ruled Sicily in the t from the time of the 1282 insurrection of the Sicilian Vespers. In the 16th century, three viceroys of the Kingdom of Naples came from the family that in 1617 was also admitted to the Order of Malta. The title of Duke of Casteldilino or Castellina entered the house by marriage in 1702, but the Zunicas preferred the princely title of Cassano, which came from the side of Prince Orazio's mother, 
Donna Luisa ne Riario Sforza. To the couple in, um, uh, on the 8th of February 1855, Horatio, uh, so, so the one I'm talking about, was born as first son and heir of the title. In 1877, he married in Paris uh, Henriette uh, Maria Teresa de Courte, herself a daughter of a Riario Sforza of the Dukes of Caletto. After a distinguished career as a cavalry officer, he devoted his life to internationalist and pacifist causes. In 1872, at the age of 17, he had published an Italian translation of the second book of Virgil's Aeneas, devoted to his mother. A more substantial work, uh, which you can see here on this slide, published in 1904, was called Appunti di Politica Parlamentari, in which he analyzed the Italian constitution and parliamentary practice of his day and argued for a strengthening of civil society institutions in Italy after British models. He appears to have been in Britain frequently and part of European high society, a household name whose attendance at royal receptions, conferences, and other social interactions were frequently reported in the British, on the society pages of the British and international press. He was particularly active in the international conference circuit that had come to dominate pacifist discourse. As Salvatore Cortesi, the Rome correspondent of Associated Press, wrote in the New Yorker Independent in 1909, reporting on the Congress, I quote Cortesi, although descended from one of the most ancient and noble families of Italy, he had expanded a good deal of his activity in journalism and in taking part in congresses and conferences on comparative law, statistics, agriculture, international law, etc. He has been present at 219 of the latter, participating in the discussions and presenting interesting reports, spending nearly 200 days each year traveling, and in 1892 alone, crossing the channel 126 times. He's one of those versatile intelligences which have expanded into almost all directions so that while he has built a house to resist any earthquake shock, he has led peasant strikes to defend their rights against the usury of the proprietors. He began life as a brilliant cavalry officer and is now a peaceologist, a word coined in Paris. The reference to Paris probably referred to a conference of social scientists organized by the Ecole Libre de Sciences Politiques that had taken place in the French capital in 1900 and had similar aims. Cortesi continues, this is all the more remarkable because his family has descended from the cadet branch of the kings of Navarre, uh, which after having defeated the Moors in Spain came to fight in Italy under Charles V. Prince Cassano's idea which dominated throughout the Congress is to accomplish the federation of Europe, not through utopian projects, but by uniting the different nations in all those interests which are common to themselves. Of Cassano's contributions to this conference circuit, only a few notes survive, but they are notable for their diversity and widespread interest for a betterment of society along liberal lines. In 1889, for example, he took part in the International Conference on the Intervention of Public Powers in Emigration and Immigration in Paris. As Nancy Green writes, two things were striking about this conference. First of all, emigration and immigration were linked from its very conceptualization, this being 1889, and second, the possibility of state intervention was postulated from the outset. Cassano also actively took part in the Paris Anti-Slavery Congresses of 1890 and 1900, representing Italy officially. On the first, from what has survived in the records, he, I quote, delivered an admirable discourse on the question of free native labor, in inverted commas, and on the second, he proposed a resolution that the Congress approved the measures taken by the Egyptian government, which had abolished slavery five years before and expressed the desire that similar steps may be taken in other countries of Africa. Cassano also represented Italy as honorary secretary on the first Universal Racist Congress, which was held uh, in July 1911 at the University of London, which you can see here. The Congress, one of the earliest efforts at anti-racism, had been conceived by the German-American ethicist Felix Adler and organized by Gustav Spiller, a leading figure in the ethical movement in Britain. It met for four days at the Imperial Institute in South Kensington and brought leading humanists from all continents together with the African-American scholar W.E.B. Du Bois, perhaps its most brilliant and best remembered participant. With 2,100 <laughs> delegates from 50 countries, it was one of the largest such manifestations ever. In his recollections of the Congress, W.E.B. Du Bois remembers Cassano among the most distinguished members in the audience, next to Israel Zangwill, Prince Peter Kropotkin of Russia, William Philip Schreiner, of uh, South Africa, Jean Finot of France, uh, and others. While the majority of funding came from the United States, Sir Max Wächter actually had been the event's main private donor uh, in Britain. In his contribution to the Racist Congress, Cassano pleaded for an extension of the powers of the court in The Hague from conflicts between sovereign states to include disputes of an internal character, 
in order to ensure justice between different parts of the same nations, colonies, nationalities, uh, etc. I also became involved with the uh, Roman Societa per la Pace in 1906 and the Universal Congress of Peace, but I'm leaving out uh, just this just like as, as a, to kind of show a bit like the, 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 um, the background uh, where it came from. Um, right, um, now, Wächter and Cassano must have met and found common ground on one of these occasions during the internationalist conference circuit at the beginning of the century, and from 1908 at the latest onwards we see them campaigning together. The two seem to have formed an alliance in preparation for the Congress, also including like-minded spirits in France and Belgium under the title uh, Fédération de l'Europe, which you can see here at the bottom of, uh, uh, of the memorandum as a French translation of Wächter's manifesto preserved in the records in the Foreign Office in Q uh, uh, shows, while, while Wächter is the only, um, has the, uh, the, the sole signee of the document, the manifesto asks to direct all inquiries and suggests to three addresses in Paris, Brussels, in Rome, uh, the Rome address being Prince di Cassano's uh, uh, address here. More precisely, the address 440 Corso Umberto I was the address where in 1906 Cassano had set up the Istituto Italiano di Cooperazione Sociale, his foundation of a modern social science laboratory in the eternal city according to Anglo-American models. Part of an international network of social economists interested in the advancement of industry and society, it was the host institution that three years later would organize the Congress of European Federation. It had been modeled closely on the example of the American Institute of Social Services in New York, founded in 1898, and the British Institute of Social Service, founded in a similar mold in 1903. The transatlantic and global context of the host organization of a Congress seeking continental federation in Europe as I hope to be able to demonstrate our particular interest and would play an important role in this story constructed, reconstructed here because important impulses came from uh, the Americas. Now, taking inspiration from the uh, Musée Social in Paris, the American Institute was founded by priest Josiah Strong, best known as the leader of the social gospel movement and the social economist shown here on this slide, William Howe Tolman. Uh, financed by the Scottish-American entrepreneur and pacifist Andrew Carnegie, it aimed at social betterment, which included a large continuum of fields from work progress and safety to the cooperative movement. Tolman, in a 1909 monograph introduced by Carnegie, had even promoted and popularized the term social engineering, uh, the idea that modern employers needed the assistance of specialists, social engineers, in handling the human problems of the planet, just as they needed technical expertise, ordinary engineers, to deal with the problems of dead matter. It is important to note that at the time the term did not have the somewhat loaded connotation it has today, but firmly stood for promoting genuine social and economic uh, progress. During the 1906 World Exhibition in Milan, the first such international spectacle that dedicated an entire pavilion to the theme, two minutes, okay, <laughs> I need to speed up, uh, um, Tolman had basically presented uh, the work of his institute, which is where uh, Cassano uh, got the idea from. Um, and he actually, after the, um, end of the world exhibition, took over the whole exhibit, moved it to Rome, uh, presented it there, and founded, founded his institute, uh, um, his, uh, the Roman Institute, on the basis of that. Now the conference itself that was organized in 1909 was originally planned for 1908. The first preserved announcement that I could trace in, an, um, friend in the French newspaper Messi d'Or from, from the 27th of July 1908 reports on Wächters and Cassano's meeting with the German emperor during the Kiel Regatta week in the late June, and announced that the first Congress of supporters of the United States of Europe would be held in October of that year, with the most important items of the agenda being the creation of a permanent committee of the great powers. The um, conversation with the Kaiser seems to have sparked the plans as William, according to Cassano, wanted him to be known as a great admirer of the Apostles of Peace. Towards the end of the first decade of the 20th century, he indeed seems to have entertained pacifist leanings, for which, uh, um, which can, for example, be seen in his funding of the Interparliamentary Union in 1910, although these leanings were, of course, constantly challenged by bellicist advisors, and uh, William, the spontaneous, as he was known, was also very known for his volatility. Um, when plans had firmed up a month later, a second report about the planned Congress appeared, prominently placed on the title of several French dailies, under the heading uh, Le Congrès de la Fédération uh, Européenne, Premier Racisme. According to this report, an international congress, the aim of which is to strengthen even more 
the bonds which unite the states of Europe will be held in Rome at the end of October. Now again, I'm, I'm cutting a bit short. What happened is, of course, that the uh, Bosnian annexation crisis like uh, toppled all these plans. The conference had to be moved uh, uh, several times, three or four times. I'm, I'm not going into the details. It's quite interesting. In between, Wächter was interviewed in the Contemporary re Review, also by the New York Times at one point. Um, but the plan, so, so the, the invitation and the plan and the, the conference program survived, which you can see here uh, on, the, um, on, uh, on the screen. Uh, Luigi Luzzatti was also like, like kind of an honorary president of the conference. You see the program involves largely uh, three questions that the uh, audience should address. So there was a political section, a judicial section, and an economic section. The guiding questions of each of these sections were A, for the political one, um, within, which, within what limits can we form a political federation between the states of Europe and what influence can it exert on peace? For the economic one, it was how could we reduce the causes of currency crisis and mitigate their effects when they occur? And the third one, the legal section, what are the economic and social matters which require the most urgent unified international legislation? Now, I'm not going into the details of the participants. There were quite illustrious uh, uh, and interesting participants in this uh, conference who also wrote reports that were then discussed and maybe just end with the resolutions that the uh, uh, conference came up with. Sorry, as you can see, I it's need good to... good that you are shortening. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's all crossed out, as you can yeah, see. Yeah. I just, okay. yes, it became less y late yesterday. I had no time of uh, yeah, seeking a printer or stuff like that. So I skipped the negotiations and just come to the resolutions that the Congress adopted and that uh, were worked out in these uh, two panels. The judicial one sadly didn't take part. There were lots of travel restrictions at the time, no pandemic, but of course political uh, uh, disruption. Beta von Suttner was invited, she sent her apologies, very nice letter. Uh, um, Jacques Novikov, uh, who is like, uh, who'd also put forward a plan for European, the Russian, Franco-Russian uh, sociologist, uh, he couldn't attend bis because um, his son got married or something like that. Um, so, so there were lots of disasters, like from the grand plans that, that uh, had to scale it down. It's, it's still the first, as far as I can tell, uh, expression of these thoughts. So the re resolution was very much basically A, in favor of a European political federation. B, uh, 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 it was suggested to create an institution to study the questions of comparative law, because that was seen as, as basic for, for the Euro federation, for the integration of Europe. Uh, third, um, it, it pleaded for creation of a supreme international tribunal. And fourth, uh, for creation of uh, an international union for the protection of workers. Maybe just to really, really come to the end, so, so I'll skip a few. There's a bit of an epilogue to this, which I can't really, which I'm not entirely certain what to make of it. So basically, uh, after the outbreak of war, um, this um, uh, Italian uh, uh, ship was torpedoed in Tunisian waters uh, by German submarine. Uh, um, Prince Di Cassano was on board with his wife. They both were um, rescued by a French uh, 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 naval ship uh, interviewed as well. It was actually shortly after the sinking of the Lusitania, so it had almost uh, led to the entrance of America into the war at the, at the time, uh, but it was a false flag uh, organization. The Austrian government uh, took the blame, and Austria was already at war with Italy, which Germany wasn't. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's just as an ep epilogue. And then the other slightly more concerning, uh, oh, here it is. The, um, the, the, the he got also very involved with um, Tufts' uh, peace initiatives in in, in, in in, um, in, in th um, with Theodore Marburg in, in, in the, the, the founding of the League of Nations in, uh, in America. But then after, after the First World War, there's also a, a report that I've come across that he kind of turned up at, uh, at the first meeting of the first uh, Fascio of Rome, <laughs> so which I, can't really, which I can't really fit into this whole picture uh, at the moment. And then sadly, it went through the press in 1926 that uh, he drowned himself by jumping off the Ponte Milvio in, in, in Rome. Uh, he had just founded uh, an investment bank that went bust, and uh, that's the story of Prince Di Cassano, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave here. Maybe, maybe just to, to give an uh, idea. Please, just sec 10 seconds. Really. 10 seconds <laughs> for the last sentence. <laughs> the point that I'm trying to make, or the larger point that I'm trying to make, and this I also kind of hope to integrate, of course, with the story about Wächter himself, and my, my point is very much and I don't think I'm overstating my, 
who may disagree, or I, I don't know, that uh, if Kudenhofer Kalergi is usually regarded as the father of the European idea uh, with his Pan Europe uh, Manifesto in 1924, my point is that two decades and one world war previously, Sir Max Wächter uh, has reason to claim the title of grandfather of the European idea. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ulrich. You certainly made uh, that argument. Um, we're now, um, um, as yesterday, we will have, um, uh, we'll hear all the papers first and then discuss them uh, afterwards, uh, just to mention that. Our next uh, speaker, the third one, will be Spartako Pupo, who is Associate Professor of History and Political Ideas at the Department of Political and Social Sciences at the University of uh, Calabria. As for his uh, main uh, areas of research, uh, I have to confess I've tried to translate your long Italian CV with the help of Google Translate and things got really, really confusing. So I'll just mention obviously the history of political ideas. And um, uh, if I understood correctly, you are particularly interested in investigating the link between political thought, texts, and cultural context, uh, which is uh, really promising. And with that in mind, we are looking forward uh, to your paper entitled Free Government, Free Trade, and Europe, the Scottish Enlightenment Heritage, Heritage in the European Liberalism of the Early 20th Century. Spartaco. Thank you. I thank the organizers of the conference for this opportunity. And uh, I'm going to read my paper, 20 minutes paper. Uh, the Scottish Enlightenment. Uh, uh, a little bit of okay, okay, you're gonna <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. The Scottish Enlightenment is considered the most important period in the advance of political economy. Uh, it focused on the development of the ideas of self law, freedom, uh, free trade or free commerce, uh, free government, good government, personal interest, and the automatic equilibrium mechanism. Indeed, this intellectual tradition has produced a liberal political and economic order that limits the role of the state. The state essentially has to protect the private property rights of individuals. And as a result, the market economy is inherently stable and individual economic freedom plays a key role in increasing the nation's prosperity. Scottish intellectual of 18th century designed an economic structure based uh, on the system of natural freedom. They argued that the economic system should function by itself and without intervention. Therefore, the Scottish Enlightenment represents a process in which liberal theses dominate. David Hume's contribution to political economy is significant. The first explanation of the idea of automatic balancing in the foreign trade theory of classical liberalism was advanced by Hume. Contrary to the mercantilist view, an, economy for, an economist's foreign trade surplus does not enrich the nation. Rather, it destabilizes the economy by raising the general price level. Adam Smith argued that the wealth of nations and the main source of prosperity lay in labor. The enrichment of a country occurs on the condition that labor and the natural resources are used efficiently. Smith introduced the concept of the division of labor and specialization into economic lexicon, which were also the focus of Adam Ferguson's research. Luigi Naudi always had a preferential relationship with the thought of Smith. He called Smith his friend, and the Scots bust, as Gaetano Martino recalled, he always wanted to have by his side, both in his study at the San Giacomo Estate and in his office as president for the Republic. It also appears that he had then in his library the original first edition of The Wealth of Nations and, seven, and the seven other English language editions. And now this famous controversy with Croce in their correspondence from 1927 to 1943, later collected in the book Liberalism and the Liberalism, was to leave a deep mark in Italy, both on the life of liberalism and on the political, legal, and economic, uh, in the economic lexicon. Liberalism is a neologism unique to the Italian language, corresponding to what is commonly referred to as free trade or laissez faire a type of economic policy that uh, predates the humanistic deepening of the Scottish Enlightenment originally inspired by Hume, which was followed by the very basis of uh, modern liberal thought. Free trade does not define a theory, but only a rule of thumb 
aimed at demanding the reduction of government interference in the private activities of citizens. What will prove to be an original concept in the doctrine of liberalism reflects a systematic thought expressed in three celebrated passages in Smith's Wealth of Nations. The first passage states that the primary motivation of driving economic behavior is self-love as a synonym for individualism. For Smith, self-love is not egotism, but it's part of a complex anthropology that he shares with other Scottish enlighteners. The excesses of love are, on the, ha on the one hand, tempted, tempted by sympathy, another concept Smith shares with Hume, which is a part of uh, that raw tone that is man. On the other hand, these excesses are kept in check by the law and the judiciary. Second passage justifies the superiority of a decentralized economic system. The third passage describes uh, how a complex uh, of uncoordinated motivations and actions transforms into a harmonio harmonious whole that serves the general interest. For Smith, it is not nature or the will of God that performs the miracle of uh, reconciling individual interests with the good of the community or the good of the nation. For in the organization of the economic system, hedonistic individualism is transformed into virtue only through the action of uh, competition. The image of the invisible hand is so striking that it has been almost two and a half centuries since Smith described it. It is uh, still very common. Smith's revolution starts from the, for, from the separation of the old binomial between expediency, that is what is useful, that is what uh, concerns morality, in order to be able to demonstrate that freedom of trade is by far the best tool to increase the well-being of citizens and the state. Ever since the publication of the Wealth of Nations and the f in uh, the theory of moral sentiments, the relations between economy and the morality have been a dogma for all authors of the 20th century liberalism. And it is uh, this concept that Einaudi put forward in his first report as a governor of the Bank of Italy. The incipit of the final considerations which Einaudi read at the Bank of Italy meeting on March 1947 speaks plainly. And the translation from Italian of this and uh, the other passages uh, that follow uh, is mine. In the controversy with Benedetto Croce, uh, the Neapolitan philosopher intended to distinguish the moral aspect of uh, liberalism from uh, the more trivial aspect of commerce and business. Croce was probably influenced by Hume in this. It is no coincidence that it was Croce himself to strongly decide the first 20th century Italian translation of Hume's work. Croce commissioned, commissioned it to the Florentine Giuseppe Prezzolini as the correspondence between the two authors testifies. Croce was so fond of Hume's text that he insisted on doing it with Prezzolini, especially when the latter experienced the, a bad moment and seemed to lose uh, his head. But with a benevolent offer, the Neapolitan succeeds in convincing the Florentine. Uh, finally, Croce decided to publish uh, together the first Hume's inquiry, an inquiry concerning human understanding, and the second inquiry, an inquiry concerning the principles of morals. The volume appeared in 1910 in the La Terza series of modern philosophy classics di directed by Croce and Giovanni Gentile. The considerations gated here by Hume on uh, freedom are the gospel, in my opinion, of liberalism. And now he was very familiar with the works of all the Scottish authors. What he most praised in Smith was the ability to put in communication the facts, especially those historically established with him, his consideration of the moralists so much alive in him. Uh, and now the, uh, more than once drew the attention of uh, Italian scholars to the importance of the work of the Scots. He did it, for example, in 1933 and uh, 1938 essays. In these works, Einaudi dwells on the Italian scholarly, scholars who rightly regarded Hume and Smith as the last Englishman to have given us, uh, I'm quoting, philosophical works that could be called genius. Emerging with insistence in Smith's words, 
uh, is a phrase that appears a central nexus of uh, early 20th century European liberalism, namely free government. It is an ideal political community organized for the realization of the common good, which was recognized and updated in the following <coughs> centuries. Hume had given free government a political meaning as it was closely linked to the emergence of the middle class. Hume's reflection on the link between public and economic policy led him to address the question of modern government reform, whether free or autocratic. Hume deviated from uh, the position of the vulgar Whig by proposing that the French monarchy in Europe, if it was sinking under an oppressive tax system, might be revived by tax reform <coughs> carried out by a wise prince who exercised sufficient uh, discernment to know his, his own and uh, the public interest. The link between and the, uh, equality before the law, what Hume calls true, me, true liberty, is a prerogative of commercial states. Hume st uh, states that progress in arts is rather, uh, is rather favorable to liberty and has a natural tendency to preserve free government. Accordingly, a background condition of the happiness of the citizens of such states is that they be free. The theme of the uh, relationship between commerce and freedom uh, as the crucial point of free government is very common in Scottish Enlightenment political thinkers such as James Stewart, Adam Ferguson, Lord Keynes, John Milland, William Robertson, and others. Uh, Smith traces the history of modern Europe through a skillful uh, interweaving of uh, uh, moral, economic, social, legal, and the political uh, factors. The emergence of what Smith calls independent republics was the result of the evolution of the balance of power between kings, lords, and the uh, bourgeoisie. In this way, the bourgeoisie slowly uh, settled into the assembly of the states general. The idea, uh, the idea of free government became apparent to Smith based on the mediating function of the middle class in society and uh, in the public sphere. Among the authors who at the beginning of the 20th century addressed the problem of free and good government, we find very different thinkers such as Catania, De Ruggiero, Mosca, Ernesto Rossi and Einaudi. Since the middle class has a crucial role to play in maintaining social balance, Einaudi describes good government as a mixed constitution, in the same sense you, uh, Smith used in the uh, Wealth of Nations. Although Einaudi never systematized the issue of good governance in a comprehensive treatise, he seems to refer to Smith whenever he raises the problem of the relationship between the market and the legal political institutions. Referring to the ethos of the middle class, Einaudi wrote in 1933 that it was a great fortune in the pre-war period that the truly representative classes in, of Italy still provided the state with a good number of, the, of men of government. Here, the answer to the misgovernment identif mm, identified in the social division in the discord between faction or in the great economic disparities, all antechambers of tyranny for Einaudi is uh, identified in a good government as a mixed constitution. Smith uh, had understood how in modern European society uh, the development of commerce and the relative expansion of market and uh, consequently the progress uh, in the division of labor increased the possibilities of, of conquest, especially for the middle class, thanks to their work, a position of relative autonomy in the proper sense of uh, independence. The redistribution of, of power that resulted from the spread and the fragmentation of private property was an outcome that Smith called a revolution of the greatest importance to the public happiness. The rise of the middle class to position of power has been read as the insertion of an element of mediation, a reactivation of the older ideal of good government as mixed government. Einaudi shares this axiological horizon with Smith. 
for Einaudi, the market economy will always remain the only instrument capable to ensuring a balance of power in a civil uh, society. Since the isolated individual uh, has never lived except in the idyllic images of a poetic golden age, and that the primitive good man perverted by society was a figment of <coughs> Rousseau's imagination. Here we can see the resemblance of Einaudi's words to those used by Hume in uh, connection with his sharp criticism of the fantasies about existence of a state of nature assimilated to the golden age, which is a mere fiction, in the, I'm quoting Hume, of the political reasoners Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau. The critique of the methodological futility of the contract device that influenced Hume's mate Ferguson, Ramsey, and other contemporary thinkers demonstrates, in my opinion, the theoretical distancing of the Scottish Enlightenment, which removed liberalism from its contractarian premises. The holistic conception of political economy, which goes far beyond the mere market economy to invest the moral sphere, breaks through in the early 1930s with order liberalism, which emerged uh, by a group of scholars developed at the University of Freiburg. Order liberals recommended that the key institutions identified by the Scottish Enlightenment, namely private property, freedom of contract, rule of law, be complemented with an active def defense uh, def of uh, competition by government to counter the influence of political party opportunism, organized the groups and the bureaucratic selfishness. For Vita Aiken, political, two minutes, political uh, order is a free order founded on, uh, uh, on open and competitive markets established by a general political decision which he calls an economic constitution, which is a guidance mechanism for the economic process. Aiken starts his analysis with this consideration. In other words, the state has to create and secure the institutional framework of the free economic order, but must not intervene in the competitive economic process. Some of the most constitutive principles for such policy of order, which included open markets, private property, freedom of association, and uh, accountability, represent institutional pillars forged by Scottish Enlighteners. The Freiburg economists and the lawyers uh, had the close scholarly contact with like-minded intellectual abroad, which are now in Italy, Frank Knight and uh, Ludwig von Mises in the USA, Lionel Robbins in England, and Jacques uh, Roof in France. Another theme of my paper is that uh, if we look at European civilization, the development of commercial and cultural life and uh, how fertility was possible from uh, an economic and cultural point of view thanks to free and good government and a decentralized system, Hume's lesson cannot be ignored because modern uh, uh, European monarchies, particularly France, became civilized for Hume largely because of change in modern innovation based on civil uh, liberty, etc. Hume develops an interesting theory about the dimension of the state on which the problem of freedom depends. Uh, he, he questioned the birth of the arts and the science in asserting that nothing is more favorable to the rise of civilization than the existence of uh, multiple contiguous and independent states linked by economic and political ties. Therefore, the territorial extent corresponds to the level of, of the difficulty for citizens in controlling government abuses. The vision uh, this vision uh, will be taken up by Friedrich Hayek, uh, who will, uh, will say that in larger states there will always be great coercion because there will be more power in the hands of those in power. Hayek said that Hume was his constant companion and sage guide, the real father of liberalism. In the economic condition of interstate federalism in 1939, Hayek presents the need to remove economic barriers between states in order to achieve the goal of establishing a federation. In the final chapter of The Road to Serfdom, Hayek supported the idea of uh, uh, creating supranational government, seeing it as a way of limiting the power of nature, finite, and believing it should be an organized authority after a balance of power. 
He next think liberalism and nationalism are totally incompatible and it is essential to prevent them from being combined. Raymond Aron, uh, who will be asking that the idea of European unity means, uh, recalls how the idea of a great republic based on uh, principles of public law and the balance of power was already present in Hume. It was Hume uh, who admired the principle of the balance of power and criticized the vehemence with the, which his country opposed to its rival at the time, France. Aaron will point out that the mixed system of a community, small states, culture, and the political rivalry was uh, uh, valued by authors like Hume in the Enlightenment because it had ended the ravages of the religious wars. I think I've given enough reason to believe that the Scottish Enlightenment uh, remains the main uh, uh, foundation of 20th century li uh, liberty or freedom. Thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, Spartako. It's good to see that uh, despite a long evening, all of our speakers have uh, lots of energy. <laughs> so we now proceed with Yorgos George uh, Chanakopoulos, um, who, of course, was one of the organizers of our uh, conference last year on modern revolutions and the idea of Europe in Athens. Um, George is holding a PhD in modern history at Queen uh, Mary University of London and currently a lecturer in modern history at the City University of London. His research focuses on the history and politics of Britain and Southeastern Europe since the, the late 20th, uh, 19th century. I'd also like to point out that he is part of a bigger research project on images of Germany in Greece during the Great War, hosted by the University of Athens. And I think his uh, paper today, as well as a paper later in, in another panel, will be out of, the, of this uh, context. So, George, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, thanks and thanks to the organizers for, for a great occasion and, and excellent papers. And uh, prepare for now something completely different uh, that won't be focusing much on, on thinkers, though I would, I'd like to, but a bit on political liberalism. And Greece, and I should say, uh, well, this is what I'll try to do in 15 minutes. And um, this is a project of transition. I'm finishing a book on in British ideas on imperial order and national questions in Southeastern Europe. And I'm starting a new project on the history of interventions in Greece, including what you've just mentioned. So this is a bit of a, uh, a, a first attempt to rethink a bit Greece in the international sphere, think about political liberalism in early 20th century Greece, and hopefully, you know, some questions and ideas out there. So I just want to preface, you know, what this is and where it's going. Uh, I guess a starting point uh, would be if one were to be sitting in the 1890s, reading the Times somewhere, or, or you know, whatever, the Manchester Guardian in Britain or elsewhere, late 1890s, what would Greece be? You know, how would it come into the news and the stories? And it's a story of uh, bankruptcy. Well, you know, famous is you know, a lot of stuff written about, you know, the imposition of financial control in Greece's economics, which is, I think, a broader story with regards to the region, the Ottoman Empire, etc. Uh, it's also a story of war. Greece loses a war with the Ottomans, uh, 1897, and that actually kind of precipitates um, uh, one might say a soul-searching moment in Greece intellectual life, but also a, a, a bigger kind of you know a moment of reflection of where we are. And uh, if it, just to try and put you in time and place, you know, uh, if you were a young British, you know. Uh, liberal who would then become a consequential sort of commentator of foreign affairs and you would even be tempted to go and fight and relieve the kind of early 19th century moment and you know some people did go and fight in 1897 in Greece uh, Ricciotti Garibaldi was there too actually and this is one uh, you know of the products of that moment of late 19th century philhellenism if you will and you know Brailsford, that's what, you know, an example of thinking I'm writing about, I've written about, only foreign help can ameliorate the miserable state of Greece. Uh, now, at the same time, and I've chosen a quote from a Greek intellectual who's actually quite consequential in the period, a professor of uh, uh, law, in, in, in uh, uh, sorry, of history, uh, can the view of the magnificent ruins of the Parthenon in the Greek national consciousness diminish the historical power of Hagia Sophia. 
or Hagia Sophia is Saint Sophia, the, the, you know, the famous temple in Istanbul, the seat of the Byzantine Empire, and that gestures on to show how, before I get there, how um, in Greek political intellectual life, there's a very interesting moment in that period and a bit later when um, ideas about sort of, sort of empires in the East are kind of being discussed and Greece playing a role in there. Uh, uh, the, the other thing I wanted to point out, and I think it's a broader point, mo uh, comment, and I'd like thoughts on this, and thinking about international politics, early 19th century, uh, early 20th century, and, uh, and liberalism. It seems to me that, the, 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 you know, if, if one thinks of those events together, what I put that up there, you know, Russia, failed liberal revolution, or uh, a revolution that produced a parliament, essentially, Iran, uh, the kind of makings of a constitutional, uh, uh, you know, uh, moment there. Turkey, the Ottoman Empire in 1908. What's interesting here, and I picked it up a lot when I read about British sources, there's like a moment of awakenings, apparently, in liberal discourse. Hobhouse, Hobhouse writes about that too, I think. A moment of awakenings. People are thinking about that moment, 1905, 1908, potentially as a moment where illiberal structures, you know, dynastic empires, that's what I mean by liberal structures, um, are being reformed. So there's a promise, there's a sense. And that's interesting because in the British context and in the Greek context in a bit, that's how the transformation or the attempted transformation of the Ottoman Empire is being received and perceived. There's a moment of opening in 1908, 1909 where people think that, well, you know, liberalism in one form or another, freedom, constitutionalism is coming to places that it's not being accustomed to be in. Like, for instance, you know, the Ottoman Empire. I just wanted to throw this out there because I think if we think about international politics early, you know, in the first decade of 1900s, this is a very interesting moment and one can think how one uh, conceptualizes it. Enter the consequential man for Greek politics and liberalism, not so much a thinker, but a political operator. His name is Benizelos. I don't know how many of you are aware of him other than the Greeks in the room. Um, now, how does he describe by the way, he's someone who's based in Crete at the moment. He's, uh, in, in, you know, in 1908. How does he describe what happens in Turkey? Um, the advent of constitutionalism in the Ottoman Empire, he says, would allow the numerous Greeks living in Turkey to fulfill their civilizing mission in a free constitutional regime. So civilizing mission. Um, and this is how the annual report of the British Foreign Office uh, explains the situation in Greece in 1908 and the reaction to, you know, the, trans the constitutional opening in Turkey. In Greece, general enthusiasm prevailed amongst the public and in the press, though less in government circles, and the conviction seemed to prevail that the moment had come for the Hellenic race to show its superiority over the Turkish and Bulgarian elements in Turkey. Uh, this is how the Brits see it, understand it, the political moment in Greece. And this is also the time for the incubation of, you know, projects that uh, are interestingly, pick, they pick up the language of federation in different, in some way, by the way, then that's quite interesting. Well, add to that a certain historical mission for the Greek nation, add to that race, uh, and end empire. So uh, for me, it's quite interesting, you know, to rethink these Greek thinkers, one of them is, is um, Ion Dragoumis, who is uh, interestingly also a consul in Macedonia at the time, a contested region, and think how they uh, understand Hellenism, you know, as, as a force that could potentially have a tangible, uh, you, know, uh, you know, effect in transforming an empire. And for me, what's interesting here, adding on to discussion about liberty federation, is this kind of thinking that, as I said, you know, brings in together different elements. We have race, we have the federal solution in some ways, we have a certain idea of nationalism, and we also have discourses of liberty in here. So it's quite an interesting mix. Um, now, how does the uh, 1908 moment affect the Greek political life? And now I'm going into Greek political liberalism. Uh, uh, the, the moment of renewal, Essentially, to cut the long story short, uh, it's a moment where the army, again, in Greek politics at the time, it has a quite interesting presence, uh, essentially intervenes and tries to uh, create a clean slate in Greek's political life. And essentially, you know, uh, the, the political discourse goes like, 
there is a moment of stasis, there is a moment of dis you know, disintegration in, in Greece's political life, and renewal is being required and needed. And uh, at the same time, just to give you a sense of context, we're talking about a country that is uh, you know, embarking, that actually uh, the, the political life of the country uh, 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 revolves around two contested regions, and there's ongoing struggles, you know, uh, uh, um, in some way or another. One is Crete. By the way, and I think there's a lot of stuff to be said about Crete because it's a small island that actually in the 1890s and 1900s becomes this very interesting weird protectorate where great powers via consuls and admirals essentially divide the island in zones of influence. Uh, you know, so I, I think there's like a lot of stuff to be said about that moment. So that's where Greece is one, the one context is Crete, and that's what brings Venizelos, the man of liberalism. Uh, the other context is Macedonia. Uh, quite a different story, contested, different regional nationalisms, but also ideas about, you know, or, you know intervention from, from great powers, etc. Um, and this is how uh, a person, a lawyer from Crete, who by then has become something like the prime minister of Crete, which is not united with Greece yet, understands what happens in Greece in 1909, the promises of political renewal. He says that the movement that happens in 1909 has the character of a revolution. So it's not quite a militarist movement, there's a revolution going on, and, and actually that movement invites him to become the prime minister. Enter the uh, making of the Greek Liberal Party in the early 19, in the, uh, 1910. And actually it'd be interesting to see, I don't know much about that, but. You know, Anneline Dedin and others write a lot about, you know, these depictions of liberty, the cap, you know, the how, how, you know, symbols create, you know, in when liberal parties, when liberalism becomes a political movement, then you uh, have different symbols. Well, in the Greek case, it's the anchor that kind of symbolizes the liberal moment. And I'm interested to see if someone has to say or wants to say anything about what the anchor, you know, how would that, how would it fit that? So essentially, there's the creation in 1910 of the Greek Liberal Party. The party is headed by the man from Crete, Venizelos. Uh, the verdict is still uh, up in, in, in Greek academic circles, whether this is a force of modernization in Greek politics, the coming of a new bourgeoisie, or just a revamped way of doing politics, like a, a kind of a putting together old party people and then creating something that has just a liberal name on it. What they do in government, and here I'm going to the First World War, I promise I'll reach to that and end, they do initially uh, do, one might say, liberal things. New constitution, though there's a big discussion to what extent you know, the, the constitution is not as radical as some expected. There's a modernization attempt of the political system, regulation of labor conditions, tax reform, new ministry of agriculture, censuses. It reminds me a bit, though it's really not comparable, the kind of liberal moment in, in England, you know, 1906 onwards, you know, as we go to 1910. Uh, and from, from a recent book on Venizelos, this is, a, a, and this is the, the verdict of a scholar who studied the period, uh, he understands that moment as a process of modernizing the state and bringing it closer to Western societies, what Venizelos called the advanced civilized states of Europe. Again, the civilization narrative, right? We are here on a civilizing mission to liberalize Greece, if you will. Um, and another key moment as we get to the First World War, rearmament, modernization of the army with Anglo-French involvement. And that is before the beginning of the First World War and that actually what precipitates uh, you know, the kind of special relationship that the government then in Venezuela has with the forces of the Antand. And Greece at the time also expands, you know, it doubles its territory almost uh, in Macedonia and elsewhere. Um, with the Balkan Wars, uh, one would argue, and I think there's a, there's a hold to this, that the idea of Greece as a kind of British or Antad proxy in the Mediterranean takes shape. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to talk much about the Balkan War context, it's quite complicated, so I'll just brush it aside for now. But what's also interesting is that that allows the man from Crete, the liberal man from Crete, Crete Venizelos, to enter the global or rather the European political states as an enlightened, one might say, liberal, uh, you know, premier with great ideas. That's how he's been perceived by people like Lloyd George, for instance, and others in England and in France. Um, Important 
part of that story as we move on to the First World War, and I have four more minutes, is, um, you know, the coming together, and that's actually a fascinating moment for me, you know, thinking about national questions of people who, A, are scholars, classicists, you know, they do excavations in Greece, among other things, at the same time, cosmopolitan Greek shipping magnets, uh, you know, being based at the city of London, thinking about free trade, etc. But they do congregate, creating societies, and essentially, what is the mission? The mission is to, uh, uh, you know, propagate the expansionism of the Greek state in, you know, contested areas, the creation of some kind of a bigger Greek state. Um, now, the Great War is interesting in Greece with regards to liberty because essentially, you know, if we think about the Great War as the moment where on the one end we have German militarism, on the other end we have, you know, British, French ideas of liberty, etc., Greece finds itself divided existentially on that question. Uh, and also, there is essentially interventions in the country, allied interventions in parts of the country, and the king is being, you know, uh, um, abdicates essentially, de facto, and then there's a new government formed by the Antant forces that's being imposed, a liberal government. So, again, too complicated, that's kind of like how it plays out. And the thing I'd like to bring, ke to bring here is an actually, um, this is how uh, one of uh, the ideologues of the Liberal Party, 1915, a moment of great schism in Greek politics, defines what the liberal sort of mission is. The principle of the Liberal Party, he says, is the principle, the first principle of the orientation and coalition with the Entente. Uh, why? By not allowing with the Entente, we will face the danger to lose the unity of our state. And interestingly, we will suffer great economic loss having to send to cater vast numbers of refugees from Asia Minor. That's paradoxical because that's why it happens <laughs> in 1922. Uh, but that's quite interesting that I find it here in 1915. And most importantly, to my point about what liberalism is in certain parts of Europe, the Liberal Party works for the fulfillment of the race, for a lack of, an, you know, it's like a bad way to, to translate the Greek, but the point is racial discourses here are important for liberalism, right? We shouldn't forget that. Um, and, 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 and the final thing I'd like to say as I kind of come to, to, to this uh, end is there's another interesting moment to m for me when we think about the First World War in Greece, and that's the small states, kind of, you know, little nations, small states, where are we fighting for, et cetera. And what we find there is, you know, Greek liberal, you know, politicians like Venizelos mapping on what they're doing, uh, projecting an image of the country as some kind of land bridge, a small land bridge between east and west. But what's interesting to me is that this is not something unique to Greece. I mean, everyone's doing it at the time. You know, Masaryk is doing that in Czechoslovakia, appealing his country as kind of a beacon of liberal values, I, or his projected country, in between places. So that in between is quite interesting to me. Is in a lot of, you know, states like Greece, like Czechoslovakia and others, you know, the kind of new Europe states of the First World War, uh, the, their li liberal leaders make bridge arguments. And to me, that's quite interesting in if one then wants to think about liberalism and, international and internationalism in some way. So anyway, on that note, I'll just end here with um, <laughs> a very like vague conclusion. And that is actually that if we really think about the place of Greece, as I suggest and take you from like, you know, from the early 1900s to the First World War, then we see three interesting moments. One, uh, three interesting broader points, rather. One would be the coming together of liberalism, nationalism, and race. So you, it, in the language of liberty, we find national fulfillment, racial origins, etc. Second, certain kinds of internationalism that are, you know, varieties of liberal internationalism. And third, empire. And it's, I, you know, you can't no, not see that anyway in some ways. So I'll just end here, and thanks for, for the attention. Matthew, uh, maybe you could uh, try to get hold of the mic we had uh, yesterday. That would be great. Um, we well, we uh, started a bit late, so I'd say we have about 30 minutes uh, for discussion now. That should leave us enough time for for uh, the next coffee break. Um, who has the uh, the strongest voice? Um, maybe Ben Brown. Um, while we wait for the mic, you can go uh, and. was pretty exciting.
Thank you. I have a question for Ulrich. Um, you uh, mentioned this Congress in Rome in 1909. And uh, do you agree that 20 years before your industrialists and noblemen and millionaires met at Rome to discuss European unity, an organization was founded who held a lot of congresses with and shared many of the goals of your community, which was uh, international cooperation, demilitarization, peace, and so on. And this was the second socialist international founded in 1889. And if you want to give the title of honor to <laughs> his grandfather uh, of the European unity to, to Max Wächter, if you, if you would allow to give the title of great grandfather of European unity to such important figures like Victor Adler, August Bebel, Jean Jaurès, Emil van der Felde and others. No, no objection. <laughs> but <laughs> it's was a different quick. intellectual <laughs> strand, of course. <laughs> I think we mm. collect, uh, Alexander. Mm. Oh, sorry. Mm. Uh, great. Those were really excellent, um, very interesting. I just have a few questions. I'll try to be uh, quick. So to Alessandro, um, thank you. That was a very um, thorough and uh, thought-provoking presentation of um, L.T. Hobhouse, a particular relationship between liberals and socialism, and also what that had to do with his vision of Europe. Um, my question is a bit about his criticisms of Hegel, very forceful criticisms of Hegel. I was, uh, uh, sort of a contextual question, I, I had been under the impression that this um, aspect of his criticism of Hegel becomes far more pronounced as tensions with Germany um, rise, and, and especially once the First World War starts. Are his criticisms of, of, of this sort of state-focused uh, uh, version of uh, politics um, um, a post facto justification or um, rationalization of, of British involvement in the First World War, do, do they considerably predate it? Um, because I had always been under the impression that maybe not ca causally, but just that they were related, that the, the, the forcefulness of those criticisms. So it's just a genuine question. Um, for Spartaco, um, I was interested in, so you're making an argument about the influence of the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers on a, vast, a, a wide array of liberals, and some of whom have quite contradictory views on other matters, the ordo liberals versus the neoliberals, Einaudi as a head of state um, in post-war Italy, um, and I wondered if you, you felt that these, these commonalities of sort of over, over, overawed, overwhelmed the, the differences between these figures or just provide a common basis for them. Are there any ways in which they deploy um, these ideas differently? For, and I'm thinking also in terms of Croce um, and, and the discussion that Helena led ye yesterday about the difference between economic and political liberalism. Uh, my understanding is that Croce ha was very, um, as, as, you, as you point out uh, briefly, he had liberi liberismo and liberalismo. And liberismo was this sort of laissez-faire economic uh, um, um, idea that he wanted to distinguish from liberalismo, uh, which was political primarily or moral. Um, so I won wondered if you could talk about that. And for Georgios, um, I, uh, th that was really fascinating, in particular the end, where you talk about the, the commonalities between the new liberals in in uh, in England and the and the, the what, what's taking place in Greece and the fact that Pop Andreou explicitly says being a part of the Entente is liberalism, and I wondered if 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 um, th th it seems to me that that comparison could go back again to England because uh, in studies of new liberalism it's often forgotten that it's the new liberals who end up taking Britain into the s into the First World War, leading it until a coalition uh, in 1916, and then of course Lloyd George falls. Uh, it's you know he's he's viewed as the victor of the first world war, but then falls precisely because he promotes the war that Greece fights against the Turks with disastrous consequences for for him and for the Greeks. So I just wondered if you could push the comparison or the analogy further. Uh, is, is there something actually weirdly central about Greece to the whole project or something of of, of British uh, Gre Greco? liberalism or something I, as it as it kind of founders in, in the first world war yes i will ask two very yes uh, two very short question one to alessandro um, if uh, i have understood uh, um, according to hobhouse uh, socialism and liberalism are two converging ways 
Okay, uh, I will ask if uh, uh, there is uh, an influence uh, of Hobbes' thought on uh, uh, Italian liberalis liberal socialism thought. I refer overall to Calogero that uh, very well knows uh, uh, British idealism. Uh, the second question, question is uh, for Ulrich. Uh, you end your conference that I really appreciate, appreciate very much, uh, saying that uh, uh, Max Vercher should be called the grandfather of Europe. Uh, so I must confess, I never heard my ignorance, I never heard uh, his name. Uh, so I uh, will ask uh, um, what's the influence or the relevance uh, of his thought if he, he has had followers or uh, if he's thought uh, dead with, with him. Thank you very much to all speakers for this very thought-provoking presentations and the conducting threats of these transformative ideas. I would have a question for Alessandro, another one for Ulrich. So for Alessandro, I was really interested in this section when you talk about order and chaos in the, the history of Europe and also the, the, the commitment to the restoration of peace. So my question would be, what about how they, they present, how they uh, talk about the, um, the balance between order and rights, the rights of the individual. So this is a nation of rights, and also the interplay and the feedback loop between order, peace, and rights. And I think this connects also with Georges, because <laughs> your image of the, the anchor, I think it says a lot about order, stability, so I don't know if you want to comment something on that, I would love to know more. And for Ulrich, I was uh, very interested when you were talking about this uh, conference about public policy, emigration, immigration in Paris. I have currently a project on the history of the idea of free movement in Europe and beyond. So I wanted to know uh, if you could tell us more about the presence of these um, rights to free movement within this conference. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, as usual, I have lots of questions. I'll try to be quick. For Alessandro, um, I noticed that you mentioned, you know, morals quite a bit in your in your talk, or at least several several key moments. And I believe that um, I, I look at these new liberals very often as moralists. And so I'm I'm just wondering what his views on religion. Uh, were uh, and whether he was a member of any of these ethical societies or Masonic societies. Um, so that's my question for you. For Ulrich, uh, a very quick question. I'm Swedish and I'm wondering what Max Wechter uh, was doing in Stockholm. He couldn't have gone for the weather. Um, Spar <laughs> for Spartaco, um, uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the context of, uh, I don't know much about Enadi, I'm sorry to admit, um, but uh, I noticed, of course, the dates are interesting, 1918, 1927, 1933. We're talking about fascism, we're talking about um, totalitarianism. So I'm wondering um, how this context would help and explain his interest in Hume, given uh, what you say, his interest or what you put on the board at 1749 of civil government, where, where Hume says that um, you know, an absolute government could work as well as a free government. Um, so, so, you know, what is this? Is, is this a critique of what's going on? Uh, is, is an Audi a critique of um, his, his context? Uh, or or is, it, is, is he thinking that we can, like, work within somehow what's going on by focusing maybe on commerce? And then final, final um, question for Georgios. Um, uh, oh, uh, what is the relationship of what you're talking about this moment with the earlier moment? Was it in 1822 or something when the Greeks were fighting the Ottomans, when their liberals in France were all uh, talking about Benjamin Constant stands up in the National Assembly and says, you know, we have to help our Christian brethren. Um, is there, and, and the liberals were all very sympathetic to Greece then. W w is there a relationship there? Um, I have a question for uh, Spartaco. Um, I really appreciated uh, your paper. 
um, can you say something more about uh, the connection between Croce and Hume? Uh, because I think Croce um, is more interested uh, on other liberal tradition, German tradition, French tradition, and British tradition is for him uh, too much um, uh, empiristic, I think. Can you, can you clarify this uh, connection, please? Uh, thank you. So a question for George, please. Um, and pe perhaps continue, Annabelle. So I want to know more about the memory <coughs> of the independence war in uh, later periods. I think that's, uh, that's really, really relevant. You mentioned this in a sentence, but I think because it's a, it's a narrative that I know, uh, as you know that I know, <laughs> that it goes throughout the 19th century, of course, but I don't know how it appears there. So that's something that I want to really to hear. But thank you, this was a really, really good panel. So another question for Yorgos. It's uh, yeah, about what you said about Greece. Apart from bankruptcy in, in 1893, there was also uh, the unfortunate war that Greece lost against the, against the Ottoman Empire in, in the 1897. And what amazed me is that Greece at the time had no industrial background. The army was not superior to <laughs> their opponents. However, the ideas that they promoted to, towards Europe, as the, uh, like they were the civilized, yeah, uh, revolutionaries, they, they, were, they wanted to liberate with this, uh, with this narrative, offer them uh, this support, I mean, how did they manage to do it from a losing position, clearly? In 20 years, to, to almost double their, uh, their territories, population, and multiply their support, and improve their image worldwide, and mostly elevate their position in the global hierarchy, compared to the Ottoman Empire that was ruling for centuries. Even, even it was a declining empire, but however, an empire. So I would like you to tell us the power of this liberal idea and the impact it had to the world in the early 20th century. So, so I think we have Matthew, uh, or even more questions. Yeah. All right, please uh, keep yourself short. Uh, so thank you. Uh, it's a question for Georgos. Uh, and I'm very interested about this idea of civilization and uh, how it worked uh, for a kind of, uh, so the link between British imperialism, uh, the Greek idea of Athens, uh, Gilbert, Gilbert Murray, his idea of civilization anyway, and how it worked f in a way in order to create this narrative about you know, uh, this mm, legitimization of uh, uh, mm, uh, British imperialism through Athens, uh, through uh, you know, Greece. And uh, also how it worked for this kind of, uh, what you said, lobbying of Greek groups, uh, which were not only Greek, but also uh, British uh, intellectuals, uh, in order to help Greek, in order to, 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 to build their kind of hegemony on the, on the area. So uh, as a conceptual, but also as a political instrument, let's say. Thank you. Uh, thanks, first of all, for, uh, for very, very interesting uh, uh, papers. I actually have a question for each one of you. For Ulrich, uh, does Prince Cassano tell us something about the other? Uh, where are the boundaries of Europe? Does he consider Russia, for example, the Ottoman Empire? Um, and if he does, what are the implications of, of that? Uh, for Spartak, well, another very interesting paper, thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned at one point Lionel Robbins, you also mentioned Ayek. Both of them were members of uh, the Federalist Union's research unit, uh, which of course is an extremely important uh, organization for, for the history of the idea of Europe. Uh, to what an extent were their ideas about federation influenced by Hume's thought about um, liberalism? Uh, I would like to say more about, about that. 
for Georgios, um, you do touch upon very briefly on notions of, of race and Venizelos' notion of, of race in particular. Um, I was wondering what is race for, for Venizelos and how does he relate to his notion of, of nation? I, I'm particularly interested in, in, let's say, the transnational element of race, but in that case, am I right in, in saying that the race and nation coincide in, in Venizelos or is the Hellenic race uh, as such, or, or Greek race, uh, uh, a different um, notion. Uh, finally, for uh, Alessandro, thanks again for, for another very, very fascinating uh, paper. Um, your paper brought to mind uh, the, the works of uh, uh, Carlo Rosselli and his uh, uh, Socialismo Ribellare and his ideas about, about Europe. Now, Carlo Rosselli um, questions the very notion of sovereignty in, in particular, and he tries to offer um, a new understanding of sovereignty based on a, um, a, fra a spatial fragmentation of the notion itself. I'm just wondering whether Hobhaus questions the existing uh, idea of sovereignty, uh, and if he does, uh, what does he uh, suggest? Thank you very much. So uh, each of you has about now two and a half minutes to answer a ton of questions, which is a, t a tough task. Um, so, well, keep it uh, simple. Alessandro, maybe you could go first. How much time do I have? I'm sorry. <laughs> Two and a half minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay, I will try. Uh, so, um, about the first question, so the criticism of Hegel um, and the tension with Germany regarding the war. Uh, so, first of all, I need to state that I disagree with Hobo's interpretation of Hegel and with Hobo's interpretation of British idealism in general, because uh, British idealist disorders are very differentiated between each other. And uh, Hobos tried, not only Hobos, but British philosophy at that time, at the beginning of the 20th century, tried to summarize British idealism like a kind of Hegelianism or German idealism. And yes, but was regarding Hobos' criticism of Hegel, yes. The main reason was uh, the attack, the critic against Hegelianism in all of his kind of expressions, uh, metaphysics, philosophy, uh, theory of knowledge, politics, state, everything, because Hegel was the worst, uh, the, the, the worst man of the time uh, under every aspect, and so that's the reason why. And then, absolutely, yes, about the war, the war between Germany and uh, this kind of Bismarck policies. Mm. Uh, regarding Hobo's influence in Italian social liberals, uh, I never heard about any connection between Hobo's and Italian liberals. So maybe that could be some connection, cause, but it was more about British idealists, not Hobo's himself. Uh, I can tell you so the name of Carlingwood, of course, but about hobos, I don't, I didn't find any trace about this kind of relation or influence of his fourth. Mm, about the third question, order and chaos, order rights, peace. Well, British idealists, hobos as well, and many authors in the late Victorian era, uh, understood order not only as a order under the law, but order uh, understood as a moral order, not only uh, forced by the rule of law, but forced by the will of citizens. And there is a strength connection between order, rights, peace, but of course, uh, Obos himself does not try to separate this kind of notions. He tried to collect them together and so as it did between liberalism and socialism, he tried to find a key notion to keep them together and making them work in the right way. So I, I hope just uh, uh, going to the fourth question, relations to ethical society. This is an interesting question because um, there is a connection between Americans 
Medical Society and uh, Britain's Medical Society in the figure of Felix Hadler. Because uh, Felix Hadler came to visit England, uh, I can't remember the year, but it was uh, the last 20, 30 years of the Victorian era. And um, he inspired many British idealists like Marriott, Bozanke, and uh, I can't remember the others, but he inspired them to found uh, the London Ethical Society. Of course, there were other societies in England, these uh, secret societies, so, uh, like Winton Angemo Society, Old, Ox uh, Old Oxford Mortality Club. And but yes, of course, uh, there is uh, a link between Americans, Britain's ethical society. They influence each other, especially by the figure of Hadler. And about Carlo Rosselli and Socialismo Liberale, yes, I don't know much about Rosselli, honestly. And. Um, Yes, hope I was is interested in the meaning of sovereignty, of course. But um, not much on the political practical side, but more on the moral and philosophical aspect of the meaning of sovereignty. And uh, yes, of course, he, see he understands sovereignty sometimes as a limit and sometimes as something necessary to making people developing their character with the aim of a future cosmopolitanism or peaceful international relation. So I hope I answered all the questions. Thank you. Uh, right, thank you. Um, so first on uh, Bernd's point, I have no objections, of course, but the um, socialist internationalism is, of course, not specifically European, so it's a slightly different strand of sorts, so, but, but, uh, but I agree there are big overlaps, of course, between the two. There has been quite a bit of competition between different types of internationalism, like the people who concentrated on or, um, organizing Europe as a political unit, and those like who were campaigning for for League of Nations, wi which is like what won out uh, during the world first uh, World War. But the so I meant the point that I was making about Wächter was very much meant about the specific European uh, uh, point of view. And of course, there are predecessors to him as well. This is especially in the 20th century. Uh, you, you you can look back at. Um, uh, John Robert Seeley, for example, in 1871, had already published a manifest on, on, on the Euro United States of Europe. Victor Hugo, of course, about whom we have uh, heard yesterday. Uh, Giuseppe Mancini, Jeremy Bentham has written about that. Uh, Eternal Peace, William Penn in the 17th century. So there's a long intellectual tradition uh, to that. Um, about the influence and relevance of Echter, of course, this is a footnote of history. The organization didn't lead anywhere directly. Indirectly, it inspired quite a lot of similar and more durable or slightly more successful organizations in the interwar period. Uh, there is, for or even during World War I, in the neutral countries like Nico van Zuchtelen's um, Europese Staatenbund in, in, in the Netherlands, or Emil Meyrisch, the uh, Luxembourgian intellectuals, uh, European circle uh, um, of industrialists in, in the interwar period, uh, who were like Wächter, who were specifically referring to his organization, and were like Wächter looking at organizing Europe, a united Europe, on economic uh, grounds, mostly. Uh, I'm also quite fond of, uh, um, uh, um, uh, you know, I forgot the name of the named lecturer, but Robert Cecil, like one of the uh, founding fathers of the uh, League of Nations, like um, in the 1920s, he gave one of the named lectures in Oxford, in which he specifically refers to the particularly interesting proposal that came before the war by Max Wächter, Although I found all this, like, while he was undersecretary in, in the foreign office, he was dismissing it in quite rude tones. So, so there's certainly a shift in thinking going on uh, during uh, World War I in the inter intermediate uh, aftermath. So it's, um, it's an important precedent that was set uh, uh, rather than a direct institutional link for the, for the, uh, for the relevance. Um, on the free movement uh, question, uh, Christina, um, free movement, uh, I don't know much more, so this was basically, uh, it, it's a bit of a 
puzzle piece as well because uh, the, there are no really big works that these people have uh, left. They were very practical organizers of, the, of, this, of this movement. Uh, Wächter himself, like his, his first manifesto, essentially consisted only of two ideas. One was to pool foreign and military policy of the European states in one hand, probably uh, um, a congress of the big powers of Europe, and the second one was to introduce uh, free trade, like, uh, like a, cu a customs union, basically. Um, and that was it, so not more. Just these two uh, cornerstones with the intention, with the deliberate intention of to re refrain from everything else, we would probably call it a confederation of European states rather than a proper federation, with the intention like if that could be pulled off, if that could be brought about, the rest would follow automatically as in disarmament, uh, etc. So, so there's not much talk about free movement. On the contrary, they're, they're emphasizing th that uh, the European states should remain independent in their domestic and internal affairs as much as possible. Uh, so uh, just... Uh, uh, not sure it answers your question, but this is all I've got. Um, on on uh, Helena's question on, on Stockholm, so Stockholm, uh, so, so Wächter was actually using his yard uh, to uh, travel around the shores of Europe and visit uh, the crowned heads of state in every country. So he visited uh, the King of Sweden there. Um, he spent lots of time in Scandinavia. So uh, um, one one of the, there's a nice travel account. Uh, by an Irish actress, Constance Mallison, who later would become, uh, um, uh, she, she's, she's a pacifist in her own right. She, she organized the, together with uh, Bertrand Russell, the um, conscientious objector movement in, in, in World War I in Britain. Uh, but she's writing about, I, th I, th I think they called the Swedish kings, like a decent lot of royalties. My previously they had been in Kiel, in Kiel where they met William the Spontaneous, like William II. The, the, uh, um, and they quite often met, so, so for example, there's also an account of in, in some Norwegian fjord where William II was donating uh, a statue of Fridtjof to the Norwegian people because uh, William uh, the Kaiser also uh, li liked yachting in, 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 in northern shores, <laughs> as it were. Interesting, so, so, so this is basically also the the means by which Wächter um, got access to, 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 uh, to the crowned heads of state, it's, it's yachting. So, so the deputy director of the European Unity League, for example, was Albert I of Monaco, who always also uh, li li liked to do this thing. I think he even kind of engaged in oce oceani oceanographic research of, of Spitsbergen, Svalbard, and, 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 and this type of thing, uh, Stockholm. Um, he's also visited Venizelos in, in Crete, by the way, so, so there's also an account by uh, the Austrian journalist uh, Sigmund Münz, who writes about this journey. Uh, along the Adriatic and uh, um, uh, Black Sea coasts uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, which is uh, interesting. And then Ma uh, Matthew's uh, question um, on um, Kasanos on the boundaries uh, uh, of um, Europe and its implications, Russia and others. Well, there was and uh, that was one of the reasons why the Congress in Rome had to be postponed so many times. That in 1908 there had been a huge earthquake in southern Italy, in Sicily, in Calabria, with um, 20,000, I believe, uh, victims at least. And uh, um, Russian and British uh, naval ships that happened to be in the vicinity were kind of helping a lot with the relief efforts. So this was seen as an encouraging sign for, for European cooperation, so which then, of course, included uh, Russia. Uh, about Britain, <laughs> like, like, like uh, Kudenhofer Kalergi said, Russia and Britain are the two main obstacles or the main two main problems for European unification. Wächter himself, he actually came from a, quite a British imperialist uh, context. So he was a vice president of the um, um, uh, British Empire League, which, uh, so there was lots of thought about the reorganization of the British Empire along federalist lines in order to preserve it for eternity. And so what happened is, you can see like how, how, um, how, um, how ideas from one context were transplanted from the imperial context to the even more pressing question in Europe. I, th I think Michael Burgess ha has called this like the, the, the triad of British imperial thinking. You've got Ireland on the one hand, uh, free um, 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 uh, home rule in, in Ireland, <laughs> you've got the em federal, federal, federal reorganization uh, of the empire, and you've got federal designs on, on, uh, uh, on Europe. Uh, at one point I came across um, um, a quote by Wächter where he said, well, the federation of the empire needs to precede the federation of Europe, of which it will f 
of which, it will, of which it will form part, which is a bit going round in circles, so there was an unresolved conflict between the overlap of the two. I hope I haven't forgotten anything, um, but I've talked too long, so I hand over to uh, Roger. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, this is a, a very big question, so I try to answer in collecting uh, uh, answer and uh, I want to say that I trace the highlights uh, of the uh, influence or the legacy of the uh, uh, Scottish Enlightenment uh, uh, on the um, uh, first uh, uh, European liberalism, skipping some important elements uh, so, uh, such as uh, the difference uh, between uh, liberalism and the new liberalism. Uh, but uh, I um, speak of the difference between uh, uh, liberalism and uh, uh, liberalism in, uh, in my paper. I see the um, legacy of uh, uh, the Scottish Enlightenment, um, particularly in terms of uh, uh, conceptualization uh, or new conceptualization on the, it on the intellectual movement uh, uh, of liberalism uh, or uh, the in, in on the um, thinking of the most influential authors of uh, uh, European liberalism. And this author, Einaudi, first of all, uh, advocates an idea of Europe that transcended the uh, 20th century nationalism. Uh, I showed that the Scottish Enlightenment inspired uh, the affirmation of political liberalism. Uh, there are not, in my opinion, connection between uh, Hume, po Hume's political thinking uh, and uh, the context, uh, cultural, political context of uh, totalitarianism uh, uh, in the first half uh, of uh, uh, European uh, political history. Um, Perhaps there is a connection between uh, the thesis of uh, Hume uh, as uh, anti-contractarianism uh, and uh, political realism that influenced, but uh, indirectly influenced some uh, uh, contextual uh, uh, um, frameworks uh, of totalitarianism because Hume says against uh, the political uh, reason as, uh, as Locke, the, uh, the father of liberalism, uh, classic modern liberalism, that uh, the power and state origins not, by, not from uh, the contract, uh, but from war uh, and uh, from force. There are uh, mm, many connections between uh, Hume and uh, uh, Einaudi, but Einaudi is a critic of a totalitarianism, um, of a totalitarian state. But at the beginning of a fascism experience, Einaudi speaks of the necessity of uh, a authoritarian government against uh, the egalitarian risk. So, um, but uh, my paper is a, a work in progress, so I want to uh, analyze in depth these, uh, these uh, issues. Croce, uh, uh, Croce's interest for Hume, uh, I think, is uh, uh, only moral. Uh, more, um, Croce is interested uh, only to the moral basis of uh, economic behavior of uh, uh, individuals in uh, uh, economical political uh, uh, life, but uh, his interest is for Germany uh, liberalism. Uh, uh, Croce have I think that uh, Croce uh, has uh, uh, other uh, sources of uh, his uh, thinking. But uh, the fact that he want to commission the translation of Hume is very important for this. Uh, um, a connection between moral and uh, uh, economic uh, spheres of, uh, of uh, liberalism. Um, federalism, uh, Hume was of course not referring uh, to the concept of uh, a supranational entity as uh, we understand the European Union uh, 
uh, in the 20th century, but he spoke of more or less large states. Uh, um, this uh, seems uh, necessary uh, to quote, in my opinion, to quote Hume uh, uh, for the benefits of a, a, the vision, a global vision in, in uh, its complexity uh, from a liberal point of view. Because according to Hume, um, Europe's strength, uh, uh, I'm quoting, uh, culturally and uh, economically lies precisely in its fragmentation. Uh, just as ancient Greece's uh, fragmentation made uh, it uh, a beacon of the civilization of the West, so uh, decentralization in federalist key uh, and the competition in economical key uh, uh, have uh, accompanying the European civilization, the European uh, history, and uh, we, will, uh, we will not find a way by grow, uh, or to grow by uh, smoothing out our differences in this, uh, uh, in this uh, type of, uh, um, of um, reasoning. Uh, we can uh, trace the connection between uh, uh, Hume's legacy uh, in uh, European federalism uh, of the 20th century. Thank you. Thanks. Just realized it's me and then your coffee break, right? So I'll just start from the 19th century. <laughs> no, I'll be very quick. I mean, that's a fair point. You know, when one thinks about these dynamics, then, you know, the question obviously comes in. And the 19th century, you know, the Greek question is in the beginnings of the age of questions to quote holy cases like very interesting books so uh, what remains you know as you know more than me the 19th century scholars here uh, you know it's it's mobilizes anti-abolitionists right so it's that particular strand of freedom thinking but also it's the kind of moral christian crusade aspect of it and these come together so i would argue in a snapshot as we move on to the other century you get a wider frame, you get Balkans coming in the story, uh, uh, you know, and the story and the framing of, you know, the Christian crusade, you know, continues on. And it gets really messy and complicated in the Balkans because you have people who write about freedom, national freedom, and then they kind of paper over increasingly diverse places with centuries of coexistence between Muslims and others. And also what comes in the late 19th century as we move on to the 20th century is the language of race that makes it different, even more complicated. And that takes us to the civilization in the uh, you know, 1900s. Uh, the memories of Greece, classicism. Well, to me what's interesting is that at that moment, you don't just only have classicists, you have archeologists who are actually embedded, uh, their practice is about racial questions as well. They're discovering, you know, uh, remains of civilizations and races. So put that in the mix, add the classicist discourse of what ancient Greece is, and then also add the civilizational discourses that political leaders, intellectuals in Greece have about the mission of the state, etc. And the state being a beacon of liberal values or whatever. So that creates a very, I'd say, complicated mix that one needs to, to untangle. And, that and Greece is not alone here. There's a Balkan context that's quite interesting in that sense. But in a nutshell, the frame of you know, the um, fighting for Christianity in the fridges of Europe you know, is, is a continuous. And the final point about legacies is, you know, I th think Mazar reminded me once, and he's right, that if you think about or read Leonard Wolf's uh, uh, stuff during the First World War about the national organization, well, Wolf has Greece in the 19th century as kind of a model of international, you know, how you break out of an empire, what kind of structures you create, et cetera. Uh, uh, very quickly, just two, two more points. Uh, to Alexander's point, indeed, that's a paper to be written. I just realized when I put this together, actually, that it is a very interesting story one can say comparatively about Greek and, uh, and, and uh, English liberalism, political liberalism, along the lines that you suggest. And the timeline is interesting, 1922 is, the end of the Greek expansionist project, one might argue is also the end of this kind of frame of thinking about the Greek question, but it's also, politically speaking, the end of a liberal government that's being brought by, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the kind of Greek-Turkish moment. So, yes, I mean, it's just 
it's a paper to be written there. Uh, uh, quickly, some more difficult questions. Uh, yeah, race and nation, yes and no. In some thinkers that you have, uh, in others, they tend to think of potentially the Hellenic race as something much bigger that somehow the nation would be a political component. So it, it can be messy at times, depending on who you read and what they're saying. Um, the, uh, the the point about so and, and and again you know it's a very interesting question in terms of international history how you you transition from a moment of humiliation and bankruptcy and where things are stagnant etc. And within a decade the the script changes and that it becomes a nation with a civilizing mission and an expansionist project on on the way. That's why it's quite interesting to me that decade especially. Uh, on the, the final point about order and chaos, and I think that may come up later as well, it's quite interesting to me, it's, you know, I mean, liberal internationalist varieties are really obsessed with order, aren't they? You know, they want to create order. You know, if you think about IR discussions during the First World War, Hope House is part of them as well. It's uh, uh, how to create against anarchy, creating a sense of order. It seems to be like a liberal thing to do, to figure out the anchors whereby you just create order and you avoid chaos. Uh, this is for me, it's just an interesting question. I can't really speak to it much. Well, thanks. Yeah, thanks uh, to all of you and especially to our speakers for a really lively uh, first panel of, uh, of the day. I'm a bit concerned with our schedule, but I'd say um, we uh, everyone grabs a quick coffee and we meet again in 10 minutes and um, proceed with the next um, panel. So thanks. <laughs>
everyone. Um, welcome to this sec second session today. I'm Cathy Carmichael from University of East Anglia. Um, and this panel, to the second session is on, on Europe from the margins, question mark, rethinking liberal Europe. Um, we'll just have the three papers today because our colleague from Pamplona, uh, Carl Antonius Lemke Duque, has, a, has um, very kindly agreed to give his presentation this afternoon. So our first speaker today is Erkiat Kayo from the University of Pavia. Um, and he's going to be talking about notions of Europe and freedom from the Albanian national movement's um, discourse, um, 1878 to 1914. And you've also written about Rilindia and national movements in Albania, and you're currently um, preparing for your doctorate at Pavia. Thank you very much, Eke. Thank you for having me here and for such a kind presentation, though. Uh, okay. As the wind of change was tearing down an iron curtain in the late 80s, in Albania too, a movement demanding political change emerged. The movement was head spearheaded by the students of Tirana University under the chance we want to be like all Europe and freedom and democracy, bringing to an end an almost half a century long dictatorship. Indeed, both Europe and freedom constitute key words and are neither recent nor original in Albanian political vocabulary, but quite the opposite. They are constant and were introduced by Elindia during the long 19th century. The Russo-Turkish War of 1877-1878 and the Treaty of Saint Stefan that followed constitute a turning point for Europe in general and Albanians in particular. For Europe, because it brought to an end the principle of the inviolability of the, of the Ottoman territory that was in place since the admission of Istanbul in the concert of Europe in the aftermath of the Crimean War, setting in motion a number of events that led eventually Europe in a bloody civil war by 1914. For Albanians, because on the one hand it showed to them how vulnerable they were to the Geographic, uh, geopolitical transformations that were taking place in and around them. Uh, as the political map of Europe was being redrawn, bringing to partition to their homeland, and on the other hand, the possibility of an independent political life was now that their neighbors obtained independence, a possible and tangible reality. And those nationalism and ideology that calls upon people to identify the interests of their national group and to support the creation of a nation state, to support those interests, came to dominate and transform the being political vocabulary forever. Uh, however, uh, we must keep in mind that demands for autonomy or independence gain credibility and strength only when third parties such as great powers and international organizations validate them. As a consequence, the key element, as a key, a key element for, 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 uh, for the birth of a new state is the question of legitimacy. Legitimacy has a double mission. On the one hand, the convincing of outsiders for the right mm -hmm. of nationalist cause, and on the other, the making of a particular state legitimating the rights of the people it controls. Therefore, as the Berlin, uh, the capital of the newly established Germanic, uh, German Reich was preparing to host the homonym, homonym Congress with the aim of restoring the balance of power in Europe, Albanians tried to seize the opportunity to reverse the partition of their homeland. For this purpose, at first, a circle of intellectuals, politicians, and bureaucrats established the Committee of Istanbul under the chairmanship of, uh, of Abdul Frashri. The former deputy of Ioannina during the first constitutional era, which gave birth to the League of Presidents by 1878, uh, made the move and approached London. They sent a memorandum to London to, to the British Prime Minister, to Lord, to Lord Bickelfeld, or Benjamin Disraeli. The memorandum, although only 90 pages long, mentioned Europe 22 times. In the introduction, they expressed their hopes that the great powers of Europe would find a reasonable and legitimate solution for the Eastern question, which included the Albanian question too. Then they denounced the Turkish rights of their country, while they stressed the fact that they constitute a nation, appealing to the principle of nationality. Then they herald the wafting of a great danger over Europe's head, that is the possibility of a replacement of the sublime port by a more terrible regime, the Tsars. To the Europeans, this was an undesired worst case scenario. And for this reason, London had already taken the decision to oppose by force of arms if St. Petersburg attempted the occupation of Constantinople as early as 1829. As a matter of fact, 
Greece owes her independence to a larger strategy of preventing Russian presence in the Mediterranean, or in Sir Edmund Lyon's words, Greece could either be English or Russian, and since she could not be Russian, she had to be Gre <laughs> English, right? For this very reason, the, the, you, the uh, London marched against Russia in the Crimean War in aid of the Sultan, and even at the first sight, unrelated events such as the Italian unification was made possible because British policymakers <laughs> believed that Austrians. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> at first, unrelated events such as the Italian unification was made possible because British policymakers believed that Austria would be stronger without the complication presented by occupation of Italian territory. In this geopolitical equation, therefore, the Albanians offered themselves as a, as a solution to the problem. They argued that it, it was not a mere question of justice to, uh, to, to create, a, to establish an independent Albania, but it was a geopolitical necessity to create an impregnable cordon to check the Slavic invasion towards the Adriatic. They estimated that without a free and independent state, Albanian state, Europe would find itself in the same situation as Vienna did in the 16th century, when the Turks were marching toward the walls of Vienna. Uh, and they say, that of, yes, of course, the, the, the enemy is another one, uh, brings another name, but the, the, the means to carry it are exactly the same. Those, they were offering themselves and their country as an outpost or the first line of defense, as they called it, of the Western civilization or European civilization. They use both words against the Oriental foe. The Congress dismissed the Albania request, though Bismarck borrowing an argument used by his Austrian colleague, Metternich, a couple of decades earlier, toward Italy, argued that there was no such a thing as an Albanian nation, dismissing Albania as a mere geographic notion. Compare me the session of Albanian inhabited territories. In this context, the nationalists argue that Europe has for the Bulgarians elected a principality, has subjected Bosnia and Herzegovina to the power of Austria, while has granted independence to both Serbia and Montenegro. And they argued that now that they have, have not, and I'm calling, have given us absolutely nothing, we have to claim a state of our own independently if we got a support or not from the great powers. Uh, the, uh, the most interesting thing is that uh, a comment the US ambassador to Vienna made while he was talking to, to the Department of State, while he was infor informing his boss back in Washington, he said to him that being instead of being instead of relying to the like the traditional nationalities of, on European support, we fight like Europe and Turkey. Estimating that they will challenge the sympathies, if not the open friendship of the liberal world. Indeed, this was the case, as, as uh, Great Britain presented a plan for independent Albania, but was refused by both Berlin and Vienna. The powers moved to enforce the decision of the Congress, setting the Albanian coast under blockade while the Ottomans were suppressed in the League of Prison. Liberals all over Europe denounced these acts from the British House of Lords to the Italian Parliament and from there to the squares of France. Uh, however, there was no effect, as by 1881 the Albanians were defeated, parts of their territory ceded, uh, while their leadership was arrested, imprisoned, exiled, or worse. The defeat gave a blow to Eri Lindie, which in turn makes, ma made Albanian nationalists to change their strategy and uh, adopt a binary approach. The first was aimed towards an internal audience, as Albanian society was characterized by multigraphia and high numbers of illiteracy, they began to organize a network of schools, uh, in order to spread literacy. Uh, the second level was aimed towards an external audience by announcing systematically the legitimacy of the, Utom of the Ottoman Empire in order to <coughs> win over the support of at least one of Europe's great powers. The Eastern Romanian, Romanian crisis of 1884 and its annexation by Bulgaria presented such an opportunity as Albanians undertook a transnational campaign on the European <coughs> press to ask for freedom. They argued that the Soviet port has deceived Europe and since they oppress and destroy every idea of order and safety, the Ottoman government is no longer legitimate in Albania, its continuance is against reason and law. They argue that they must go from our country and that Albania should go there herself. Uh, and, uh, the, the next step was when the, in the successive year, the Ottomans uh, passed uh, very strict laws regarding uh, censorship. 
uh, in order to contain centrifugal movements. Uh, when they did, when Rubin transferred the society for the publishing of Rubin writings from uh, the from Istanbul to Bucharest in Romania, and as a consequence, a new dynam dynamic was created. From this moment, they were free to publish uncensored anti-Turkish material. And maybe the most important publication was that of uh, Frashi Brothers, History of Skanderbeg, Historia Skanderbeg, where, uh, which according to Robert Elsie was the most popular book of its time among Albanians. Naim Frashri uh, throughout his work constructed to the, to the imagination of his reader a glorious national past where the nation was independent in the possession of a European kingdom, suggesting that they were once part of Europe. At the same time, he stresses the non-European provenience of the invader while pays special attention to the struggle against the Oriental Turk, representing it as a battle between barbarity and civilization where the Albanians and their country constitute the sword and shield of Europe, reproducing this way an anti murale myth that goes strong to this day. <laughs> Another member of the Frasheri family, because nationalism is a, fa a family issue, apparently, uh, Sami, or Shemshedin as is known in Turkey, published the, uh, the turn of the century, the political manifesto of real India, Albania, what it was, what it is, and what will become of it. The manifesto was widely circulated and gained popularity as it was translated to another European language, such as French, Italian, and Greek, promoting the idea that the end of the Ottoman Empire was closed, and the Albanians had to make a move to establish a nation state of their own. Uh, uh, the youngest of the Frashi brothers drew, drew arguments from the Eurocentric discourse, and uh, he, was, he was arguing uh, that Albanians are the oldest people of Europe, and therefore they have more rights to live in Europe than any others. He was uh, very much worried because every time uh, one of the Balkan countries was expanding their territory and gaining new territories, they were doing what we they call ethnic cleansing, and they were very much worried that, like, because they are per perceived as Muslims, that maybe that was their turn next. Uh, so they developed this uh, line of arguments about autochthony and so on and so forth. Uh, in the meantime, the Serbian court had increased the misery under undermined efforts of Albanian nationalists with laws that aim to prevent print capitalism in the Albanian lands having the final goal to break down Albanians in imagined community. By 1902, Albanian language was once more outlawed, and teaching Albanian was a crime that could cost you 15 years in prison. Uh, uh, the 1908 uh, Young Turk Revolution, however, uh, and the restoration of the Constitution, which granted equality to all Ottoman subjects, uh, independently of ethnicity or religion, signs the starting of a new era as the above mentioned laws were temporarily suspended. According to George Goric, Albanians put to good use their newly acquired constitutional rights to establish national clubs, societies, schools in order to enhance their national movement. Perhaps the most decisive move in this context was the determination to resolve the alphabet question. In uh, uh, the Congress, the Congress of Manastir in 1908, November 1908, uh, where the representative of 26 national clubs and more than 300 observers took uh, part uh, in order to adopt a universally nationwide accepted alphabet. According to Natalie Clayer, the Congress, uh, in the Congress participated in a clash of three main parties, each with a different alphabet. The Young Turks were pushing for the Arabic one, the Hellenic or the Greek party was pushing for the Greek alphabet, and the Western or educated who were pushing for the Latin one. Uh, at the end, as George Goric commented on the matter, Albanians opted for the Latin, which brought them closer to Europe. Or as the chairman of the Congress of, uh, of Monasteries said, uh, uh, the Franciscan friar, Jerz Fista, a nationalist from Northern Albania, the Albanian language went westward. However, the annexation of Bosnia and Herzegovina from the dual monarchy and the declaration of independence by the already autonomous Bulgaria in 1908 uh, gave a heavy blow to the prestige of the young Turks, seeing the territory and the integrity of the empire being seriously endangered and wanting to prevent any secessionist movement, they adopted a policy of Ottomanization of other subjects independently of their ethnicity, including Albanians. From now on, the relations between Albanians and Constantinople entered to a point of, new, of no return. A new round of clashes between the imperial center and the national periphery began again. Eventually, the, 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 weekend, of the, Ottoman, the weekend of the Ottoman Empire, uh, 
uh, as uh, it was uh, dealing with uh, revolts in Yemen, uh, with, uh, with the Italo-Libyan uh, war over, uh, over Libya. Uh, convinced of being that the end of the empire was nearby. And Hassan Pristina said that we have to mobilize now. <laughs> and so he did. Hassan Pristina, the Bay of Pristina in Kosovo, uh, took practically all his men and created a very homogeneous, a very heterogeneous alliance with uh, large landowners like Isab Boletini or, or religious uh, and clerics uh, and headed them to, to, to Skopje that back then was the capital of Kosovo and took the control and forced the hand of the Ottoman Empire to, of Istanbul to grant them, to grant them uh, autonomy. However, Anyway, indeed. Uh, so, however, the new situation in Albania made the neighbors uncomfortable, and the heir to the Greek throne, throne Prince Constantinos, confessed in a letter of his that this revolution in Albania is a source of danger to the interests of the surrounding countries. Uh, to the interests of the surrounding countries, and I very much fear that we shall be be, be compelled to mobilize. Indeed. Greece and their Balkan allies de declared war in the short time and managed to occupy most of Albania lands. In the middle of a such critical situation, Albania for, for full independence instead, instead, and for this purpose, a national congress was held in Vlora under the presidency of Ismail Bey Vlora. They telegraphed to the great powers for their decision, asking the recognition and protection of the civilized world. In London, under the auspices of Lord Grey, uh, the Conference of the Ambassadors granted independence to Albania. Uh, and, uh, 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 and granted uh, to the crown of the newly established principality to a German prince, to Prince Wilhelm von Wied. Uh, however, outside the borders of the Albanian state were left a couple of millions. So, nationalists such as Ad Jerz Pista, fr uh, Franciscan friar here in his Lauta Malces, uh, the Highland Lut, uh, expresses the feelings that was m very much, let's say, uh, widely, widely accepted by his compatriots, if you have a look at the press back then, uh, on how they viewed Europe as an aging whore that has betrayed God and partitioned Albania in order to please Russia's ally, the Orthodox Balkan monarchies. In summary, Albanian nationalists fall under two categories, the unification separate nationalism, as their goal was to unify culturally homogeneous territory that included four different Ottoman provinces, and separately because political autonomy from Istanbul similar to what Bulgaria and Egypt had obtained with full sovereignty, with being its fi the final goal. In order to obtain the support and legitimacy, they call upon the principle of nationality, real politics, geopolitical approach to fulfill the mission that is defending Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much for a fascinating um, paper. Um, our next speaker today is uh, Domagoj Tomas from the University of Osijek. Um, he, he's an intellectual historian of the early 20th century. He's written on very diverse subjects, including Hilaire Belloc, G.K. Chesterton, on historical representations of Osijek. And his paper today is on Geopolitical visions of Central Europe in the views of Croatian intellectuals in the first half of the 20th century. And um, it's just coming up now. Thank you very much, Donald. Thank you. So thank you, uh, dear organizers, dear colleagues. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee of this conference for accepting my application and the opportunity to speak before you. 
My article is entitled Geopolitical Visions of Central Europe in the Views of Croatian Intellectuals in the First Half of the 20th Century and tries to fill the gap that is present in the Western European historiography and humanities in general when looking at the liberal heritage of Central Europe in which the contributions of Croatian intellectuals in the first half of the 20th century have been particularly marginalized or completely undiscovered and unknown. By analyzing the content and comparing se several proposals for the future geopolitical organization of Central Europe by prominent Croatian intellectuals of different ideological profiles from the first half of the 20th century, Stepan Radic, Nikola Zvonimir Bielovucic, Ivo Pilar, and Ivo Frank, I will try to determine uh, the extent of the intellectual heritage of liberal ideas within these proposals. However, before that, I will give a brief overview of the socio-political, cultural, and spiritual intellectual context of the second half of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century in Habsburg monarchy, where these proposals were formed, which will help in clearer understanding of their genesis. When I'm talking about Habsburg monarchy, I'm s I'll sometimes uh, use the term Austro-Hungarian Empire and, uh, yeah. Um, I will also briefly look at uh, other similar proposals from that period, some of which directly uh, influenced uh, the proposals of Radic, Bielovucic, Pilar and Frank. The geopolitical concept of Central Europe uh, emerged in various forms uh, throughout modern and contemporary history. The bearers of those ideas were most often prominent individuals who marked the intellectual life of the Habsburg monarchy and the German Empire, as well as the states that emerged on their former territory after the collapse of these empires, which we still consider Central European. Most of these intellectuals also participated in active political uh, life through various political parties. When thinking about the geopolitical future of the area, they mainly took into account liberal understandings of the social order and political structure, respecting the individual rights of citizens, but also the collective rights of peoples. Namely, with the synthesis of uh, liberal ideas, individual uh, freedoms, expansion of political rights, representative democracy, secular state, etc., and national romanticism in the 19th century, the collective rights of peoples and inter-ethnic relations will hold an important place in federalist concepts of reorganization of the Habsburg monarchy as complex multinational political community in Central Europe. These proposals will often highlight historical rights, the legacy of feudal uh, territorial autonomies, and natural rights, ethnic and linguistic distribution, and the complex relationships between them. Uh, the principle of ethnic federalism has been present in the ideas of intellectuals in Hungary since the beginning of the long 19th century. In parallel uh, with the federalist ideas in Hungary, the Slavic peoples uh, within the Habsburg monarchy independently developed their own geopolitical concepts and directions of territorial reorganization of the state, the most famous being Austro-Slavism, which culminated in the Slavic Congress in uh, 1848 in Prague. Designed and presented by Czech authors such as uh, Karel Havlicek Borowski and František Palacki, it also found its advocates among Croats. So in 1848, Ognislav Utješenović Ostrožinski published a draft for the federalization of the Habsburg monarchy. His draft, like the Austro-Slavic concepts of Havlicek Borowski and Palacki, was based on the principle of ethnic federalism. The Austro-Slavic concept will come to life at the beginning of the 20th century in the works of uh, the Croatian politician Stepan Radic, which will be discussed later. In the early 20th century, Archduke Francis Ferdinand, the Austro-Hungarian heir to the throne, gathered around military, political, and intellectual circles which advocated trialism as a model for the federal reorganization of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. Uh, this model would imply the emergence of a third South Slavic territorial unit based primarily on historical Croatian state rights, quotation mark, as a legitimation principle. Uh, although Francis Ferdinand showed sympathy for the idea, it is often pointed out in historiography that it was not actually a real political options, option, but only an Austrian means of political pressure, pressure on the Hungarians. Slovenian politician Ivan Šustršić also showed a tendency toward trialism, and in Croatian intellectual and political circles, trialism had many some sympathizers, including historian Bielovucic and a lawyer Pilar, who presented concrete trialist proposals in their works, which I will talk uh, more about a bit later. Immediately after the end of the First World War, at the end of the 1918, 
Oskar Jassi and Miksha Strobel sought to satisfy the appetites of national emancipation of non-Hungarian peoples with their proposals for the cantonization of Hungary on the principle of ethnic federalism following the example of Switzerland. However, there was no political will for more serious consideration of such solutions as the Austro-Hungarian Empire faced the war defeat and disintegration that soon followed with exceptionally unfavorable uh, conditions for the Hungarians, which included substantially altered and reduced borders established by the 1920 Trianon Treaty. In the period between the two world wars, Hungarian economist Alamir Hontos sought to build a central European economic integration, establishing various institutions that worked to achieve this goal. Among Croatian intellectuals in the 20th century, Radic was the first who seriously considered the possibility of reorganizing the Austro-Hungarian Empire on a federalist principle. He made his proposal during a discussion entitled Slavic Politics in the Habsburg Monarchy, published in Prague in 1908. Two, and Zagreb in 1906. Also, Radic, as an active politician and leader of the Croatian People's Peasant Party, based on the principles of political agrarianism, inherited intellectual heritage of liberal nationalism of Ante Starcevic, Yugoslavism of Josip Juraj Rosmajer, progressivism of Tomas Garig Masaryk, and pacifism of Leo Nikolaevich Tolstoy. In the second chapter of his discussion, Radish presented his view of the future organization of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, explaining it in detail in the fourth subchapter. His proposal of the Danube Alliance of States and Peoples, based on historical, economic, and cultural reasons, consisted of five units, German Alpine, Czech, Galician, Hungarian, and Croatian, Slovenian, Serbian, Banovina, connected by common affairs and the ruler. At the same time, Vienna, as the capital, would have separate administration which would enable its structure to, quotation mark, become the de facto capital of the monarchy and to implement national equality in all its decrees, end of quotation mark. According to Radic's exposed Austro-Slavic concept, the unification of the South Slavic, South Slavic areas would be the primary goal, and the connection with other Slavs in the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, Czechoslovaks, Poles, and Little Russians, would be secondary. Radic found support for his proposal in, quotation mark, historical creation state rights, end of quotation mark, hoping that it would be accepted by Slovenes and Serbs, although he, although he was aware of possible resistance among Serbs. He looked for the reasons for such attitudes among Serbs in Starčević's exclusive Croatism and the traditional resistance of the Serbian intelligentsia to, Croatian, uh, to historical Croatian state rights. Radic's proposal included a joint political administration with a double alphabet, Cyrillic and Latin, and a triple national education system. Among the analyzed Croatian intellectuals who presented geopolitical visions of Central Europe, Bjelovucic was the only one to come from Dalmatia, which was within the Austrian part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, while others operated in Croatia and Slavonia within the Hungarian part of the state. His trialist proposal was presented in a short brochure entitled Trialism and the Croatian State, published in 1911 in Dubrovnik in his own edition. In it, Bjelovucic foresaw the future political organization of the Habsburg state with three entities, the Austrian Empire, the Kingdom of Hungary, and the Kingdom of Croatia. According to his proposal, the Austrian Empire would consist of German provinces in the monarchy, the Czech Republic, and Poland. The Hungarian Kingdom would include the territory of Hungary proper, excluding Croatia and Slavonia, while the Croatian Kingdom would include all southern Slavs in the monarchy, Croatia, and Slavonia with Međimur Međimurje and Rijeka, Dalmatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, the Austrian littoral, and the Slovenian land. In his proposal, Bjelovucic combined historical and natural law, trying to provide the southern Sla Slavs with the best possible position and the largest possible territorial unit. Bjelovucic spoke of Croats and Serbs as one nation who speak the same language and are divided only by religion, while he considers Slovenes to be mountainous Croats. Bosnian Herzegovinian Muslims, today's Bosniaks, were not explicitly mentioned by Bjelovucic because at that time of his pamphlet they were not built as a separate nation but were usually considered as a part of Croatian or Serbian nation. Bjelovucic's trialist proposal implied the joint ruling Habsburg dynasty, foreign affairs, 
defense and finance, while other departments, internal affairs, judiciary, agriculture, ed education, transport, trade, would fall entirely under the autonomous ju jurisdiction of each of the federal units. Two years later, Bielovucic published another short pamphlet in self-edition in Dubrovnik entitled The Federalist Monarchy and the Croatian Question. The federalist concept of reorganization of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy that he proposed there was based on the principle of ethnic federalism, not trialism, from which it can, it can be concluded that his thinking about the future internal organization of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy evolved rather quickly. Rather quickly. He himself talked about uh, this in the introduction of that brochure, emphasizing the understanding for the dissatisfaction of Czechs and Poles with the trialistic concepts in which there were no clear solutions to their national issues. Therefore, in his new vision, Bielovucic proposed seven federal units. German-Austrian countries, Czech countries, Polish countries, Ukraine, Romanian-Austrian countries, Hungary, and Croatia, based mainly on natural law, and in some of them envisaged, envis envisaged uh, additional autonomous territorial units for individual, individual national groups. For example, the province of Trentino for the Italians in the German-Austrian lands and separate provinces for the German Saxons and Hungarian settlers in the Romanian-Austrian lands. In that part, his proposal recalled Popovicis, Die Vereinigten Staaten von Großösterreich Politische Studien. In this respect, Bielovucic envisioned the Kingdom of Croatia, which would include Croatia and Slavonia, Dalmatia, Rijeka, Međimurje, the former Serbian Vojvodina, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Istria and Slovenia, Carniola, Slovenian parts of Styria and Carinthia, Goričko and uh, Trieste. In such community, Croat Serbs and Slovenes would each use uh, their own language, and Bielovucic respected the collective rights of Italians in the western part of the area, implying their linguistic and cultural educational autonomy, the right to establish uh, an Italian university, for example. Pilar was an advocate of cultural and social modernization, and his public and political activities until the end of the First World War were mainly related to the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina, where he participated in the foundation of the political party Croatian National Union in 1907, the first Croatian geopolitical study. In the geopolitical study, Political Geography of Croatian Lands, which was published before the end of the First World War in Sarajevo in uh, 1918, Pilar saw Croatian lands, Croatia, Slavonia, Dalmatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Istria, largely as the southern part of Central Europe, Croatia, Slavonia, and Istria, and to a lesser extent as the northwestern part of the Balkans, Dalmatia, Bosnia, and Herzegovina. Although uh, he did not explicitly mention trialism, he concluded that all these lands were reunited by the Austro-Hungarian monarchy and that Croatian lands can be held together only by one force capable of paralyzing their natural centri centrifugality. Therefore, in historiography, the term concealed trialism is often used to denote Pillar's geopolitical concept. However, Pillar's geopolitical assessment of the possibility of a trialistic vision of the organization of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy in the work uh, The South Slavic Question, published in Vienna in 1918, was nevertheless uh, unfavorable. There, Pillar offered three arguments that he considered crucial for the practical impossibility of realizing the trialist proposals. First, unclear and undefined territorial space of the South Slavic Federal Unit. Second, the lack of common historical state rights of the South Slavic area. And third, irreconcilability between the Croatian and Serbian national ideas and between Catholic and Orthodox culture. In the continuation of the same work, he presented his concept of reorganization of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which would be based on historical Croatian state rights in the service of the unification of Croatian lands into a single administrative area, which would become a condominium of the Austrian and Hungarian parts of the state. The last uh, geopolitical vision of Central Europe among Croatian intellectuals before the Second World War was presented by Frank. His father was Croatian politician Josip Frank, a former trainee lawyer with Karl Luga and longtime leader of the Pure Party of Rights. This political party sought to achieve the goal of consolidating Croatian lands within the Austro-Hungarian monarchy in cooperation with the Viennese court and the ruling Habsburg dynasty and strongly opposed Unionism, Hungarianism and Yugoslavism. 
All this significantly influenced Frank's spiritual, intellectual, and political formation, and during the visit of Emperor Francis Joseph I to Zagreb in uh, 1895, Frank, along with Radic and other students, participated in the burning of the Hungarian flag in the central square of Zagreb. For this reason, it is interesting uh, that after the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, Frank found his political refuge in Budapest, where he connected with Hungarian revisionist circles, and in 1933 published a pamphlet entitled The Croats and the Revision. In this brochure, Frank offered his geopolitical vision of the organization of Central Europe as a Danube confederation of small states and peoples, including an independent Croatian state in political partnership with Hungary. According to Frank, these states and nations could join political efforts, uh, through joint political efforts, resist German pan-Germanism and Russian Orthodox pan-Slavism. Frank offered Hungarians the political, cultural, and demographic potential of Croatian uh, Croats living in the Hungarian borderlands who would focus on anti trianon revisionism while Hungarians should in return provide clear support for the realization of the Croatian state-building idea in the former eight Croatian and Slavonian counties. And in conclusion, the geopolitical visions uh, of Central Europe by Croatian intellectuals in the first half of the 20th century were uh, diverse and conditioned by broader political shifts and changes in Europe. These concept, uh, concepts related to Austro-Slavism and Trialism uh, are based on a combination of historical and natural laws respecting the liberal idea of collective rights of peoples, but were not realized due to the lack of political will within the dualist Austro-Hungarian monarchy, nor Frank's, Frank's interwar proposal of the danube pannonian community of peoples and states. Thus, all the above-mentioned proposals have the legacy of liberal nationalism of the 19th century in common, further refreshed by the influence of Masaryk's progressivism among some intellectuals. Also, it is common for all Croatian intellectuals not to consider within the Hungarian political territory at all, because there are no proposals by Croatian authors for a possible federalization of Hungary based on the principle of ethnic federalism. Politically active intellectuals who made these proposals were aware of the position of Central Europe European small nations sandwiched between pan-Germanism as an ideological tool for realizing the political and economic imperialism of the German state and pan-Slavism as an ideological tool for realizing the political and economic imperialism uh, of the Russian state. Therefore, presented geopolitical visions of the Central Europe among Croatian intellectuals as well as those of Hungarian, Slovenian and Czech primarily sought to affirm their uniqueness and sustainability, as well as various forms of mutual cooperation and integration, which could prevent domination of German and Russian influence over those territories. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for that um, fascinating um, insight into the development of different Croatian nationalism. Our next speakers today are Zinovia Lialuki, I'm from uh, Athens. Um, she's an expert on Greek political history, the Cold War, political ideologies, and national identities. And we'll be speaking today with Yasson Zarikos from Athens, who's also written about Islamophobia and the making of modern Atlantic monarchies, a forthcoming book that I found on Google Books. <laughs> um, and the, the title of their paper today is Images of the Great Powers and Neglected Visions of Europe in, the First, Wo in First World War Greece. So a slight change of title. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to pick up the story from where your was left this morning. Can, can you hear me, please? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Is it better now? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, European identity was at the center of many writings during the Great War, but as Matthew Dore, Doria and Jan Vermeiren have remarked, this fact has been uh, neglected since research has focused on those who campaigned for immediate truce on the one hand and the nationalistic fervor of, of public intellectuals on the other. Following this insight, our paper aims at offering a more nuanced presentation of Europeanist ideas by focusing on the Greek debate. The historical context is a national schism of 1915. The schism followed the highly successful Balkan Wars of 1912-1913 and revolved around the fundamental question of the most appropriate strategy to fulfill further national expansion. After the outbreak of the war, liberals propagated a war alliance with Entente, while conservatives favored neutrality. By 1916, Greek territory had been split up in two entities, 
with an Athens-based royalist government and the provisional government based at Thessaloniki, with Eleftherios Venizelos as its leader. The internal political divide was further complicated by multiple foreign interventions. In the end, it was the combination of naval blockade and diplomatic pressure that shifted the balance in favor of the Allies. In June 1917, Venizelos prevailed. The king was deposed and Greece entered the war. Our analysis based on the articles of two daily Athens-based newspapers, the conservative script and the liberal Nea Elas. Nea Elas was an ardent supporter of Eleftherios Venizelos, leader of the Liberal Party. After the outbreak of the national schism, Nea Elas supported, as we said, the formation of an alliance with France, Russia and Britain. This argument betrayed a certain idea of Europe. Quote, we, we identify our fortunes with the most chivalrous people in Europe and also with a state that regulates the fortunes of the world for a very long time, the state of wealth, of sea domination, of high diplomacy, and finally, with the nation to which Byron, Codrington, and Gladstone belong to. This argument is based on different layers of the idea of Europe, which revolve around the notions of civilization, state power, and philhellenism. It is worth noting that the three persons who are associated with the British nation, a poet, an admiral, and a politician, are either linked to the Greek War of Independence, Byron and Codrington, and thus with the founding of the modern Greek state, or with Greece's territorial expansion, as Gladstone had supported the annexation of the Ionian Islands to the great state, but also that of Cyprus. The most important conceptualization regarding Europe is that of protector powers. Britain, France, and Russia had mediated between the Ottoman Empire and the revolutionary Greece, and had been acknowledged as guarantor powers, not protectors, by the London 1830 Treaty, which failed to specify the content of guarantees. They were to be specified with later treaties, but that was never realized. In parallel, the myth of the protector powers gained prominence in Greek public discourse since the, since the early 1830s. Even though the term protector powers had no substance in terms of international law and diplomatic documents, it became a powerful political concept and an integral part of the relationship between Greece and the great European powers that was instrumentalized in many different ways throughout the 19th and the early 20th centuries. In the Greek public debate, the term protector powers was mostly employed with reference to Greece's aspiration for territorial expansion. The naval battle of Navarino, 1827, was the most common reference point for the protector powers. Navarino was the founding myth that associated Greek freedom with Europe. Moreover, this political myth entailed the idea that Europe was obliged to protect or to secure Greece's freedom as the latter was perceived throughout the long 19th century. Thus, Navarino, a historical event of the early 19th century, was connected to the Great War, cementing the link between Europe and Greek freedom. In the context of the national schism, the term was also associated with the perceived legitimacy of the political regime by each rival camp. For the Venizelist camp, the Entente coalition was identified with the protector powers and the safeguarding of Greek freedom, mostly perceived as anti-royalist stance. Venizelos himself, as well as his associates, framed French and British military intervention in neutral Greece as fulfillment of their parental role and as a new liberation of Greece by the protector powers. Perhaps the key in understanding the perception of Europe is that Greek notions of freedom were inextricably linked to visions of territorial expansion. Thus, Greek freedom was perceived as incomplete as long as unredeemed Greek populations continued to exist outside the borders of the Greek nation state. In this line of thinking, ideas about state formation and structure were very important as they were perceived as integral part of achieving the goal of expanding Greek territory. Under this prism, the great European powers provided different models for state building. The French Revolution and the French nation state for one and the German state for another are the object of admiration for liberals and royalists alike. The views of German intellectuals were often commented in the columns of the liberal Nea Elas. In January 1915, the paper's editorial by George Papandreou commented extensively on Henry von Treitschke's distinction between smaller and greater states and his thesis that the former would eventually give way to the latter. Papandreou raised the criticism that the German historian failed to include the nation as a distinct component in his argumentation. 
for Papandreou, the liberation of nations was in harmony with the rhyme of historical development and was the real foundation for the construction of a new international civilization. He also stressed that the German historian had been inspired by the German blind faith to the value of power. And he concluded that the liberty of individuals and nations was the true foundation of a superior culture and was the only one compatible with a spirit of historical development. If Germany opposed this principle, then, despite some temporary successes, Germany would eventually be crushed. On the other hand, the French Revolution was a powerful reference for the association of Europe with liberty, perceived primarily in relation to state building. The paper's editorials argued for a linear continuity between the French Revolution and France's role in the war against Germany, and were as far as to state that never before have her struggles for the progress of mankind been as agreeable as those currently waged to nullify the threat of German world conquer. However, aside from the claim for the universal appeal of the French Revolution, Neala stressed its special meaning for Greece's historical course in the following words, quote, Thanks to the lessons of the French Revolution, this small creek corner of land was liberated, and France was always in her side in the pursuit of its national rights, and has thus been able to sextuple her population and triple her territory in order to effectively pursue the unity of the race and the continuation of her civilizing task in the Orient. In July 1917, after the king's forced exile, Nea last argued that Greece's last fearful enemy was the Kaiser, as he represented the last hope for the royalists to see Constantine restored to the throne. The defeat of Germany was the only option for Greece to secure her national interest, not only because that would entail the crash of Greece's internal enemies, Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire, but also because it was a precondition for safeguarding Greek freedom against the absolutism of Constantine. In this phase, Neaelas adopted an ecumenic anti-monarchism and perceived the abolition of monarchy across the world as the ultimate legacy of the war. Despite the sufferings that had been brought up by the war, the paper was optimistic that it had offered the great possible service to mankind by bringing down not only the tyrants, but the very idea of tyranny. Neelas prophesied that monarchy was about to be defeated, not merely as an institution, but as an idea. Quote, after the Tsar Constantine and after him the Kaiser, and not just them, but also their successors. Whether victors uh, or defeated or neutrals, the tyrants cannot survive the ongoing world struggle. They will be swept forever. Their memory will be erased in the darkness of the past as the memory of all evils that tormented humanity throughout the centuries. The new Europe emerging from the ruins would be a continent of republics. And naturally, this republican dream had its discontents. When the war broke out in 1914, the conservatives perceived it as a cataclysmic event that threatened the very foundations of European and, by extension, global civilization. This was truly a European civil war that reversed the linear progress of enlightened humanity, identified with Europe, towards the fulfillment of the noble uh, scientific and cultural ideal. As for who bore the responsibility for this unfolding European tragedy, Scrip, our newspaper, wrote that the main culprit was Austria-Hungary, a great power that attacked a small state. And after the German invasion of France, uh, our newspaper, allegedly Germanophile, but certainly monarchist, sided enthusiastically not with Kaiser, but with the motherland of Victor Hugo, a country they saluted as the birthplace of the noblest ideals, modern heroism and liberty, now in the fight against Prussian militarism. Uh, but the fundamental distinction throughout the war was not between civilization and militarism, but between small national states and great powers. It is this distinction that helps us understand our conservatives' verdict that European institutions are inadequate to control the irresistible urge of European civilization towards self-destruction. Thus, the proposal in 1914 for the establishment of a global court that would act as an arbitrator between national interests. In any case, global court or not, European liberty was perceived as the liberty of small nations to dictate their fate. Now, a small nation uh, could aspire to glory or mere survival, but ideas of Europe are always present. Take the case of glory, for example. If Greece is entitled to conquer at some point, during or after the war, 
her city of dreams, that is Constantinople. Uh, she will do it not only as the inheritor of its own uh, Byzantine past, but also as a rightful representative of European civilization. The same applies to the more realistic aspiration of a small state avoiding total disaster. As years progress and Antant, the Allies, occupies the Greek territory, openly intervening in favor of the liberals, the royalists abandon their dreams of Byzantine expansion and escalate the criticism against the Allies, who act as tyrants against a small nation. The monarchist press constantly invokes the cases of Belgium and Serbia, two small states that were thoroughly defeated, in order to demonstrate the destructive and amoral nature of this European war, and of course Greece's justified decision to remain neutral. Tied harmonically to Scripps' nationalist priorities, Europe and her ideals provide the major int intellectual context for the monarchist denunciations. This is why, even in a paper deemed Germanophile by the literature, uh, the culture civilization dichotomy is nowhere to be found. Instead, Great Britain and France are, portra are portrayed as betrayers of their own historical ideals. Enraged by the blatant French military intervention in Greece, our monarchies uh, turned France against itself. Just like the liberals we encountered in this paper, the conservatives also celebrate the great French Revolution and demand the implementation of her ideals. Now, this reading of French history is very interesting since those people, monarchists, do not hesitate to designate as the fundamental injustice of the pre-revolutionary era the suppression of freedom, uh, of European freedom, by kings. The above testifies to the diverse form conservatives took during the Great War. Our monarchists remained at heart French, and the ideal of their ideal of European liberty springs from the deeper Europeanist temporality of 1789 and its legacy of modern freedom. Neglected ideological trajectories come to light. Verily, if this idea of European freedom seems strange coming from conservatives, that is, people whose faith in an interventionist monarchy constituted the foundation of their political beliefs, it is because the history of modern ideologies is incomplete. For conservatives, and not only in Greece, never preached a return to an undifferentiated traditional past, but always elaborated genealogies of their own, with a condemnation of pre-revolutionary absolutism occupying a not insignificant role in their interpretation of modern history. In any case, the foundational conservative arguments about Europe, the ones that called, for example, for a European monarchist campaign against France, Berg, for the re-establishment re of papal authority, the Mestre, or for a concert of monarchy states, are now irrelevant. <coughs> Revolutionary France is portrayed as the emblem and last refuge of the collapsing European civilization. France is beauty incarnate, says the newspaper, but a fallen beauty, who has betrayed Greece. Scrip is now certain that contemporary Greeks are the real friends, the real successors of the great revolution. German culture is nowhere to be found, while the freedom of, of, of small European nations dominates their thought. The silencing of this demand for freedom by the French arms uh, signals the continent's tragic fate. Europe has lost its protector. Not that protection is, of course, an innocent concept. If liberals were invoking the Battle of Navarino, cons conservatives made it clear that they have had enough with this specific protectionist narrative. And we witness a shift from the language of ideals to the language of geopolitics. Uh, all around the continent, the monarchists say, the torches of liberty are going off because geopolitics have dominated and replaced European ideals. Uh, of course, there are also versions, other versions of Greek nationalism. Uh, in some articles, it is the West that is designated as the historical enemy of Hellenism through a historical genealogy connecting Antant to the Crusaders and the fall of Byzantium. But it is crucial not to confuse ideas about the West with ideas about Europe, as most scholars of Greek nationalism tend to do. Europe, in the Greek imaginary, carries a different, richer, and most often positive meaning. Greeks might sometimes distance themselves from the West, but Europe is ancient Greece's offspring and modern Greece's birthright. In conclusion, throughout the war, Europeanist temporalities oscillated perilously between the permanent demands of nationalism 
to the ideals of European civilizations and the contingencies of state building. In the summer of 1914, the most pressing demand was the termination of the European Civil War, a war that imperiled the triumphant ascent of Europe to the apex of civilization. Nevertheless, when Greece got involved, this linear temporality of Europeanism receded into the background. It was the pre preservation of the rights of small nations in a continent dominated by great powers that emerged as a fundamental demand. But ideas of Europe do not vanish. Other temporalities of Europeanism emerged, some of them mutually incompatible, some others illuminating the common ground between liberals and monarchists. See, liberals were nationalists that resurrected a view of Europe, allegedly originating in early 19th century, that allowed for the existence of protector powers an idea that conservatives uh, strongly rejected. Liberals, moreover, believed that the emerging Europe would be a Republican one, while monarchists, of course, disagreed, and many of them believed in private that Germany would prevail. But both camps claimed and honored the legacy of the great French Revolution. The constant, this constant renegotiation of the European past and future should not surprise us. Ideologies are selective and their memory fragile. The, mir the mirror they hold up to history is broken, but sometimes effective beyond <laughs> expectations. The endurance of the European ideal per se amply demonstrates this thesis. Thank you. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much to our last speakers and for that seamless transition <laughs> between, <laughs> between you. Uh, we've got some time for questions now, but we have to finish strictly at quarter past because our lunch is not movable. <laughs> um, right. periphery obviously uh, problematic uh, terms uh, uh, that are well constructs usually made in the so-called uh, center um, uh, on the other hand we know that empirically um, um, well discourses about Europe or notions of Europe uh, often serve as positive references as you have made uh, clear in the in the last paper in these uh, uh, countries so Europe was uh, associated with modernity with progress with political order and security even and it was something that was aspired, uh, and there was uh, were discourses about how to become European among young Turks, um, intellectuals in Spain and Finland, while at the same time, interestingly, in the so-called center uh, during, during that epoch, and discourses about Europe tend to be rather negative, at least among intellectuals, with uh, Europe being associated with decline, with crisis, uh, with um, political disorder. So that's really uh, interesting, uh, and wh what are you making out of that? Yeah, th uh, thanks for, for great papers, I'll keep it very short. Um, the first, b both papers, I learned a lot, and I'll try to ask a question that may connect both, because it's interesting scenarios. On the one end, we have, you know, the 1870s, et cetera, the case of a small, you know, entity uh, seeking legitimacy, essentially, with an argument, there, Albania. There we have the, the workshop of, you know, ways to solve national questions. One thing I want to ask is Illyrianism, the whole discussion of Il on Illyrianism, right? It, it's, uh, it connects with discussion on race and language. I, I know it's a mid-19th century discussion among some Croat intellectuals, etc. I wonder whether that has any credo as we move on to the early 20th century. And also it's interesting in the Albanian national context, the language of Illyrianism, etc., how it's used. That's one question, maybe, I mean, if you want to say anything on that. The second question is minorities. Again, minorities. So if there's anything in the writings you, you, you're, you're analyzing on conceptualizations of what a minority is, how minorities work, etc. So whether question. And the final comment, and I'll end with the, on the small nations, etc. And I, I guess that's a broader point. 
is it, to what extent can we think about this language as a coming back, if you will, of a certain Republican ideal about small nations, etc. Obviously, you know, loaded with nationalism, and you know, you know, and yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, to all the presenters for um, this very interconnected and, and rich uh, presentations. And my question goes to Yasun. <laughs> I was very interested in all your perspectives about temporalities. I work on temporalities with very different case studies. But also when you were talking about uh, civilization uh, linked to nationalism, I wanted to know if, if there's also a connection with the idea of cosmopolitan civilization that is larger than nations, and in if in that sense, the um, the Greek perception finds a synergy with other nations in terms of temporality. If there's a coincidence, if there's a dialogue, and also a whole idea, a whole notion of transnational cooperation towards this cosmopolitan civilization. And I was thinking of the example, something very contemporary, the Visegrad countries. Sometimes there's competition, sometimes there's cooperation, but it's an association of small nations, sometimes towards a, a common goal. So what about this association in the case of Greece and cosmopolitan civilization? Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all speakers. Um, and my question, I, I have two questions and one connects to the one of um, Florian made uh, before. Uh, that is, uh, I, uh, as I know from the liberal thought of the Risorgimento in Italy, um, one says we are Europe and this is why we want now actively to return being uh, self-conscious Europeans. Um, is that a discourse, a part of the discourse of the countries and peoples and nations you presented? Um, because otherwise I find it difficult to understand why one wants so much to join Europe when Europe is negative in uh, because it's a, 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 a region of superpowers and when during First World War the real help comes from the US and, and Wilson's self-determination of, of countries, of people. So um, it, it seems to me that in this period it's not so much, it's not the much the, the superpowers that help small nations to become autonomous and and to free themselves from the empires they they are in and the other is is a semantic question a central europe is that a uh, a, a term we apply from our perspective or is it for perspective or is it a a, a, um, a term of the of this period? Do, do they call themselves Central Europe? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for uh, this uh, fascinating presentation. Just a short uh, question to uh, Domagoj about uh, were there any discussions uh, between Croats, Czechs, Slovenes, uh, um, I'm, well, I was wondering, uh, because you presented uh, the Croat intellectuals, but as you mentioned, I mean, uh, these uh, geopolitical concepts uh, were uh, circulating and, uh, um, I mean, Slovenes, Czechs, Poles were all engaged in this debate, so I was just wondering if there was any circulation of, of, of ideas. Thank you. So yeah, my question, <laughs> yeah, let's mix things up. Uh, here are two narratives that were actually the same, had Albania and Greece that projecting themselves as the seed of Europe, if I'm correct. So I would like to ask you, it's kind of a discussion, if this was uh, like a world of impressions towards Europe, which narrative uh, basically convinced more and who? 
because I, I see it from an ideological perspective. Why did they project this narrative, both of these countries, and why did they target the Ottoman Empire? Primarily at least. And who, if there is a competition of these narratives, who won this competition? If there was any, because they were neighbors and they had more or less the same. So, yeah. It's more a general question, not to someone special, but we have seen in the first panel and in this panel now that there was a very strong connection between liberalism and nationalism. And the question in general is if the big crisis of liberalism after World War I is the result that the liberals couldn't fulfill the nationalist ambitions and that the extreme nationalists uh, were able to uh, to be the followers in, in this uh, ideological uh, gap. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Eri, do you want to start? Oh, well, go on, you. <laughs> thank you for the questions, they were great. Uh, now, George. You asked about minorities and how they and how they were conceptualized in their future and their position in the newly established or, or the future to be established nation state. And the other one was about Illyrianism. Let's begin with the minorities. In the meantime, Albanians were claiming four Ottoman provinces: the province of Kosovo, of Skutari, Skodra, Ioannina, Yanina, and Bitola or Manastir. They were fully aware, if you follow their discussions in the newspapers or their private correspondence, that they were not, let's say, purely Albanian inhabited. They talk about majority Albanian lands. Uh, in the meantime, uh, most, most of the elite back then was Greek educated or Italian educated. And they when it comes to, to the Greek minority, for instance, or to, to the Greeks that were going to be within the borders of the new established ta state, they believed that they would be, let's say, integrated the same way that the Arvanites were living in Greece, keeping their customs, language, and so on and so forth, till the early 20th century. However, uh, when we talk about the Slavs, then that's another story especially in particular the Serbs and the Montenegrins. They, they, were, they developed actually a number of uh, theories that most Slavs were actually Slavized Albanians who need to return back to their roots, and they were promoting assimilation. Uh, so, for instance, uh, with, the, with the Jew presence, let's say, in Ioannina, no issue. With, with, the, with the Vlachs, no issue. Uh, th there was a future, in th they saw a future, and the most, uh, the most important thing is that the concept of nationality was based on, on language practically. So you could become a citizen of the state when it, it was going to get established if you spoke the language, otherwise you were excluded. This is on minorities. Now, Illyrianism. Truth be told, Illyrianism became widely popular during the communist era and regime. Uh, before, it was not so much popular. Albanian nationalists back then preferred the Pelasgian theory, which, that, which let's say, put them th as the first inhabitants of the land before the Greeks and before the Romans. Uh, and, and this argument was key because they believed that if the Ottoman Empire would, would get dissolved, and they were portray portrayed as Muslims, as Turks practically, uh, they had no place in Europe. And they had seen that, uh, that, that play playing all over again. Let's say when the Greek revolution broke out, uh, we know what happened in Tripolitsa, for instance, right? And the, when uh, the Serbs go to Vranja, we know what happened, or Toplica, and so on and so forth. They were, were very much worried about this and developed a set of arguments, especially that of the first settler in order to, 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 to remain there. Uh, now, uh, now, 
Uh, my Alex, you asked about Serbia and uh, about Greece and Albania that shared a similar narrative, right? Uh, uh, that being the, 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 the first line of defense of the European civilization, right? Uh, indeed, 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 indeed. Well, the winner was definitely Greece. <laughs> uh, th th that's, a, that's a short answer to, 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 to a very long <laughs> question, truth be told. The, the clear winner in this uh, the sense was Greece. Uh, why? Because the Greek state was established first to begin with. Moreover, due to, 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 to the romantic, let's say, <coughs> to the romantic movement of the 19th century, it Greece became, let's say, the, 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 the founding stone of Western and European civilization. Uh, that's why we saw the, the, this uh, wave of philalanism and so on and so forth, but you won't find any, anywhere a wave of philo-albanism, for instance. Uh, th th that's uh, my story, I'm gonna put a point, <laughs> I'm gonna end this one here because I'm gonna have a lot of other things to say during the coffee break. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I'll try to answer to all the questions and uh, comments. Uh, so first, about the term European territories, which was uh, mentioned by Jan Florian. Um, yeah, uh, it's always like with these kind of terms, uh, we, we have some like problems, and but uh, our mind is uh, set up like we need to put some things at, at some marks and uh, I can say it uh, from the works of these intellectuals, Croatian intellectuals uh, I, I have mentioned in, in, uh, in my presentation, uh, they were also uh, conscien conscious about uh, the thing that uh, Croatian lands and uh, their uh, position is uh, peripheral uh, to, to the uh, rest of, of the Europe. So they, they used in, in their works uh, the, the same term sometimes, uh, as I remember, I, I don't have so, uh, quotation marks, so, so, so it's like that uh, about the term. Uh, about the question uh, from Georgios about uh, Illyrianism, uh, am I right? Yeah, uh, uh, you said something also about that uh, in Albanian, from Albanian perspective, uh, perspective? yeah. Uh, from perspective of uh, South Slavic nations, especially uh, Croatians, uh, in 19th century, when uh, in first half of 19th century, when uh, Croatian national movement uh, emerged, uh, Illyrian name was uh, some kind of uh, the uh, a name w w which uh, needed to unite all uh, South Slavs. It was like a possibility. Uh, which Croatian intellectuals, mainly in, uh, uh, based in Zagreb, uh, wanted to, to use that name to unite all the southern Slavic nations. Uh, but uh, shortly, a uh, few years after the uh, emergence of uh, that uh, Croatian national movement under that name, uh, it was dismissed by uh, Austrian state and it, it was uh, never, never again uh, used uh, uh, as, as it was uh, at that time, uh, and other South Slavic nations uh, mainly di didn't ad adopt that name, they didn't want to adopt it, their intellectuals. Uh, it was one question about uh, Central Europe, if I remember. Uh, yeah, uh, about the term Central Europe, which we use uh, uh, today, um, and uh, about the is it used in, in the works of these intellectuals from the first half of 20th century? Yes, yeah, some of them uh, used uh, strictly di this term, Central Europe, uh, especially uh, uh, Ivo Pilar, uh, he used the term Central Europe, and uh, uh, Ivo Frank. Uh, some others used the term for the same region, like Danube region, or mm, something, something like that, the Danube Confederation, if, if we talk in the terms of some uh, possible states or provinces. Uh, and uh, there was a question about uh, circulation of these uh, ideas uh, uh, between uh, other uh, Slavic nations in uh, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, I can say that uh, these uh, intellectual networks uh, between 
Croatian, Slovene, and Czech intellectuals were very intensive. Uh, they were uh, not not only uh, in social mobility, in social way. Uh, on Slavic Congress in uh, 1848, they they were uh, they had some um, uh, uh, proposals uh, together to to make some federalist uh, reapproach to um, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, but uh, a lot of uh, these proposals from uh, Slovene intellectuals, Czech intellectuals, Cro uh, Croatian intellectuals from the uh, ninth, long 19th century and from the first half of 20th century uh, were very similar in uh, the contents. So, yeah, uh, it was very... Uh, th they were networking. <laughs> so I, I think that's all if someone... I don't know how you all going to no, work it out. Yeah, it's So um, at this point, Greece, most Greeks felt that Greece was at the margins, at the periphery of Europe, and they were okay with it. I mean, in uh, 1863, when the dynasty changed in Greece and the Danish prince came as king of Greece, uh, his first public address to the Greek people was that we will become an ideal kingdom in the Orient. That was his address. And this was a sort of national goal in the following decades. So uh, when the war came, the First World War, and uh, the military pressure from the Entente intensified uh, in Greece, most royalist newspapers would say, why is this happening? I mean, we are a small kingdom in the Orient so that Europe would forget for ages. Nobody remembered us. And now why are all of a sudden all this pressure? We are in the Orient. What does this mean? This is not a cultural term. I mean, the Orient is not perceived in terms of civilization or culture. Uh, we are in the Orient because we are a small state. Uh, so this uh, divide, the great nations, the small nations, sustains this geopolitical reading of the West and the East. And uh, also this neighborhood, the neighborhood of Greece, the neighborhood of Southeastern Europe, is a neighborhood of small states who, are not, who do not want to have brotherly ties to each other. This is a highly competitive environment. There is a struggle for the legacy of the Ottoman Empire. So there are small states competing each other and they seek support from the great powers. Uh, and at this uh, point of the World War, uh, Wilson's agenda and self-determination is nowhere to be found in the Greek debate. I mean, of course, there, there it is mentioned in the press, but nobody takes it seriously. I mean, uh, what the Greeks understand is that the power of the world, the power structure of the world still lies with the European great powers. So whatever Wilson has to say is pretty much indifferent to us because they do not believe that he can actually impose his agenda. Uh, and also, the great European powers are important in the way the Greeks think at the time because they provide models for state building. I mean, this is where Greece should look if we want to build a proper state that can expand. So. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I will make only two brief points before because we need to go uh, about cosmopolitanism. Uh, liberals employed this term. Cons for conservatives, uh, it was a dirty signifier. Eh? Uh, there, has, there were cosmopolitans from an analytical point of view, and there have been some recent studies on cosmopolitan conservatism um, that, that you can look out for. Uh, but here, for the associations question, uh, we need to understand the drama of neutrality for the, uh, for the monarchies. Uh, they cannot associate with anyone. Uh, uh, we can think uh, that they could form an association of neutral states. Uh, they, they never thought about it. Uh, they could not uh, side with the central powers. They didn't want to side with the, the allies. Uh, so they were fundamentally alone and isolated. Uh, and this is why they needed to believe on the, this ideal of small states uh, retaining uh, uh, their rights. Um, about the discourse, the discourse about uh, Europe, uh, for Greece, Europe is an existential presupposition of uh, a notion of the self. Uh, no matter its domination by great powers, no matter its current status, uh, Greece belongs to Europe. Greece is the progenitor of the European uh, civilization. Uh, uh, there has never been any question in these 200 years of the modern Greek state that Greece can abandon Europe. Um, and the last point about the multiple temporalities. Uh, 
uh, in my p personal view, uh, historiography has suffered from the imposition uh, Kozelekian and then uh, from François Hartog of uh, unified temporalities, uh, allegedly uh, characterizing the whole of modernity and uh, the other uh, entity called tradition, uh, traditional societies. Uh, uh, I think uh, we can delve deeper and excavate the unique multiple temporalities inherent in each uh, political demand uh, in its intervention in the realm of politics. And uh, if the cost we pay is that uh, we find that modernity has not the coherence we believed, uh, it is uh, a price worth paying. Terrific panel and for your exemplary timekeeping. And thank you very much to Carl Antonius for gracefully um, postponing his paper until this afternoon. So I think um, the movement is towards Pan Pepper Focaccia again. Um, will you lead the way, Matthew? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you.
Ale tu mi ten písala.
Can you hear us, Theresa? Uh, yes, no worries. I oh. can hear you. Can you hear me? Great, great. We are starting in a, a couple of minutes, right? Okay. Uh, right. Bearing me a Can you hear can me, to, uh, Yes, I can hear you. Oh, that's great. We're starting in a couple of minutes, right? Can you increase the voice, Teresa? Oh, just trying to do it. Right. Okay. Visa, uh, can you uh, say something again to, uh, that we can check if your voice is, uh, if we can hear your voice? Yes. Uh, can you uh, can you see the screen I have been sharing? Yeah, we are seeing the screen. Everything is working well, and we can well hear you. But it's not great, so they're trying to increase the volume right now. Okay. Okay, but you can't see uh, see my face anywhere. I guess. Yeah, we can see your face. Uh, Oh, very sorry for that. Um, <laughs> can you see us? Yes. All right, that's great. That's great. So people are arriving from lunch uh, now. Uh, and shall we start, Matthew? Or what do you think? Yeah, I think we should start. Um, so welcome <laughs> back, everyone. Um, um, I hope you had uh, a good lunch break. Uh, we are now proceeding with the final panel uh, of this day which will actually be the first of two panels on uh, the interwar years uh, and on the development of liberalism, in especially in connection with anti-liberalism in that epoch. And I think it's no coincidence that we had by, by far the most proposals and good proposals uh, on this period uh, because there's a, l a lot of research going on and, uh, of course, there were a lot of important developments. We are going to... Um, well, surprise you all by completely changing the program uh, because we are starting with uh, Vesa Vares, um, who is professor for political history at the University of Turku, where he's also the deputy director of the Center for Parliamentary Research. He has worked on the history of German-Finnish relations and on the history of uh, the political right, but will give us some insights uh, today regarding the reshaping of the European order after the First World War within, uh, with an emphasis on Finland and Czechoslovakia. And uh, as, you have, um, uh, as you are aware by now, he's not here. He couldn't uh, make the trip, unfortunately. Uh, but he was uh, not only uh, willing, but actually keen to uh, present online. So actually, while everyone here is here just for food and drinks, He's here uh, to for, for the sake of academic progress, so we're really, uh, really thankful for that. And now we are hoping that um, everything will work. And uh, Visa, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I want to uh, especially thank uh, the organizers for this opportunity because I had to cancel the trip uh, because I have a COVID-19. Uh, 19 and I uh, uh, tested even... Uh, even uh, even today, and uh, and uh, still have it. Uh, but uh, uh, but I'm uh, uh, but I'm uh, now going to talk about Finland and Czechoslovakia and the new European order after the First World War by comparing Presidents uh, K. J. Stolberg and uh, Thomas um, Thomas Masaryk. My background uh, might seem a, uh, my might seem a bit unusual, but uh, uh, because of uh, because of the COVID, I had uh, to stay at uh, home. I could not go to the university, and this is the best net at my uh, apartment. So the purpose of this uh, uh, of this paper is to uh, present two liberals from two small countries, uh, Stolberg uh, above and uh, above and uh, Masaryk on the right. Uh, with their similarities and differences. Now, Finland and Czechoslovakia were uh, were not uh, close states uh, to uh, to each other, and the nations did not have that much uh, to do with uh, with it, uh, with each other. They were far apart and uh, different, uh, but especially because of that, it is uh, interesting to see how uh, how two politicians uh, can be compared uh, uh, from the aspect of liberalism. 
they were both practical politicians, used political pow uh, power both before and as the result of independence and became symbols of their nations. Well, at least Masaryk and uh, Stolberg in, uh, in some senses, but I'll uh, come uh, further into that later. I shall go through their personal backgrounds, characters and careers, and uh, I shall also have to ask what is uh, what sort of liberals they were, because actually they didn't talk about uh, liberalism that much. They didn't use that, uh, that term liberal uh, as much as uh, uh, progress, uh, reform or, uh, or other uh, or other like that, but nevertheless, uh, they can be qualified as liberals if you compare to them, if you compare them to any other politicians in their countries. And there were uh, also different kind of characters. Uh, Stolberg is known in Finland as the lawyer president. Some even said that he even looks like a paragraph. And uh, Masaryk was the so-called philosopher king of Czechoslovakia. I shall also look into their political supporters and opponents, that is the party systems of those of the two countries, and uh, how they saw their uh, part in the new Europe in the foreign political sense. First, the career of uh, K.J. Stolberg, Carlo Juho uh, Stolberg. Stolberg is uh, Swedish and, uh, mean, and means uh, a steel mountain, actually. But uh, he was Finnish speaking. Uh, he was born in 1867, was a lawyer, a professor, and uh, became the president of High Administrative Justice Court. So his profile was uh, that of a lawyer, uh, the man who always stuck to the law and knew the law by heart. But he was also a politician, a member of parliament for quite a long time. Uh, he was a senator, uh, which meant a minister in 1905-1906 and speaker of parliament in 1914 in times when Finland was still part of the Russian Empire. When Finland became independent, he became president of the Republic in 1919. He did not run again in 1925, but uh, later he uh, ran uh, twice and lost the election extremely narrowly. We had an electoral system, so he, uh, so he missed only, uh, he missed the elec election uh, only by a couple of uh, a couple of electors in 1931 and 1937. He was also a member of parliament in 1930 to 1933. That is the time when there was right wing radicalism turmoil in Finland. And he was known to be uh, the true democrat. He was the declared enemy of the socialist revolution 1917-18, uh, enemy of the monarchist conservatism conservatism in 1918 after the civil war in Finland uh, Germany took part in it and there were German troops in Finland and there was a project uh, uh, to put on to put a German prince on the Finnish uh, throne in 1918 he was actually elected uh, uh, despite uh, much opposition uh, but uh, then uh, Germany collapsed and uh, and the conservatives had a really bad uh, political backlash and he was also declared enemy of right-wing radicalism. Later, uh, he was known as the grand old man of Finnish parliamentary democracy and uh, even the mentor, uh, a sort of mentor of President J.K. Pasekivi after the Second World War, when Finland had to reorientate itself and, uh, and start the friendship policy uh, with the Soviet Union, actually in order not to become another Czechoslovakia. And he died in 1952. Now, what sort of a liberal uh, was Stolberg? Uh, if you look into party politics, uh, 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 that started already during the Russian times. Uh, Finland was part of Sweden until 1809, and after that, uh, part of Russia from uh, until 1917. But uh, Finland, uh, uh, Finland ha had autonomy. Uh, that is domestic uh, domestic self government, and th and uh, this gave chances to development. Actually, independence as such was not a goal in Finland until 1917, because Finland already considered itself a state before 1917, not a totally sovereign state, but uh, since it was autonomous, it considered itself a state uh, as uh, part of Russian Empire, but. Uh, uh, but not a province. The Liberals were pre uh, represented by a party called Young Finns. 
uh, and it was also called Dr. Stolberg's party because he was such a central figure in it. It was the Finnish branch of liberalism, even though they did not talk much of liberalism. But they talked about Western models, democracy, parliamentarism, which had elitist uh, fig, uh, features. Uh, they weren't always uh, for the univer universal suffrage, for instance, but uh, 1906, uh, even that came. Uh, they uh, emphasized that they wanted to open the windows to Europe. And if you look at uh, the European idols, you can see that uh, this is a liberal movement. Emil Zola, Henrik Ibsen, Björn Björnsson, August Strindberg, and pro-French culture, cultural circles, British commerce, etc. And they had a deep suspicion towards authoritarian collectivist Russia. That was the East. That was a threat to Finland. And to some extent, they also were suspicious against German cultural dominance in Finland. Although Finland was part of uh, Russia, uh, it was actually a little Sweden or a little Germany. There was very, very little cultural influence that came from Russia. The Young Finns made a party declaration in 1894, established uh, a separate political party in 1901. Uh, here, here you can see, a, uh, see, see some pictures uh, from that uh, time. Uh, the, uh, the first one is uh, from the uh, most uh, famous, uh, famous journal, uh, Päivälehti, uh, now, now known as uh, Helsingin Sanomat. And their program was defense of autonomy, constitutionalism, and passive resistance against Russian repression. Because after 1899, Russia tried to cancel the Finnish autonomy. Then came the crisis, independence 1917, civil war 1918, started by the Social Democrats, won by the uh, non-socialist side, and a Republican constitution 1990. And this was a favorable situation to liberals because uh, there had been this red coup and uh, this pro-German mo monarchist project and both had collapsed. They had discredited the political left and the political right. And uh, therefore Stolberg was the, the compromise. The liberals were a small party, but Stolberg was uh, elected a president as a compromise, mainly with social democratic votes. Uh, the Young Finnish Party was uh, replaced uh, by another liberal party, National Progressive Party, uh, in uh, December 1918, and uh, this lasted until 19, uh, 1951. These pictures are from the first elections, uh, and you can see how agrarian uh, Finland is, and then uh, there were also the female MPs, because Finland was the first country uh, to give uh, women both uh, both uh, the vote and uh, a possibility to become members of parliament, and 17 were elected to the parliament, and the last uh, photograph about the civil war. Uh, during uh, Stolberg's time, uh, the party programs of the National Progressive Party were uh, uh, emphasized social reform, reformism, parliamentary democracy, Finnish nationalism in cultural things, republicanism, you might say social liberalism. They were pro-Western, pro-Baltic, pro-League of Nations in foreign policy, and anti-German, which was uh, not very typical in Finland during that time. Uh, the others did not uh, necessarily like German, uh, Germany politically uh, that much either, but uh, German, Germany had an immense cultural influence in Finland. There were many uh, very outstanding politicians uh, uh, from this party, Stolberg and Ritti became presidents. There were se several prime ministers and other key ministers, but the problem was that there was not that much support in the electorate. The best results about 12% uh, of the votes, usually five to six, and uh, sometimes even less. And why was this? Because Finland was such an agrarian conservative society. Uh, it had radical socialists. Uh, it had a quite strong conservatives, and people usually voted according to their uh, class status. And uh, there was not any natural class to vote liberals. The party was called the party of school teachers and petty bourgeois or the party with a large head and a small body. Now, Stolberg's uh, uh, line uh, was for reconciliation after the civil war. 
Uh, mainly it meant centrist governments, uh, clemency to the rebels after the civil war and not giving in to right, uh, radical right-wing pressure. Co uh, Stolberg himself was in many senses a conservative character and a firm believer of meritocracy, but due to the political situation, he gained his support mainly from the social democrats and the agrarians. Uh, was he a symbol of the nation? That is a bit difficult to uh, say because uh, uh, there were many sides uh, in him that uh, were also detested because he had not been he had not believed to independence in 1917. Uh, some uh, claimed that he had made uh, he had made a very unfavorable peace treatment uh, with the Soviet Union in 1920. And there were also some assassination threats, and they were not only threats. The picture above is uh, Minister he Heikki Ritavori, who was actually murdered, a bit like our Erzberger or Rathenau. And, uh, and uh, he was uh, not very uh, very known even for his uh, foreign policy. He was a strictly a domestic policy man. Um, and the Western powers were far away and had other interests. Uh, mainly, he delegated his uh, foreign policy to Foreign Minister Rudolf Polsky, who is uh, the second photograph there. And uh, I've seen uh, the diplomatic uh, reports of Germans, the British and the Swedes, and uh, they all uh, described him during his presidency that he's not man of the world, he's stubborn. He speaks only German, no other foreign language. Uh, no personal charisma and no mystical shine or glamour. And there they compared him to Marshal Mannerheim, the commander in chief during the civil war, who was a semi guard for half Finland, although detested uh, by the other half. The end result of uh, Stolberg liberalism was uh, that Finland remained a democracy uh, on his line because in the end, even though there were very few convinced liberals, the center parties remained in the key position, the Social Democrats, which was the former so-called rebel party of 1918, became democratic and the conservatives did not follow the course of the right-wing radicalism. Stolberg's liberalism remained a criticized but widely accepted compromise. One feature in Finnish liberalism is its legalism because we had experienced this period of Russification, civil war, uh, anti-communism, republicanism, and later right-wing radicalism, uh, which caused, uh, uh, caused uh, anti-fascism. And uh, in all these cases, Stolberg uh, was there to uh, maintain that we have to uh, do everything according to the law. Uh, Finland can only uh, advance its cause and uh, protect itself uh, by adhering to law, culture, and education. The picture is uh, from the uh, from 1930, uh, when he was uh, deported by the right-wing radicals because uh, they thought he was not anti-communist enough. But uh, this uh, deportation, uh, this is uh, from his return, actually meant uh, that it caused a backlash against the right-wing radicals and in some ways saved Finnish democracy. What about then of Thomas Mazarik? He was a bit older, born 1850, also uh, a university man, PhD professor. Uh, uh, his uh, policies and feelings uh, were, uh, were Czechoslovakian patriotism, which uh, meant that he was anti-Habsburg, anti-German, but also against Panslavism and against Czech chauvinism. Uh, he saw Czech, uh, Czechoslovak nationalism as an entity. Germany, uh, Germans were colonizers uh, to him, and uh, Russia was uh, uh, was a bit too big, a bit too big brother uh, to Czechoslovakia, and it was too Eastern. He thought that uh, Czechoslovakia uh, had uh, had uh, character characteristics of its own, a nationalism of its own. He was exiled in nineteen. 14. Uh, after that, he became a diplomat, uh, a sort of self-appointed diplomat for Czechoslovakian nationalism for a new Czechoslovakian state, especially in America. And he had influence on Western powers. And when the World War uh, ended uh, by an Entente victory, uh, he was, of course, the man that the Western powers knew and uh, trusted. Uh, 
and also the Czechoslovakian people. He became president of the uh, new Czechoslovak Republic and uh, remained that in that position practically unchallenged until he stepped down in 1935 and died in, died in 1937. I'm, um, I cannot uh, speak any Czech. Uh, the only original sources about uh, uh, Masaryk, uh, with, which I have read, uh, have been in uh, German and English, mainly from this uh, Karel Čapek interview, which uh, can be regarded as as a sort of Masaryk's memoirs. Uh, what sort of liberal was then uh, Masaryk? Uh, also, he belonged first to a young party, young Czechs. Uh, this was renamed a realist party. And uh, in, the, in, in the independent Czechoslovakia, uh, the liberal party, if we call it a liberal, uh, liberal party, was actually called National Socialist Party. But uh, naturally, in 1918, uh, uh, this name uh, did not carry the same burdens as it uh, did. Uh, did later. In some literature, it is only National Social Party, but uh, it was widely known also as National Socialists. And the party program uh, resembles the Young Finns and uh, the National Progressive Party in Finland. Uh, Finland, uh, liberal democracy, social progress, reformism, and Czechoslovakian nationalism. Masaryk. Uh, uh, also expressed some sympathies uh, to uh, socialism, always on workers' side, often on socialism side, but seldom on Marxism side. It was mainly a middle-class urban party of intellectuals. He had the advantage that the Czechoslovakia had no middle uh, civil uh, civil war uh, war, uh, war trauma, uh, but more trouble with the nationalist question than in Finland. As president, he had social democrat support, troublesome relations with the conservatives, and bad relations with the extreme right, just like Stolberg. Uh, the domestic political situation was a bit uh, more, uh, a bit uh, easier because there was a steady government coalition called Petka, all the, all the leading parties. But I can't uh, go further in, uh, into that. There were also some authoritarian features in uh, Masaryk. He demanded white powers to the president, created uh, the so-called castle system, which meant that he had very loyal civil servants and newspapermen and ministers, etc. And he also pointed out his wish uh, who his successor would be when he sent his letter of resignation, which is uh, perhaps not quite normal in, uh, in uh, democracy. A sort of vision of a sort of enlightened dictator. As he, uh, and he saw his politics only part of some greater morality. Democracy is the political form of humanity. My aims were religious and had to do with morality. Politics was only the means. And even more than Stolberg, uh, uh, Stolberg and Holsti, he based in his uh, foreign policy and security policy on the victorious Entente powers. We know uh, this little Entente, uh, Pro League of Nations, uh, concrete security pacts uh, with France and the Soviet Union, and whereas Stolberg was totally unknown uh, outside Finland, uh, uh, Masaryk was an appreciated and popular name in the West as well. In uh, some uh, books, and, and uh, for example, George Bernard Shaw uh, uh, maintained that if there were to be the United States of Europe, then Masaryk would be the perfect president for it. Uh, for it, whereas Stolberg stubbornly even refused to make any state visits. Also, these pictures uh, show that uh, there is uh, uh, intended glamour in uh, Masaryk's personality. You could not imagine anything like this about Stolberg. As I said, uh, he was not uh, known at all outside Finland. Uh, uh, these are the only things that were known during that time, Fabo Nurmi and Jean Zidelius. And now to the conclusion. Uh, neither of those men were ideologists. They were old-time liberals. They did not theorize on liberalism, but they adopted the uh, political sector between Marxism and reaction and uh, the core values of liberalism, law, freedom, democracy, parliamentary, etc., etc., until pro-Western foreign policy.
They both sympathized with the same European liberals and Wilsonian ideals. However, the aspect of nationalism was much stronger in Finnish and Czechoslovakian uh, liberalism than in Western Europe, because both Finland and Czechoslovakia were still in the middle of nation building. Both were liberal gentlemen from poor origins, both were meritocrats, deplored populists, demagogues and masses, had some authoritarian ways. Personality did not benefit their political parties that much. And, different, and there were also differences due to national history, political situation, geography and personal characteristics. Masaryk is much more present in the, uh, in the Czech uh, uh, mythology, national mythology when there was this uh, vote of the greatest Czech ever. Masaryk was second when there was a, uh, the uh, vote of the greatest, greatest Finn ever, uh, ever Stolberry ended 47th, but still appreciated, but uh, not that well known. Well, I think I conclude uh, to, uh, conclude to that. And, uh, and, and once again, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to give this uh, paper, even, uh, even though health reasons prevented me from traveling. Thank you. Lots of applause uh, over here. We have another slight uh, alteration now. As for technical reasons, uh, we can only ask questions to Vesa now. Um, so we'll uh, do that uh, and uh, then proceed with uh, the other speakers of the uh, panel. Uh, Matthew will carry the mic again. So if anyone uh, wants to ask a question, then please feel free to do so. Sure, I'll, I'll start. Uh, Vesa, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Great. Uh, thanks for the very, very interesting uh, uh, paper. It was very clear and, and very rich in information, very informative. Uh, I was just wondering one thing. Um, were there any discussions in the public, um, let's say public domain in public opinion in Finland about uh, the place of um, um, the place of the Finnish nation in racial terms as part of uh, of Europe. How did it consider itself from from a cultural slash racial uh, perspective? So that's my question. I just see if there are any other questions. Yes, over here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Domagoj Thomas. I come from Croatia, from University Josip Juraj Strossmayer of Osijek. And my question is, uh, I'm not so familiar, your um, uh, presentation was very interesting, and I'm not so familiar uh, to Finnish history, but I'm interested if there was any ethnic uh, conflicts or tensions between uh, Swedish-speaking Finns and uh, Finnish-speaking Finns. So can you describe if there was any conflicts between them or no conflicts at all? They were maybe just... Uh, Harmonized or yeah. okay. Uh, was that all? Uh, I think I, I can answer both questions uh, with uh, one answer because uh, they they are uh, close to each other. Uh, uh, yes, as I said, Finland was part of uh, Sweden for 650 years, and even when we became part of Russia, the, uh, uh, the, the old laws and the customs and uh, customs uh, remained, and uh, Swedish was the official lang uh, language of administration and business and so on, and the universities until late 19th century, even though uh, Finland was about 85% uh, uh, Finnish uh, speaking. And uh, uh, this caused, uh, of course, tension between uh, Finnish speaking and uh, Swedish speaking population, but, uh, uh, but that uh, never became so serious as, uh, as the problems in the Habsburg Empire or uh, later in uh, Czechos uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, because uh, there were so many uh, features that connected Finland uh, to Scandinavia. And now we come uh, to this uh, to this question of the place of Finland and the and uh, the race. Uh, the uh, the question of race was uh, very difficult for the Finns uh, because the race theories of uh, the 19th century all said that uh, fin that the Finns are a miserable race. 
they were compared uh, with uh, compared with all those uh, nationalities which had not been able to create the state. Uh, even they were lower than the Slavs, and uh, in these race, racial theories, uh, Germans and the British were far above the Slav, uh, Slavs. Uh, because of this, and because we had this Swedish heritage, uh, our identity was always, in the sense, Scandinavian, that we wanted to be a part of Scandinavia so that nobody would think that uh, we were Slavs or that uh, we were that we belonged to those races that were not appreciated. And uh, quite often in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, when democracy was challenged, uh, one of the arguments was that we are too good for that. That is something for the Balkans. We have a Scandinavian heritage, uh, which means that there, uh, we have the free uh, peasantry, we have a freedom of to express our opinions, uh, etc. So there were tensions uh, were with the Swedish-speaking population, but uh, they were never that uh, that serious as in other countries. And uh, in the civil war of 1918, the Swedish-speaking population was totally loyal uh, to the non-socialist government. Uh, uh, government, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, we never had to worry about that they would uh, want to join Sweden or anything like that, uh, without one uh, one exception, the Orland archipelago, but even that was sorted out in the League of Nations in 19, uh, 1920s. Uh, so we didn't uh, actually feel any uh, mutual interests or, uh, or uh, blood relations uh, to Czechoslovakians, because they were considered Slavs and they were geographically far off. We thought we were related to Hungarians in some sense, but uh, that is mainly a question of uh, grammar, uh, not of ethnicity. I hope I answered answered the questions. Yes, uh, thanks again, uh, Vesa. Um, we'll definitely drink to you uh, in the evening. So a big round of applause. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and uh, I think we, yeah just uh, proceed now. I'll uh, um, use the opportunity to inform you about another uh, change. Uh, um, our um, brilliant organizer, Federico Trocini, he won't present his own uh, paper uh, due to the heavy workload uh, involved uh, with organizing this um, uh, event and also in order to allow us to, to stick uh, to the schedule um, because as you will remember we have uh, one paper le left actually from the last uh, panel and we are going to proceed uh, with uh, that one now. Um, uh, uh, Carl, thanks again for allowing us to, to transfer your, your paper. Yeah, you, uh, um, you can put your, um, your start your presentation. Um, this one, this one, and I'm going to introduce you shortly. Um, Carl Antonius Lemke Duque uh, is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Navarra in uh, Pamplona. He holds a PhD from the University uh, of Munich and, uh, Munich, and his field of research includes uh, the history of um, ideas, of education and religions, and also political theory and cultural transfer, uh, transfers and translational studies. So, Carl, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I, will, I will cut straight to the chase because we are, we are short in time, so um, Universal Theology of Law Cultures, Ortega, Hegel, and the Resurrection of the West. Um, the purpose of my paper is, uh, of this presentation, is to try to answer to one sole question. How did liberal thinking in Spain connect with the modern sociology of law? This is the main question. Uh, by doing so, to, through this focus, I hope to elucidate on the ambiguities of Ortega's concept of Europe and liberalism. All right, um, good. At the beginning, originally, I thought uh, delving a bit more into uh, 19th century Spanish liberalism, but I will cut this out and um, um, not without saying uh, three basic things. So. First, 19th century uh, liberalism in Spain turned from an early nation-centered so-called Cadiz liberalism to a strictly anti-revolutionary doctrinaire liberalism due to the predominant French influence. This so-called moderantismo 
in Spain restricted the right to vote, linking it to property and education levels, and reduced political representation to a system of limited sovereignty shared with the crown. Um, secondly, regarding um, European influences, we need to take into account, besides primary thinkers um, like Bentham, Cousin, and Krause, which is a special case in Spain, the key role of uh, secondary transfer agents, such as Santa Rio, Donoso Cortes, but as well Charles de Villiers, or even Paul Janet, for how Spanish 19th century liberalism evolved. Okay, thirdly, and this is one of oftentimes underrated issues, uh, 19th century Spanish liberalism largely preserved a pre-Kantian natural law position uh, that did not stray too far away from cath Catholic restorative trends, right? And effectively, um, Cross's metaphysics and ethics defended a merely tutelary function of the state following anti-Hegelian arguments. So the core of Crowe's social organism consisted in the idea of a pre-political self-regulating harmony defended as well among French liberal li liberals nurtured from Frédéric Bastiat among others, which yesterday in the keynote we, we have met. Given the striking contradictions between theoretical principles, social political interest and political practice in the Spanish case, some scholars have qualified late 19th century liberalism in Spain and more explicitly Spanish moderantismo in terms of a so-called failed or falsified liberalism. So this would be something uh, we can, of course, discuss later. So, um, good, liberal thinking in Spain entered into a new stage of intellectual, social, and political development within the post-World War, War I context. I refer here to the shift from what Spanish historiography has described as the famous black legend paradigm towards the so-called problem of the two Spains. Taken from um, Antonio Machado's proverb, this metaphorical understanding pointed to a seemingly unbridgeable contrast between Catholic tradition and Western liberal modernity. The key to this 20th century context in Spain consists of a singular cultural transfer which can only be understood in terms of socio-historical healing. Good, this, from this perspective, the principle let's call it prescription, among Spanish interwar cultural and political avant-garde was without doubt uh, Spengler's, Oslo Spengler's decline of the West, translated into a Spanish in four volumes plus index between 1923 and 27 in the so-called library of 20th century ideas directed by Ortega himself and um, four times re-edited until um, 1935, uh, 34. <coughs> The extraordinary impact of Spengler in Spain, and I repeat, not in terms of crisis or apocalypses, but as a book of social cultural healing, came about as part of a strong global history framework, including particularly Spanish modern history, in order to promote and effectively foster the unity of Europe. According to a so-called law of psychicization explained in, this, in his uh, 1921 habilitation work, Die psychische Dingwelt, the Munich phenomenologist Wilhelm Haas, which you have here, uh, defended European unity in terms of cultural opposition and contrast, explicitly including, quote, singular matter and content shaped into distinctively European, quote, unity in multiplicity. Haas' ethno-pluralist law of cultural formation consisted of so-called, quote, real entelechies, referring to an ontological understanding of cultural history. Although he criticized Spengler for his presumably biologist concept of culture, he took the Aristotelian Arche concept as referring to a literally, quote, material origin, in German, stofflicher Urgrund. In this regard, Haas' concept of European cultural history, focusing on ontological essences, converged in great deal, not only with Spengler, but as well with Kaiserling's vitalist definition of culture as originating precisely through tensions between these um, essential differences. Okay, you may ask now, how did this morphology of cultural approach, um, which was practically omnipresent in Spain during the 1920s, work out as a critique and attempt to surpass, surpass European decline? Here we need to take a brief look at the delayed Spanish Hegel transfer, 
which started in uh, 1928 through the Vista Occidental Circle, namely Ortega himself, and one of his primary disciples, Jose Gauss. This first ever full Spanish translation of Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of universal history was published in parallel um, to Ortega's first Hegel commentary, published in the Europäische Revue und and Revista de Occident. No doubt, German neo-Hegelianism trends represent the decisive back, uh, backdrop of this delayed key transfer regarding Spanish liberal thinking. I am referring here to um, Hermann Heller, particularly uh, on the other side to Heinz, he Heinz Heimsold, who, uh, as Ortega, was intellectually socialized through the Marburg neo-Kantianism context and took over a philo uh, philosophy chair at the Cologne, <coughs> Cologne University in 1931. In Spain, Heimsold's longer durée focus on Western metaphysics in terms of a persistently rising development since the late Middle Ages strongly impacted the academic interpretation of German ideali idealism. In his second 1934 essay published in the Revista Occidente, Heimsold focused on Hegel in liberal critical terms, although his overall approach to Hegel was apparently close to restorative neo-Hegelism. Heimsöd, like others, uh, other right-leaning Hegelians such as Binder, uh, Lahrens, and Hering, strongly emphasized and almost glorified the role of the genius capable of overcoming moral decline and acting as an historical agent of political destiny. But looking exclusively on his 1934 analysis, Heimsus presented the state's power's essence not in terms of naturalized violence, but as, quote, force of what is just and ethical, in German, sittlich. In Heimsut, there is no superiority of the state in terms of hypothesized natural organism. For him, Hegel's concept of the state as an ethical entity, in German, sittliche Substanz, was irrevocably related to, quote, the infinite subjective substantiality of et 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 ethicity, meaning the concept of unconditional individual autonomy. Good, at the same time, delayed Spanish Hegel transfer finally contributed uh, to increase liberal, liberal Hegelianism by means of a first, although, although only very partial version of Hegel's um, 1821 philosophy of law. This version was published in an academic textbook collection directed by Ortega Disciple Gauss and included the paragraphs 1 to 33, means uh, the complete introduction, uh, and the paragraphs 142 to 157 uh, of the third part on uh, ethicity, Sittlichkeit, which means only 16 of uh, this most extensive last, part, last part's 218 paragraphs in total. Here, significantly, the young translator, Gonzalez Vicen, highlighted in a brief introductory comment Hegel's anti-natural law position. Okay, the same year Ortega's early master disciple, uh, Javier Zubiri, presented the first, although as well partial, translation of he Hegel's Phenomenologie des Geistes, which cemented the liberal critical understanding of Hegel among the members of the Revista Occidental Circle, channeled particularly through the newly founded Cruz y Raya, a trans-ideological uh, journal which str with a strong impact on left-wing Catholic circles in Spain, uh, in fact directed by José Bergami. Uh, Neo-Hegelian transfer in Spain suffered a, a, a notable shift from liberal critical perspective towards clearly right-leaning uh, Hegelianism. This shift represents the background of early Frankist implementation of sociology as a modern discipline at the newly established faculties of pol political and social science. Okay, um, as a matter of fact, the young um, uh, Hegel translator, Gonzalez Vicen, was directly involved alongside another better known young Revista Occidente member, namely, uh, namely Francisco Ayala, in translating and ac academically disseminating Hans Freyer, who became during early Francoism semi-official and in fact most read sociologist at Spanish universities. Um, Freyer was first introduced into Spain through the Revista Occidente in 31 when he declared the historical morphologies of cultures as the purest representative of a cyclical, theoretical multiplicity of singular cultures, raising Spengler into the ranks 
of classic, of a classic, uh, of universal uh, historiography, a booming discipline in Spain at that time. Freyer had celebrated the Spenglerian opus magnum as early as in 1921, precisely for its proximity to its own neo hegelian approach, enthusiastically welcoming its vision of future socialism in terms of cultural activism. In 1933, Freyer strongly supported Spengler's candidacy, candidacy as director of the Institut für Kultur und Universalgeschichte, replacing Goetz, who retired from political reasons, um, a position that he himself accepted after Spengler re rejected it. Okay, Freyer's neo hegelian uh, arguments, which deeply impacted early Frankfurt Spain, revolved around the term reality, Wirklichkeit, which according to the later critiques, such as Antonio Perpignan and others, is supposed to unite, quote, excessive vol voluntarism with strong social determinism and causes an inversion of sociology turning it into a normative, uh, into a science of normative mandates. So this is important. It mainly consisted of so-called, quote, valid volitional content of the present. Fryer had already in uh, 31 identified as, quote, a switching from history as a past into the present as, a, as, vital as, as vitally valid. Yeah? In German, it's uh, Umsprung aus geschehener Geschichte in gelebte Gegenwart. Here he referred explicitly to the nation as, uh, nations as validity areas for, for society's new forming principle, Völker als Geltungsräume, mm -hmm. described as, quote, valid historical will to change of the present, quote, dialectical content, meaning, quote, the concept of true will, Begriff des wahren Willens, everything very Hegelian. So strongly influenced by um, Spengler, Frey referred in uh, 1930 to Schmidt's concept of the political in a very associative manner in order to identify so-called, quote, entities of historical mandate, Mächte mit geschichtlichem Mandat. Here the state represents the primary realization space of ethno-cultural ethno identity, quote, spiritual value unity. But non-states, such as the, sh the church, are also considered supra-political entities and subjects of political uh, as long as they follow this historical realization. I'm proceeding now to the final part where we come to the core of the context of modern sociology's law's introduction to Spain. First, we need to see the deep echoes of a Nietzschean transvaluation of all values paradigm through the Risto Occidental circle. In this regard, Ernst Troll's dictum of Catholic Nietzscheanism is a suitable criterion. In 1922, he explained this by pointing out a specific, also, although paradoxical, fusion between Nietzsche and Übermenschtum and medieval Catholicism, particularly in Max Scheler. The Rüstig, uh, the Occidental th uh, uh, Circle, as well, aimed at reactivating Catholic values explicitly following a Nietzscheanized cultural innovation program in left-wing liberal terms. So as early in, as in 1924, the Munich phenomenologist Alexander Fender proclaimed through this uh, intellectual circle the Nietzschean Übermensch ideal in order to transform all individuation in, into ontogenetic processes, meaning cultural historical types of man in terms of ontological constitutional context. Here he presented Nietzschean value hierarchy as, a, as the main socio-psychological basis of political community building, uh, community building, stressing its readability in Thomistic terms, meaning as close to the idea of society as a well-ordered community. Members of the circle of the Revista Occidente, such as Javier Zubiri and Maria Zambrano, received Fender as a key reference uh, for re revitalizing medieval scholastics and welcomed him as a neo-Augustinian. Fender strongly influenced this intellectual circle's revival of communitarian social psychology, including Ortega himself, and did so as well indirectly through two of his disciples, namely William Haas and another one I didn't mention, Gerda Walter, a former Husserl assistant. Good. As we have seen before, Freyer's sociology concept as a science of normative mandates consists precisely of a total value transform, uh, transvaluation 
according to the ethicity's reality, in German, Wirklichkeit des Sittlichen. Freyer's neo-Hegelian concept of Sittlichkeit stands explicitly close to Schmidt's political decisionism. In this regard, Ortega and the Wissertiente circle shared a programmatic anti-Weberianism with Freyer and Schmidt. Against this backdrop, backdrop, it appears that modern sociology of law's introduction into Spain followed this path in terms of a categorically value-centered discipline. A key example in this regard is Max Ernst Meyer, who was together, together with Gustav Radbuch and Emil Lask, an early founder of modern sociology of law, namely in its so-called southwestern German neo-Kantian stance. Meyer habilitated in 1900 in criminal law with the national conservative Fritz von Kalka, a later NS collaborator, who in 1912 habilitated Karl Schmidt with the work Gesetz und Urteil. In 1927, the leading Frankfurt philosopher of law and sociologist Legas La Cambra, um, who between 1970 and 74 was appointed director of the Instituto de Estudios Políticos, translated Meyer's Rechtsphilosophie. This Spanish translation was taken from the second German version, re-edited shortly after Meyer had died in 23 and edited again in, in 1933. Apparently, uh, Legat La Gamba chose Meyer for the fact that this Rechtsphilosophie clearly prioritized power-centered understanding okay, of Hegel's concept of the state. Meyer explicitly marked it as, quote, realization of the ethical idea in terms of cultural identity and not of, um, of rule of law. Okay, now here I will skip because I have two minutes only. Um, I have here now the other side where um, you can see that Gustav Rathbruch was uh, previously translated by uh, more left-wing Republican translators. And, um, and, and the last point I, I'm stressing is the fact that um, although there is a clear difference between Ernst Meyer and Gustav Rathbruch, um, they both uh, were um, uh, nurtured uh, um, in the um, neo-Kantian dualism between Kultur and Rechtswissenschaften. So from there, I skip to the last part, which is uh, the fact that Ortega, in, uh, in his, uh, let's say, major concept of Europe, um, nurtured from this background and elaborated what he called a unitary Europe-nation duality, which is clearly uh, uh, um, influenced by this uh, um, uh, beginnings, let's say, of uh, neo hegelianism in Spain. This would be all. Thank you very much. So thank you. Uh, and finally, we come to the first uh, speaker of uh, this uh, panel, uh, Margarete Thiessen, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Chair for Political Theory and Intellectual History at uh, the uni uh, Chemnitz University of Technology. Her research revolves around the history of political and liberal democratic ideas in Germany. She holds a PhD from the University of Cambridge and was recently awarded the renowned Wolf Erich Kellner Prize for her dissertation entitled Creating Liberal Germany from Empire to Exile, the Fischer Circle, 1908 to 1950. But uh, today, um, Margarete is presenting a paper uh, entitled No Freedom Without Unity, Germany's Interwar Liberal Left and the Vision of a Grand European Synthesis. So Margarete. I mean, the light, oh, there was something, okay. <laughs> yes, good afternoon. Um, well, as uh, Florian said, I've moved on to other questions and projects since my PhD, but what I'm going to present today is very much still part of that earlier research. Um, and I would like to discuss a group of theorists that I generally like to introduce as the Fisher Liberals. I will uh, comment on that notion in a minute. I'm just um, very grateful for the opportunity to um, discuss my work before such a wonderfully international conference. So many thanks. Um, yeah, I'm going to start right away um, with my ideas for today. Um, in autumn 1924, the weekly newspaper Oberschlesische Woche Berlin conducted a survey to collect readers' opinions on the ongoing tensions in Upper Silesia, one of the territories of the Old Reich that had been affected by the 
geographical reordering of the Treaty of Versailles. And that witnessed violent clashes between German and Polish uh, guerrilla troops long after the Great War officially ended. Neither the precise wording of the weekly survey is known, nor the reason for its con conduct so long after the Upper East Silesia plebiscite of March 1921. Yet a prominent response has been handed down. Um, the archive of the somewhat famous S. Fischer Publishing House at the German Literature Archive in Marbach includes a response card that the firm's founder and director Samuel Fischer filled in. I believe in the victory of reason, this card reads, um, in a United States of Europe within, wit within which an upper Silesian question will no longer exist. And similarly, um, the liberal MP and leading industrialist Sir Alfred Mond observed in 1927, having just returned from a tour of European capitals. It was quite remarkable, and I should not have believed it had I not come so closely into contact with it, Mond stated. The idea that you must form some economic union of European countries, some form of joint action in industry and taxation and tariffs, and even further steps that in order to enable Europe to go on existing against the continent of North America is becoming almost axiomatic, almost a passionate faith. End of the quote. Um, Mons astonishment, as much as Fischer's unusually candid profession of political faith, testify to a widely noticeable emergence of the vision of a politically more integrated Europe on the continent during the interwar years. Now, this is, of course, in itself a well-known fact that, especially in the context of this conference, needs no further discussion. What seems more striking is how these contemporary voices describe European unification in religious terms, seemingly referring to a spiritual re belief system rather than a political program. In other words, one inev inevitably notices a very particular register, a mode of speaking about Europe. And again, the idealism of uh, 20th century German Europeans, in a, fact, in a way, seems to be a fact so self-evident that it requires no further explanation. Yet, in my paper, I would uh, like to take a step back and contribute to understanding some of the origins of this peculiarly spiritualist language of European unification among Germany's democratic liberals in the interwar period. In simple terms, where did this language come from and what do we learn from it as historians of political thought? I will argue that to Germany's democratic liberals, the vision of a united Europe was a transferal of political ideals to the international sphere that had long shaped their vision of Germany's future as a nation and as a state. Among other things, it was the new language of Europe that revealed how deeply the national and the international were intertwined. Um, the first section of my paper will thus be dedicated to earlier wartime debates of Germany's present and future. A second part will return to Fischer's four quoted faith in Europe. Um, before I truly begin, I, let me say just a few words um, about the group of political theorists whom I like to describe as the Fischer liberals or the Fischer circle. In imperial Germany, democratic, this oppositional liberals were in a very weak party political position, as you might know. And it would be worth discussing this at length, but I will not be able to do this today. Let me just say that the voice of democratic liberalism was still very consistently present in public discourse. Newspapers and journals, such as Die Nation or the Berliner Tageblatt, were read widely and featured extensive political commentary by progressive liberal theorists and scholars. One of the periodicals of Imperial and Weimar Germany, however, has been consistently overlooked as a platform for liberal democratic theory and political commentary. The monthly review, Die Neue Rundschau, founded uh, on the new review, founded in 1890 as Freie Bühne für modernes Leben by the aforementioned Samuel Fischer and the theater critic Otto Brahm, first appearing under its current title in 1904. This journal was financed and edited by the publishing firm S. Fischer in Berlin. Again, it would be worth discussing why there's barely any mention of the political theorists writing for and meeting through the firm in the PR mat material 
published by the successors of Samuel Fischer after 1945. I cannot uh, comment on this today, but investigating the archives of S. Fischer, one realizes quite soon that this and this is successor firms were never just literally publishing houses and never just nicely designed labels on book covers and spines. Authors such as Franz Oppenheimer, Walter Rathenau or Moritz Julius Bonn met frequently at the Fischer Villa in Berlin Grunewald or in the editorial office in Berlin's Bülowstraße. And one can come to similar conclusions regarding the successor firms that were founded in exile from Nazi Germany. At the same time, their political interventions can certainly be described as ideologically cohesive. And what will hopefully be published as a book soon, I am employing these observations to get to a more systematic account of liberal democratic thought in Imperial Weimar, and although mostly in exile throughout Nazi Germany, speaking of Fischer liberals in a much wider Fischer circle. Let me um, now turn to the prel prelude of Fischer's faith in the United States of Europe. Writing from Stockholm, where Europe's socialists were discussing their next international conference, Fischer's political editor, the national economist Samuel Sänger, recognized the rule of national self-determination as one outcome of the war. Yet, as he reported explaining to a Russian colleague, nas national self-determination had to find its place within states and within larger political units. I quote, um, the tendency of world history is to surpass the nation state. There is a universal thriving for United States or groups of nations which form huge administrative unions to ensure for their economic prosperity and to protect and further their cultural self-fulfillment. The self-determination of small and smaller nations is happening within these administrative unions. Only within them we can expect reconciliation between national sentiment and state sentiment. In this context, Sänger, Sänger condemned President Wilson's proclamation of the rule of national self-determination as a propagandistic and peerless means to weaken the German Empire and to disrupt the hitherto peaceful coexistence of nations on the European continent. This peaceful coexistence, Central Europe's essence, would only reemerge if political unions above the nation state were constructed after the war. One calls this Democratic federalism, Sänger explained, there will be no peace for Europe, no modus vivendi without this principle. As long as the situation at the front allowed to hope for a peace accord on equal terms, Sänger and the theorists he gathered around the publishing house Fischer believed in the ultimate emergence of a central European German language confederation, a vision that he regarded, that, that, that Sänger regarded as the most powerful political idea in recent history. The, the idea that led beyond the past centuries polarization of the nation state. It was this idea of a grand confederal state replacing the Hohenzollern and Habsburg, Habsburg empires that led the political theorists of the Fischer circle to once again conceptualize liberal democracy as the most promising constitutional mode for the Germans. A new weekly, more flexible periodical was prepared whose title reveals much about the idea of the state that stood behind these intellectual visions of liberal democracy. He suggests to launch a journal in your firm, Walter Rathenau, Fischer author since 1913, wrote to the publisher on 18 June 1917 with the title The People's State, Monthly for Moral Rebirth. Some of you will certainly know that in Germany that the term Volksstaat or People's State began to occur frequently in pol publications of all political camps in Germany in 1917-18. Among the Fischer liberals, the term referred to the mo democratic model that would surpass the allegedly shallow democ democracies of the West. As the war came to an end, transforming Germany, Germany into a people state, an organic, cohesive, sustainable democracy became the central demand. The term people state denoted the political activation of the masses and thereby the achievement of a truly participatory democratic state, replacing the pre-war authoritarian, bureaucratic and paternalistic one. Walter Rathenau's Of Things to Come von Kommenden Dingen, a book published by Fischer in 1917, was one important intervention in this debate. And there's one passage that summarizes well the idea of the state at the center of this dream of a German democracy. Within the state, uh, I quote, um, there is no escaping one's responsibility. 
Suddenly, the threefold responsibility before divine, personal, and political powers creates that wonderful balance of freedom that characterizes human beings only and lifts them up to be frontiersmen of the planetary realm. By binding our conscience to the state so firmly that it becomes our second nature, we will have created the degree of state sentiment which, alon which alone lifts up the nation to become a super personal unity and immortal. It is very easy to identify such arguing as romanticist, anti-liberal, or even totalist. But this means, in my view, misunderstanding the aim of Rathenau's book as a contribution to the German left's intense wartime debate of democracy. Rathenau's statement was, in the first place, an answer to the question of how to adapt a democratic system but guarantee that it would end autocracy but not threaten social cohesion in Germany. How, in other words, could one avoid communists' forced collectivism on the one hand, the individualist materialism of the West on the other? Um, the Fischer liberals' search for middle ground be between the two extremes mirrors their commitment towards scholars of German liberalism, such as most influentially Leonhard Krieger, have, in my view, wrongly called the German idea of freedom, formed by writers and philosophers of the classical and romanticist periods in Germany, to then be incorporated into and arguably deformed by 19th century idealist philosophers' idea of the absolute state. However, reading the publications and sources of the Fischer liberals, one must come to the conclusion that the idea of freedom formulated by Kant and taken further by his idealist readers Fichte and Hegel was also reactivated among Germany's Democrats to envision a political order that was even freer than the West because it incorporated not only rights but also duties, thus instating a truly connected moral political community. According to these liberals, human reason not only constituted the law of freedom that guided the ideal political community, but also formed an organic, transcendent bond between its members across generations. This community-orientated notion of freedom was not only incorporated into liberal political philosophy th through John Stuart Mill and his adherents in Victorian Britain, but also reactivated to revive liberalism and the vision of liberal democracy in Germany, as this case of the Fischer liberals proves. Now, one might ask why I'm speaking about all this before a conference on the idea of Europe. And the answer lies in what followed for the Fischer liberals. Germany's defeat in the war, and even more so the revolution of 1918-19, undermined their wartime vision of a German democracy within a confederally connected democratic Europe so fun fundamentally that for a long time this intellectual circle fell completely silent when it came to something like political utopianism. The New Review printed its usual commentary, but for years the only theme embraced enthusiastically was the possibility of reversing the Versailles Treaty. If we consider now how immense the liberal influence on the constitution of the first German Republic was in truth, this extreme disillusion disillusionment over the Weimar Republic seems particularly surprising. Walter Rathenau, for instance, um, who had frantically published book after book from 1917 to 1919, announced that he would never pick up the pen again, and his publisher Fischer did not even object, but turned to preparing a monumental collected edition of these books instead. Now, very briefly, um, to my uh, second part. Um, while okay. While, while French troops occupied the Ruhr area and inflation reached its all-time high in the summer of 1923, an essay appeared in Fischer's journal that seemed to once and for all end the intellectual quandary of this revisionist period in the history of the Fischer liberals. Europe, empire beyond empires by Heinrich Mann. Mann, who otherwise only occasionally contributed to the new review, emphasized how immensely Europe's Industrialists had propelled and profited from national antagonisms on the continent in the past years. Um, against this backdrop, the author called for a new alliance of intellectuals and the working classes. Once and for all, they had to take their, state, their states out of corrupt, exploitative hands and lay claim to their democratic right to determine international affairs. We need to found our very own church, Mann continued in this essay, describing European, especially Franco-German reconciliation as the most powerful political vision of his day. 
similar to the Catholic Church, which had united the medieval empires of the continent in the name of an idea, a new faith in Europe, uh, European unity should bring together democratic anti-capitalist forces across the continent. The faith is Europe, its unity, the doctrine. Mann closed this plea. The tone of Heinrich Mann's essay was somewhat unusual compared to his previous writings, but exemplary of the contributions to the New Review in the summer of 1923. As Mann searched for a new church of Europeans, so the philosopher Leopold Ziegler called the Germans to remember the mission for universal peace that inspired their Holy Roman Empire. I regard it as imperative, Ziegler wrote, that the German learns to remember his early history, for the Prussian episode of his history has wrongly clouded the memory of highly significant occurrences. The Holy, Ro Holy Roman Empire's history were nothing but an attempt to instate divine peace across the earth, leading to the most remarkable treaty on the matter, Immanuel Kant's Perpetual Peace of 1795. The vision of European unity was indeed of divine origin, the essayist Otto Flake confirmed in his journal, employing Jesus' warning of the wide gate and the broad road that would lead to destruction. Flake inserted the continuous belief in the primacy of ideas and reason before materialist orders as Europe's foundation and as the conviction of the few who had found the narrow gate to life. I'm trying sort of to argue that to those proclaiming the vision of European unity on the pages of the, this journal in 1923, the fact that the Versailles Treaty had left the German question unresolved seemed sort of the most important reason for this enthusiasm that we suddenly witnessed. Germany was to be preserved as a unified nation, but prevented from returning to those paths of aggression that had resulted in a European catastrophe. Sarah Steiner once explained this German question. And all these quoted voices bear such song, strong resemblance to the People's State debate of 1970-1918 that I was, would suggest regarding them as their continuation. In this reading, um, the vision of European unity of the early 1920s appears as the answer to questions that the intellectuals and writers around S. Fischer had originally formulated during the war and earlier. How could one establish democracy in Germany yet preserve social peace and outer unity? The European Union became the, the definitive substitute for German unity. Oh, is my piano? Um, just one final bit. Um, Um, yeah, just to, um, to close, um, at the center of this argument, the argument in German democracy, the argument, the vision of European unity, um, was the allegedly German community oriented notion of freedom, the dialectics of fragmentation and unification that uh, characterized this notion of freedom, um, structured the Fischer liberals' vision of a superior German form of democracy as they structured their vision, vision for unifying Europe. And I hope it has become clear how these two arguments are inseparably connected in this writing. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thanks, Margarete. And that uh, brings us to our final uh, speaker of, of this day. Patricia Chiantera Sute, who is a professor for the history of political thought at the University of Bari, where she teaches and researches with an emphasis on intellectual history, the history of populism and fascism, and on geo as well as uh, biopolitics. She holds a double PhD from Saarland University and the International PhD School Collegio San Carlo in Modena. And uh, uh, today, she is going to uh, uh, give us some insight into imperialism and liberty, the British liberal internationalism, and the geopolitical projects for the consolidation of a world order during the two world wars. Please, Patricia. Thank you very much. Sorry for my voice. Uh, like Sinatra. <laughs> no, <laughs> the contrary, <laughs> the voice. Anyway, uh, I have uh, to um, beg your pardon because I have made, I, my myself, I made a mistake in the title. It is not during the two world wars, but it is between. Sorry very much. 
So um, for 400 years, the foreign policy of England has been to oppose the strongest, the most aggressive, the most dominating power on the continent. We always took the hardest course joined with the less strong powers made a combination among them and thus defeated and frustrated the continental military tyrant wherever he was, whatever nation he led. Churchill's words, written in 1948, offered a precise and impressive definition of the self-representation of Great Britain's foreign politics and international role. When he wrote his Gathering Storm, Churchill was consciously following a way which had already been paved by previous British statesmen, like Lord Palmerston, who in, in 1848 stressed the exceptional character of British international politics. With these words, we have no eternal allies and we have no perpetual enemies. Our interests are eternal and perpetual. Nevertheless, Churchill knew also that after the First World War, exceptionalism and isolationism per se could not offer a guarantee for the independence and safety of England in spite of the British role as the most powerful imperial and naval power. Churchill and the liberal internationalists in the time span between the two wars, as also many other political leaders and intellectuals, could no more think that Britain was a precious stone in a silver sea, set in a silver sea. Liberal internationalists had then to play different games uh, at, uh, at the same time. The continuation of Britain's role as the widest and more powerful colonial power, the preservation of order and peace inside the empire and internal politics, as well as the role of peacekeepers in the international institutions, institutions that they self-founded between the two wars, the League of Nations. In so doing, some main resolved issue, which were at the core of their liberal conception came to the foreground, namely the possible conflict between liberal values and the colonial practices and justifications. Udan Mehta, at this regard, points out the irony of the position of British liberals in the 19th century, namely the discrepancy between the defense of the empire and the following corruption, he says, what he will take to represent and historically stand for liberalism. My question in the following pages is whether in the critical times between the two wars, in a situation where the international and imperial power of Great Britain was challenged by new political conditions and events, some relevant liberal internationalists did effectively respond to the new challenge or, on the contrary, did not take the new situation seriously enough and therefore did not formulate a really new international and imperial theory that could go beyond the shortcomings of the 19th century liberalism and imperialism. Even if, as many scholars have seen, the interwar period can be seen innovative and full of activities with regard to the creation of international institutions like the League of Nations, the architecture of the new internationalism used some raw materials from old institutions, in particular the British Empire, which were not fit to adjust to the new, uh, to the new political era. It is possible to describe the emerging situation in with Kuhn's model in his structure of scientific revolutions, namely observing that the old scientific and political paradigm of liberalism and then liberal internationalism was still dominant but began to show its internal discrepancies <coughs> before being replaced by other paradigms. The, issue no, the issues not resolved in liberal internationalism, the tension between liberal values and colonial asymmetry of power, were turned into contradictions in the upcoming historic, historical, historical events and paved the, way, paved the way for a fundamental change in uh, the political asset. One case is the Abyssinia crisis, which opened a debate between liberal internationalists. I will show, um, no, 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 I, I, in particular, we consider the representations given by Halford McKinder and Alfred Zimmern 
as narratives and strategies formulated in order to create a plausible reconstruction about the efficacy and legitimacy of a certain political order which represented asymmetrical relations of power. I will point out some implicit contradictions at the heart of their political and historical vision, and we'll consider how they became visible in critical situations. I will then consider the League of Nations, the mandate system, and the fascist aggression of Abyssinia, and the weak response of the League, and read in this episode a critical moment when a genetic contradiction in the architecture of the League of Nations became evident, provoking a response from a new generation of intellectual political thinkers like E.H. Carr and Arnold J. Toynbee. For time reasons, I will not uh, sketch out their response. So Halford McKinder is a well-known geographer whose success has increased in the last years because of his role as uh, the founder, the English founder of geopolitics. His very famous 1904 pivot of history innovated the geographical science in Great Britain. Uh, it aimed, like all its works and activities, not only, to he aimed not only to educate the British imperial elite, but to found a science, namely geopolitics, uh, having a public function. His grand narrations reconstruct the global history from medieval times till his century, and at the same time, defines the geographical and geopolitical areas as actors who play stable roles in the course of historical events, as well as civilizations competing for world powers. McInder identifies himself with the European civilization, Anglo-Saxon and Teutonic at this time, but he subtly represents the interests and aims of this civilization and of its corresponding geopolitical area as universal and rational. In 1904, McKinder shows his preoccupation about the power accumulation of the major land power, namely the Euro-Asiatic continental power corresponding to Russia. In other words, the possible alliance between Russia and any nation on the coast, in particular the alliance between uh, Slavs and Teutonics, could endanger a global threat for civilization and for the global order and peace. Why so? The reason is that in McKinder's grand narrative, the eternal struggle that characterizes the global history and politics is that one between civilizations, European, Anglo-Saxon, and Teutonic, against Slav barbaric peoples, hordes of desert predators, is his definition. If with the Colombian era, the global balance of power was kept thanks to uh, the increasing sea powers and their expansion to colonies, the beginning of the 20th century meant a possible and alarming re-emergence of land powers. The 1904 pivot conference by McKinder, in spite of many criti critical responses, had a major impact not only on the scientific and academic milieu, but on public opinion and on the political level. As for many of in his generation, the First World War meant for McKinder the acknowledgement that Great Britain could not be apart from uh, the continental power conflict and had to take a role for the maintenance of global peace. McKinder avowed himself Wilsonian, believer in the League of Nations, liberal internationalist, and at the same time, imperialist, believer uh, following the Oxonian imperialistic tradition enhanced by Lord Milner. In his 1919 book, Democratic Ideals and Reality, McKinder seemed to repudiate his deterministic and Darwinistic early approach and accordingly to use political categories instead of geopolitical criteria. Actually, nor did he abandon his representation of global history as a constellation of geopolitical power relations, neither could he believe that a voluntaristic association between nations could effectively oppose the conflicting geopolitical interests and struggles. The danger was always the possible consolidation of a land power uniting continental Europe against the sea powers. This is the reason why sea powers, in, politic in particular, Great Britain and America had fought their battle in the First World War in order to safeguard plurality, he says, and to make a world a safe place for democracy, he, sa he says. 
Here emerged uh, from him, the, from him, for him, the different nature of the two protagonists of the First World War: the realists, Germany, Germans, and the idealists, Anglo-Saxons. Here we, we see that there is a shift of. Uh, of paradigm between the first McKinnon and the second one. The conflict was no longer between two blocks of states, as in the pivot text, but between two conceptions of life, economy, and politics. The struggle between culture and democracy, between realists and idealists, between realpolitik and liberal democrats internationally. The League was not sufficient for McKinnon. Then it was possible a mixed solution that was the only way to solve the issues of power. In other words, the work of the League, based on the equality of all members and on universal and equal international principles, had to be supported by the action of specific states. The idealists should then be, I quote, predominant part partners, uh, partner, partners in the League because they incorporated the democratic forces that would be able to defend the values of plurality and democracy. I skip to Alfred Zimmer. Alfred Zimmer was one of the aspirants of the League of Nations and the forerunner in the international relations. He was the first profe professor for international relations at the University of Aber Aberystwyth. It is surprising and relevant that Zimmer, but also Gilbert Murray, uh, con conceptualized the British Empire as being the follower of the ancient Athens. One of the reasons is civilizational. The origin of the British Commonwealth was found in the first great example of Western civilization and democracy, Athens. On the other hand, as John Moorefield has shown, the model of Athens had a particular narrative function that supported Zimmer's interpretation. In particular, it seemed to solve two contradictions uh, in Zimmer's liberal thought. The paradox between universality and at the same time narrowness of Athens and by comparison of British Empire, the paradox of the universality of democracy and the exclusion of many groups from it and of the asymmetry of power between the center and the colonized population, as happened also in the British Commonwealth. Zimmer's argumentation tried not to solve these paradoxes, but to justify their ex existence as a historical fact that had always existed. So I skip to the second paradox for time reasons. Concerning the second paradox, firstly, Zimmer downplayed the role of slavery and the non-equal status of many metics, residents, non-citizens, and women, showing that democracy had to be considered a process and therefore slaves and metics could eventually aspire one day to become free because they lived in a democracy. Anyway, the question about the coercive and illiberal treatment of other city-states by a city uh, like Athens remained open. Here, Tsima refuted the question, arguing that Athens treated her allies and colonies as free partners uh, in the empire. These colonies and allies, at least initially, recognized the innate moral and political superiority of Athens' law. So, in spite of the formal possible equality of all city-states, Athens, and also British Empire, had a civilizational primacy, were model states which would naturally and obviously dominate the region. In other words, on the one hand, Athens described by Zimmer acknowledged an equal status to all members of the empire. On the other hand, this acknowledgement was conditioned by the shared belief in the superiority of the Athens civilization. In showing how Athens could remain democratic in spite of or because it created asymmetric relations outside and inside the polis, Zimmer was formulating a background for the apparent contradiction between the liberal connotation of the British Empire and the illiberal and coercive relation between Britain and colonies. The British Commonwealth inspired many uh, of the principles and much of the structure of the League of Nations, which emerged after the trauma of the First World War, with the aim of guaranteeing security in global relations. Key exponents of liberal internationalism, Alfred Zimmel, Gilbert Murley, James Bryce, Lionel Curtis, 
were convinced that the British Commonwealth had successfully resolved the fundamental issue of the coexistence between different nations at different stages from the point of view of civilizational progress, and that therefore it should inspire any further construction of a framework for international security and cooperation. The British Commonwealth had succeeded in harmonizing a multi-ethnic empire for which previous examples in Western history were the ancient empires. Ancient empires, British Commonwealth and League belonged to whole continuous line of organizations and were based on universal values and ideas. So, the League of Nations was characterized by this strong idea of Western superior civilization as Glendas Luga, Marty Koskenebi, Caspar Silvest have shown between many others. If the Western civilization was seen as the goal and model for all other ones, the progress represented the chain of inferior civilizations reaching the superior degree. The idea permeated the League of Nations up to the point that the principle of collaboration between states coexisted with difference between their status. The Convention of the League of Nations was the product, in particular, of English intellectuals and politicians who belonged to liberal internationalism and did not doubt about the bad benefits of the imperial government on the colonized people. As Susan Patterson has argued, uh, the mandate system, for example, diluted the Wilsonian principle of self-determination into a principle of graduation that, on its turn, clearly referred to the British imperial system. The mandate system was established disregarding the claims and the results of the Pan-African Congress that was held in Paris on, Febr on February 1919. Um, the mandate system, uh, yeah, I'm finishing. Uh, is a clear sign of a fundamental discrepancy between the principle of equal self-determination and the reality of the asymmetry of power between Western and non-Western states. This discrepancy came to the foreground with the Abyssinian crisis. The crisis showed that the civilizational bias was much more effective than the actual rules of the state membership and that not only the old colonies but also independent states who were not Western, were considered only as bargaining chips for the appeasement with emerging countries, Italy and Germany. The following German crisis in 1936 shows another example of the imperial and civilizational bias of international elite. Uh, the remilitarization of Rhineland in 1936 and the annexation of Austria by Hitler led some parts of the political elite to support the appeasement with, uh, with Nazi Germany, Chamberlain, Lord Halifax, but also many, many other representatives uh, tried to reach appeasement by offering to Hitler the control on non-Western ex-colonial territories. The strategy of peaceful change was supported transversally uh, to liberal internationalists, but also to other uh, intellectuals and politicians. Possibly was the League of Nations ineffective to handle the peace in Europe, or was it still too bound to apply um, some few criteria of equality and publicity that, that made impossible to treat openly the non-Western states only as bargaining chips, Anyway, a path-breaking debate took place in the milieu of the British international organizations. The opposition between E. H. Carr and Arnold J. Tomby was one of the most interesting examples of these discussions. In conclusion, it is not fortuitous that a non-European representative of the League saw clearly the danger of this uh, uh, um, Ethiopian invasion for the international politics. The General Alfred Memur from Haiti commented uh, in this way in 1936 the lack of a common decision by the League. He said, uh, what did he say? Um, the, pe <laughs> the period when one race can be exploited by another w is now closed. If by our silence we were to, to revive that era at any point of the globe, we might well fear lest it should inaugurate and legitimize an epoch of invasions and claims put forward in the name of Aryan or other superiority. Great or small, strong or weak, near or far, 
white, of color, white or colored, let us never forget that one day we may be somebody's Ethiopia. Thank you. Yes, uh, thanks, Patricia. It's a funny thing with the title, really, because obviously we got it right and uh, put you in the, the interwar panel, so no worries uh, here, which uh, maybe um, uh, gives me the chance, while uh, Matthew gets the mic uh, ready, to start our discussion with a quick question to Margarete, because I noticed that you changed your title as well, slightly changed it. Um, it's um, the Germany's interwar liberal left on the program, and um, as we were having that discussion uh, yesterday, you have changed it to uh, interwar democratic left, and uh, I was wondering uh, <laughs> if you could elaborate on to why you, why you did that uh, change. Um, of course, the democratic left is much broader in Germany than just the liberal um, left. So you have both social democrats, and they have, have to be counted in here. But I should have explained it. I think so. So I can, yeah, so can you? Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation, all of you. I got a question for Patricia, and uh, it's about Alfred Zimmern. Um, I'm so you told that Simon um, was a professor at Tabet with in Wales. Mm -hmm. Is it right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if he had any connection co with um, the British idealist Henry Jones, who also taught at the same university, or uh, the Welsh politician uh, Thomas Jones. They were not parents, but it seems that John's surname at that time was uh, <laughs> very <laughs> popular in Wales. And uh, yeah, if there was any kind of connection uh, in the paper or works that you read about Simon and these two authors. Thank you. Thanks, th thanks great papers. I learned a lot from them. <coughs> A quick question for uh, Margrethe, I may be totally wrong because I don't know this context, but I really appreciate your clear presentation. Uh, do the United States feature at all in what, what they're thinking about Europe, you know? I mean, y your cohort, th th isn't there any anything, you know, to be told about that or just it's, it doesn't matter? That's one. And, 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 and quick question for, for Patricia, to pick up on this point, actually Zimmern became a professor, stayed over two years there because it was a scandal that he had to leave. Uh, uh, but anyway, you know more about this. On Zeman, though, something interesting is that, uh, and there's recent work by a good colleague, Tomohito Baji, on, on Zeman, uh, his Zionism is quite interesting, and it really complicates his internationalism a lot, and it creates a lot of interesting tensions here. Uh, this is just a side note, and I'm sure you're aware of it. Uh, <coughs> the, 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 either, the, the other point I wanted to make on, on, on this, uh, I just wonder, I just wanted to tease out your kind of final uh, uh, point, uh, uh, Patricia, o on you kind of you end in the moment of the debate about appeasement and colonial appeasement, et cetera. So I just wanted if you could expand a bit on that and, and uh, see what kind of broader conclusions could be drawn about that, just drawing a bit your kind of, you know, you drawing you a bit further from, from where you ended. Thanks. Matthew, we have over there Arthur and Helen. Question as well for Margareta. It was very interesting. I really like this uh, modern periodical studies approach, so there must be a lot of uh, interesting stuff there to, to discover. Um, actually, there's a connection between the, the members of the Neue Rundschau and the Luis del Occidente, therefore, I have two very concrete questions because Haas, and I mentioned before, has published a, a short article in Neue Rundschau in 1924 about um, where he actually is criticizing very directly Kodenhove Kalergi uh, and um, yeah, proposing a different concept of community and so on and um, attacking Kodenhove Kalergi because of um, 
considering Europe in terms of a uh, trust of states and uh, uti utilitarian way and so on. So my question would be in, in the Neue Rundschau, this would be the first one, is this the common position or is Haas the exception? And then on the other side you mentioned as well Leopold Ziegler, which was transferred as well to uh, Spain in the Vista Occidente. And there he, had a, he was part of a, um, let's say, new religious philosophy approach. And I was wondering because Ziegler um, did his dissertation with uh, Rudolf Eucken about neo-Kantian rationalism, taking into the consideration particularly Hegel. This is the t title of his dissertation. So I was, um, I was uh, wondering if you have any information ab about what Hegel is uh, doing. I saw Hermann Heller as well uh, in your in your uh, sheet, so, um, and concretely um, w uh, referring to um, Leopold Ziegler, um, if you uh, have seen there this concept of sacrifice, which in uh, Leopold Ziegler is really, really key. Thank you very much. My question goes also to Margarete Thyssen. I'm, I'm a church historian um, and uh, my observation was that many intellectuals you mentioned used religious terms. Uh, Heinrich Mann, Otto Flake, Rathenau. So you can say believing in Europe as a religious or quasi-religious mission. Is it typical or are there other intellectuals who denied using uh, religious semantics, religious words? What would you say? Thank you. Um, uh, on a similar note um, for Margareta, uh, I was wondering if you had any ideas of where this uh, religious language is coming from or is situating itself. Is it a form of liberal Protestantism or is it um, Catholicism or is it a kind of religion of humanity, some kind of new religious view, new spirituality, because I notice, you know, you have right now, uh, I don't know all of them, all of the figures there, but you have Nauman, Protestant minister, you had right now, um, Jewish, and you have, uh, I don't know if you had any Catholics, is this, is this, uh, I mean, religion, and uh, the, the, it's always been thought of as a moralizing and unifying force. So is this uh, what that's all about, this language? Sorry. So yeah, <laughs> again, following the Jewishness of Rathenau, so I wonder, uh, Jewishness and liberalism, if you can comment on that. Um, that would be really interesting. And uh, for Paolo, uh, you mentioned race one time in the end, so maybe basically continuing our, our, perhaps your question from yesterday regarding race and civilization. So it's only, only in the quote in the end you mentioned it, and I wonder, <laughs> so I wonder, it's really interesting, actually. I mean, it's really interesting because you use you use like different concepts in terms of, but it's it's really. This is why we do conferences, I believe. So basically, <laughs> yeah. Uh, th but thank you. Really, really interesting panels. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for the first speaker. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, my eyesight is terrible, so I can't I can't read it. But uh, oh yeah, it's true. Yeah, sorry. The first in person uh, in person speaker. Um, so uh yeah you mentioned very briefly at the beginning as um this this uh, this two liberalism in Spain uh, in the 19th century as far as i remember is that gallican liberalism and then mo modernismo uh, i wonder if you could say a bit more about this and also the reception of these two strands i mean is is this distinction still relevant for people like uh, ortega i guess or is it just you know does it wither away and then for margaret uh, i have uh, another question um I like the phrase democratic liberalism. I think it's from Samuel Samuel, 1917, a lot. I mean, what becomes of that label in the 1930s? And um, is it still used by liberals in reference to Europe? And then another element uh, of that question, I mean, all these liberals seem to be debating amongst themselves, but what of communists and Nazis in the, the 30s? I mean, Florian mentioned that your work stretch up stretches up to the 50s. So what happens during the Second World War with this label, democratic liberalism? Is it rejected by opponents of liberalism? Is it 
is there a divorce? Is it democracy against liberalism? I, I mean, you know, I'm opening big doors here, but I'm, <laughs> I'm just curious about about uh, what you have to say about this. Thank you. Can I go on, and then maybe we could be close, uh, Kelly. Oh, Matthew, of course, and uh, I have another uh, question. So and then <laughs> we are done. Uh, hi, I just had a, a question for Patricia. Um, so it sounds like you're highlighting some of the contradictions within the positions of those who uh, advocated for an internationalism in the interwar period as at the same time that they continued to view that uh, internationalism through the prism of, of uh, the British Empire or perhaps the mandate system through the League of Nations. Um, and so I just wanted to know if you could mm, p pursue that vis-a-vis, uh, uh, -vis, or if I could just add a couple of figures and, and ask you if, you know, if you where they figure vis-a-vis -vis Zimmern and, um, um, uh, uh, and Mackinder and so on. For example, uh, J J Jan Smuts, uh, you know, who obviously is very influential in actually formulating the League of Nations and is um, also sort of consolidating the British Union of South Africa and then in charge of the war effort in, in Africa, taking Germany's colonies and so on. And, and in general, sort of uh, like it, if you could... S it speak a bit to the First World War itself as, as the, uh, maybe another element of the contradiction or paradox or tension, since so many of those visions of international cooperation kind of emerge from, from war. So uh, to what extent are these pacifist uh, kind of visions or actually sort of uh, alternative ways of keeping order? W w I think uh, Jorgios talked about liberals and order. Is, is, it, is, it, is it fair to characterize these as pacifistic visions or are they actually sort of attempts at collective security or some other way of trying to uh, deal with security in some other way or some, something? Sorry, that was a bit of a multi-phased question. You, um, if I, I, if I didn't understand well, there was uh, a kind of uh, relation between Karschmidt and Hans Freyer, mm -hmm. yeah. What is interesting is that uh, when normally when I see Karschmidt in relation to, Han, uh, to Weber, to Max Weber, mm -hmm. and Hans Freyer uh, with, you know, the old uh, Leipzig uh, Christ, uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. is normally uh, in this uh, method and strike, mm -hmm. is the uh, opponent of Max Weber. So I want to ask you, how is it possible that, you know, because, I mean, there was this big debate, uh, Lamprecht against uh, Weber, and then uh, the whole uh, Lipsia circle against, uh, you know, the Weberian school. How do you relate Schmidt, which normally is seen as, <coughs> as one which fol who follows much more the Weberian kind of uh, idea of power to this uh, sociological uh, idea of Vergesellschaftung uh, there, <laughs> so this, uh, mm. this, uh, this idea of, uh, you know, universal history and... Uh, uh, society. And then uh, for Margareta, uh, I wanted, uh, it's just a curiosity because uh, I, have, uh, I have heard about, I have, I've start studied, I mean, I have uh, found uh, Leopold Ziegler uh, in, uh, <laughs> eigentlich, uh, I mean, in the, in the, f in the f uh, extreme uh, right wing literature in Italy used by uh, Julius Evola, for example. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So it, it's very, it's very interesting to find uh, Ziegler as uh, you know one of the uh, you know um, authors used by extreme right, which was mi much more right than fascism itself. Mm -hmm. no? So I, I wanted to ask you about this very strange thing and about I think one problem. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, and I, I, I close here. So there was one historian who is called uh, Delio Cantimori, no? and he made a, a very interesting remark about all uh, German liberals no? in uh, uh, the Second World War. And he said the, her problem is that they didn't want to admit that there was a problem of social justice. They were anti-communist, anti-Bolshevist, and they didn't think that there were... So they wanted to unite uh, soci the social world, mm -hmm. 
with these ideas of uh, nations, race, I don't know what, or even with other much more beautiful ideas without considering that there was a social problem that had to be solved. So I mean, Cantimori became a communist, mm -hmm. so this is uh, the reason why he made such, uh, such a very anti-liberal kind of... <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Just one, uh, quite a lot of questions, which means that your, your paper did stir a lot of, a lot of interest, and, and, uh, and that's great. Um, now, my question is, is very simple. You made it abundantly clear that one of the main concerns of the Fisher Circle is the need for the European states to be able to compete with the United States, so the, the economic threat and then the American threat. Um, I was just wondering whether you've come across even... Um, uh, uh, even arguments about the, the what, what the French called at the time le Paris jaune, so the, the, the threat from, from Asia, um, you know, the, the masses, and then we need to, um, uh, to unite and become uh, um, a mass uh, almost capable of competing, not only with the United States, but also with uh, Asia and the Asian powers, especially from the 1890s uh, to the eve of the First World War. Thank you very much. For a last question for for Carl, uh, Carl, you were um, referring to the two Spains uh, briefly in the in the beginning that are excluding each other in conflict with each other, and I was wondering if you ever came across the concept of the two Europes that was uh, pretty important in in the 20s and 30s in uh, European discourses in all over Europe. I think it it was first uh, conceptualized by French economist Francis Delaissy. Who, who distinguished between a, a, a modern uh, industrialized Europe and an agrarian backward Europe. But the interesting thing is that his argument was that the two Europes actually need each other. They have to complement each other in order that European civilization uh, can survive. Is that notion picked up in any way in, in, the, in the Spain discourse? Thanks. So the, the first question um, on Spanish liber liberalism um, and the shift uh, to modernismo. Um, I think the the, the easiest um, way to answer this is uh, taking into account um, the doctoral thesis uh, by Diaz del Corral in uh, 1944. Uh, he is the first um, Francoist uh, um, chair of political thought. And this is his uh, thesis on doctrinaire liberalism. And there he explains um, um, the importance of um, Donoso Cortés in particular for the Spanish idea of longue durée identity, um, political identity. So um, there you have the answer to uh, why this was is, or is important. But actually, I, I take the opportunity to to finish what in my in my presentation I couldn't finish because uh, the main idea was uh, what, what I wanted to transmit is the fact that you see there that there is a continuity from shifting from the left to the right not only in the 19th century but also in in the 20th century and you can see this uh, within the circle of the Revista Occidente um, as a particular um, particular aspect. Um, Donoso Cortés in this uh, sense is also important because Diaz del Corral in 1944 compares him directly and he names him as a Spenglerian because of the success uh, of his essay on Catholicism in 1827, I think. So um, there you see the reconnection to this massive impact of Spengler in the 1920s and 30s which is taken up by the first uh, Ortigian disciples as compared to the Nosso Cortes. So I hope this is an answer to your, um, to your question. Um, so, and then, uh, yeah, Karl Schmidt. Um, thank you for the question because Karl Schmidt is um, actually an under-researched uh, case <coughs> when it comes to his first impact in Spain. And, um, the, the question, the direction of your question um, is obviously the, the key aspect. So um, Schmidt is, uh, from my, uh, as I understand Schmidt's um, 
um, he is totally opposed to Weber, actually, in, in what is his basic methodological approach. He was a participant in the docenten seminar of uh, Max Weber's Unfinished uh, Staatssoziologie in 21, shortly before Weber died, and there he, he, he met, uh, well, uh, Fossler and others. And as a reaction to that, and legitimität and legalität in 32, he attacks Weber directly. And, um, and, 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 and denies or, or, or the critique of Schmidt against Weber refers obviously to the fact that Weber is, uh, had elaborated power as following the chancel of obedience cat category uh, following Jelinek. So this is for, for Schmidt, it's, it's an absolute no-go. It's the opposite of what Schmidt mm. intends to do. And he calls Weber a typical imperialistic ideology um, because of his Protestant background, of course, where there is a universal norm. So, and this, um, yeah, well, so, and the, the, the connection with Hans Freyer, of course, um, um, has to do with the fact that Hans Freyer, as a neo hegelian um, presents um, the, the framework of what later on in Schmidt is, has become, um, might all know this, uh, the Katechion and the Imperialist basis, of course. So th this connection is very important. Uh, and yeah, the last uh, thing uh, concerning two Europes. Um, in Spain, uh, to my knowledge, uh, these two Europes uh, discourse uh, in French background uh, hasn't had any impact. Uh, what I can imagine is that it, it, it was in somehow linked to the technocracy movement discussions, but it's something that I, I simply don't know. Thank you, uh, thank you, Alessandro, for your question. I'm ignorant. Uh, so I know that T.H. Uh, uh, Green was one of also the reference points of Alfred Zimmern. I know that uh, you are a fan of T.H. Green. So uh, this, uh, <laughs> this uh, connection is there, but I don't know if possibly, I, it would be interesting to see how probably there are connections, it's possible, yeah? But uh, yeah, T.H. Green, yeah, but I really don't know. Thank you anyway. So Zionism, yes, uh, this, uh, I read also this uh, beautiful uh, essay about Zionism. I had just to uh, reduce uh, the complexity of uh, and the contradictions inside Zimmer also because all his ideas, I mean, his idea of nation, and uh, of uh, nationality that are just uh, something that has to not to be represented politically, but are cultural nations. Uh, uh, very interesting to look at, no? and uh, I mean, so it's much more complex than I, I, I tried in, ten, in 20 minutes to, 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 to offer. Anyway, for the appeasement, this is also a very interesting question. I think I, this is my impression that uh, from the, this moment on, from the uh, Ethiopia crisis, uh, probably also before then to 36, then to the Second World War, there is a, a big crisis of uh, liberal internationalism, it's not only my impression, but then uh, there are also these different voices that come to elaborate something different. E.H. Carr, for example, the 20 years crisis, which is on a completely different paradigm uh, than these that was used uh, by liberal internationalists, but he was also there, he was a part of this milieu anyway. And uh, Arnold J. Tonby, these are two of the main voices that uh, you know are open and try to, s I think, try to give a solution to a crisis which sees that the old liberal internationalism has finished in a way. It was incapable of, uh, you know, of, uh, of uh, preserving peace and preserving order. So I think that from this moment onwards, this is my idea, but I don't, not only mine probably, uh, there, were, there is a very a open debate about uh, how to really to guarantee peace. And, and then, okay, Euroatlantism, uh, so Zeman is continues to be there in this debate. But as a uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, kind of uh, protagonist of this debate, but then there are many others kinds of uh, oppositions uh, that uh, uh, are completely different. But from I think from that moment onwards, it's I mean, 
it's, uh, it's also, it's a critical time. Like in Kozelekia, <laughs> it's, it's really a critical time where you have to uh, dispose your discourse from in a different way, I think. So, and this is also for the, uh, for the First World War. Yeah, uh, I think this is the, the question. Uh, my question was, did these, uh, uh, I, I mean, I'm just quoting some of them. There is also Gilbert Murray, who was also a very interesting, uh, interesting figure, Smuts, as you say, but also all the round table, Lionel Curtis, uh, there are so many. And uh, I mean, uh, my problem was, um, okay, the First World War was important, very important for all these people, but did they really think in a different way the, uh, about the European order. I, I don't know, this, is, well, this was the question of my, uh, of my paper. Or did they, mm, did, did they not think really about a different way of uh, thinking about the relations between uh, states in Europe and Europe and the colonies and Europe and outside Europe? I think probably the second, that is to say, the first, probably the First World War um, was not the turning point for them. Uh, there is one very interesting, uh, there are many interesting articles by Arnold J. Toynbee about this. No? And also when uh, he, he con for example, he continues to say the same things till the Abyssinian crisis. And many uh, think about, you know, nationality, but try to adjust these principles to these old criteria you know, of, uh, you know, division between uh, British Empire, between uh, the center and periphery, between, uh, you know, some nations and others. So without really thinking ahead, I would say. No? So, uh, I mean, you, you just, uh, how do you say, mettere il dito nella, no, I don't say the lingua. You just uh, pointed at a very in interesting question. Uh, did they really, th I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't think so. Because if you look at uh, the League of Nations structure, how they think about the League of Nations, it's, uh, yeah, it's British Commonwealth. So did you really think, th thought, think that they needed something different? Probably not. This is my hypothesis, but I could make a mistake. But this is my idea. Anyway. And ah, race and civilization. Uh, sorry, <laughs> that is a very a long question, I think. Uh, but I, I don't think they are the same anyway. This is uh, uh, they can be functionally seen as the same. That is to say, you have many theories about civilizations that, at the end, uh, have the same outcomes as racist theories, but they are different and they work in a different way. What, what does it mean? They have a different public that can be used differently. Uh, a civilization theory uh, is, uh, you could say, could be uh, much more persuasive at, at, certain, at certain levels. It's much more, um, how do you say, uh, can be spread no? much more than a racist, possibly. Or there are also some civilization theories that can even imagine that there are different civilizations but trying to cope with each other, and then you don't have the hierarchic thing. No? So you can have civiliz different civilizations, but you know, not, not uh, hi on hierarchy. This is what Toynbee tries, tries to do, which is interesting, an interesting example. So, I mean, don't think it's the same. They can function in the same way, but they are not the same. They can function in the same way. This is my sorry, long question. I know. Thank you. So I think I have done. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Matthew okay. will explain the other person. Just stop me when it's um, time. Um, yeah, I'm going to try um, to answer a few questions, but I talked for far too long before, so I'm trying to be brief, briefer here. Um, there was first, firstly, the question about. The US, the U.S. featuring in this um, debate on Europe. And here I really have to go back to the principle that leads the Fisher's Liberals' international thought, which is throughout the publications from 1890 to 1950, the principle of multipolarity. 
So their idea is that if you split up the world into uh, po equal powers, so to speak, that is the only way to guarantee peace. And they um, embrace this Central European Confederacy with such enthusiasm during the war because they think, well, if we have this great German language empire, it might be as strong as the US, as strong as China and Japan put together, as strong as the British Empire, and then we will have sort of free trade between the empires. And they then sort of shift to Europe because they see, well, this is another opportunity to achieve this, but we, of course they know that the Germans will then first have to unite with other Europe European democracies. So it's, it's getting slightly more complicated to achieve multipolarity. Um, but the US is truly o only ever mentioned in this context. Um, there's a brief period of um, arguing against the West during the war, against the US and their shallow materialism, as I mentioned before. But this is truly only a brief period. Um, and then the position with the Kudenhofer. Um, there are in the New Review, there are truly two scripts that lead to Europe. During this period, there's firstly this German script towards Europe, which I quoted extensively in the talk today. But there's another option for these liberals to achieve European unity, which is split it down um, to democratic republics, to nation states, and then they can sort of find an agreement and cooperate together. You don't need Germany to sort of impose um, on Europe, and this is pretty much Kudenhofer's. Uh, suggestion to have many equal partners forming a united Europe. And Kudenhofer is sort of in there, in the new review, but the, the emotional energy, as I might um, call it, is more on this on this German script. But, I mean, Fischer invited Kudenhofer to, in, to his vacations in Italy. They met frequently. So it's a friendly uh, perspective, but it's a different uh, path towards European unification. And then Hegel in the New Review, which is sort of why Ziegler is also in there. Uh, there are some authors in this journal who are not, who I wouldn't count among the Fischer liberals, but among the wider Fischer circle, because they are, they are philosophers, they are theologians, and they're sort of quoted as a normative source for political theory. So they are searching throughout for a way to hold a democratic state together in itself. How can a democracy survive without dogmatic, a dogmatic church sort of instructing um, that people work together. And um, there, Hegel is, of course, very inspirational in that regard. S so is Ziegler and Neo-Kantianism, but there are many other sources. So they feature Catholic theologians who are not very dogmatic to see if that might be an option, maybe. There's at least the model of an international organization based solely on ideas. That is sort of the principle of the Catholic Church that they try to translate into a political project. But it's, of course, they reject dogmatic um, religion as such. Um, and th that maybe answers the question why Ziegler is quoted here and he's quoted elsewhere. I mean, you could take the quote from Rathenau and put it in a completely different context and say, well, this is certainly not democratic and so certainly not liberal, but he is writing for socialists and liberals discussing democracy in Germany, and I think you have to pay very close attention to the context of liberal um, political theory in Germany to not miss sort of these nuances. Um, but yeah, these, this heavily idealist language is of course um, difficult to associate with liberalism, but I mean, I think it is sort of part of, very much part of this time, because I mean, they don't argue like that at all during the German Empire. There they focus on rights and how to ensure the rights of Polish Jewish minorities within the empire. But then everything falls apart. And of course they then turn to community and how to sort of establish democracy still, but sort of don't uh, threaten the existence of Germany as such. And I commented a bit on Jewishness there. I think the question came from over there. I mean, oh yeah, I mean, these are, of course, all, n not all, but many Jewish theorists writing for this um, sort of Jewish publishing house, but they never identify as Jewish. These are Germans, these are German citizens, and that's why I very hesitate a lot to 
label this as Jewish liberalism in Germany because they don't have any other political vision than German democracy, the German nation state. That's where they are at home. But of course, their Jewishness, their exclusion in many ways in Germany. I mean, Rathenau tried for many times to become a party member, to get into parliament, and he was absolutely rejected because of his Jewishness. Um, if you read the sources, um, there are very strong comments that one cannot possibly nominate someone with Jewish roots. So yeah, this, this part adds a certain emotional energy, I would say, to their political proposals because they are so deeply affected by the situation in Germany. I think that's how I try to bring it in. Maybe that's too limited. I certainly could think about that more. Um, and that is, um, I commented a bit on the question of where religion is coming from here. And it is sort of part of that search for a community based on ideas, which is very particular to this decades of liberal thought in Germany. And they try different things. Um, there are Heinrich Mann writing on the Catholic Church. There are others writing on Martin Luther and his um, potential to be someone who can bring the Germans together in a free way. It's um, truly manifold, this um, religious, spiritual language. I would rather say spiritual because it's less dogmatic. It's more about finding ideas that hold us all together that we can share in a sense. Um, the label of democratic liberalism after 1930. I mean, the, the early 1930s had a truly tragic time for these liberal Democrats because they all leave Germany and their texts only reappear only like five years later in exile. So they start writing again much later. And what you can see there is that all the ideological nuances of earlier years have completely vanished. It's not about socialist or liberal democracy anymore. It's simply about the free world against the unfree world. And this simplification um, stays in their writings until the 1950s, late 1950s, because it, I mean they, ret they return to Germany and face the difficulty to establish their position vis-a-vis um, -vis the socialist Germany, the other Germany. So they can't really count themselves among the left anymore in Western Germany, which is um, a totally different story again. But democratic liberalism, I didn't see that term after um, 1929, I think. It might have been, so I might have missed it, but um, you, you will see the word frei versus unfrei uh, much more often. Um, I think. Oh yeah, liberals admitting that there was a social problem. I mean, these are the liberals cooperating with socialists from 1890 onwards and defending socialists within imperial Germany. And they very much admit that there was a social problem. There is a social problem. They criticized the US and um, Britain quite intensively for not recognizing that the social disparity within their society is a contradiction to their liberalism. So they recognize that. I didn't see any practical work um, to overcome um, the social question in a way, but they see that it is there. And their liberalism is sort of the answer to that. They formulate this originally um, as a counterproposal to socialists um, in Germany. Um, yeah, the threat from Asia. I, sh I think I mentioned that briefly um, in the context of the first question, the thing with multipolarity, there's never a threat. The question is simply, how can we become as powerful as in Germany or as Europeans so that um, the world is not dominated by any singular force? Um, that's the point. Yeah, I think that's it. I hope I answered some of the questions. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you to our, our panelists once again. And actually to all of us for, for making, we've made it through this uh, challenging uh, day and I now hand over to Matthew for some organizational uh, information.
Ah, great. Is that better? I hope you heard me up to now, right? You heard me. Right, so uh, unfortunately, the, the, we, we cannot, um, the, the Fondazione cannot face the expenses, so you will be asked to uh, pay for your own room. So I hope that's not a problem. Uh, plus, as I said, Flor and I will be upstairs at 8 o'clock outside of the building, so you're more than welcome to join us. I think that's it. Uh, there might be some coffee and some biscuits upstairs in the foyer, so please. Yeah, uh, actually, it's the, it's the so last coffee break now. It's the last coffee break. It's the final coffee break. And um, also, please don't forget that we meet to tomorrow morning morning at nine o'clock sharp uh, for our last yeah. uh, panels and yeah, I was one. hoping you would know the the time because I'm hopeless with that. yeah so I just looked it up so <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much